The following programs were originally aired live, long before the advent of High Fidelity. And they were recorded using a variety of means, from direct recording onto early audio tape and glass records, to simply placing the microphone of a wire recorder in front of the speakers of a radio playing the program. I hope, however, that any variance in audio quality will not take away from your pleasure in listening to these. Some of the all-time favorite shows. Welcome to Nightly Old Time Radio Shows, coming to you from my basement because a certain someone had to start World War Free on my front lawn. Sorry, Brett. After eating all the fish in the aquarium. Sorry, Brett. Well. Do you want to do this day in history? I suppose. Just saying. Yeah. Oh, Mrs. Madcock. Yeah. I know the Homeowners Association Agreement limits the size of military conflicts to police actions. Will you, will you tell them to stop? Give me a citation. See if I care at this point. Ugh. Well, are we gonna do... Yes, yes, we're gonna do this day in history. In 1490, first dated edition of Missa, Missenhan Torah, a code of Jewish religious laws published in... 1775, Patrick Henry proclaims, give me liberty or give me death in, in favor of, in speech in favor of Virginia troops joining U.S. Revolutionary War. I guess they couldn't give him freedom because he ended up giving yeah in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In 1919, 8th Congress of the Russian Communist Party reestablishes a five met for a Politburo, which becomes the center of political power in the Soviet Union. Original members, Vladimir Lenin, Leon Trotsky, Joseph Stalin, Lev Kenven, and Niku Nikita Khrushchev. In 1933, German Reichstag hastily passes an Abeling Act, and President pa Paul von Hindenburg signs it same day, granting Adolf Hitler dictatorial powers. In 1945, Battle of Okinawa, U.S. Navy ships bomb Japanese island of Okinawa in preparation for the Allied invasion. It would become the largest battle of the Pacific War in World War II. In 2019, Syrian Democratic Forces announced that the last Islamic State territory has been retaken, raising flags in Bagu, Bagzu, Syria, an ending five-year is Islamic State Caliphate. In 1940, for first radio broadcast of True Four Consequences on CBS. Maybe you should look into adding that to the lineup, man. I might do just that. In 1743, George Frederick Hendel Oriato Messiah premieres at the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, in London. In 1980, Australian cricketer Alan Border becomes first and only batsman to reach 150 in each ending of a test in the third test versus Pakistan in Lahore. And that was this day in history. Now let's be on with the shows. <laughs> Thank you. 
Who's on first? Why, it's Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Coming up next. Hey, Abbott, what time is it? It's time for the Abbott and Costello Show. We're on the air for ABC here in Hollywood. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go with the Abbott and Costello Show. Produced and transcribed in Hollywood tonight for your listening pleasure. Hold on to your chairs, folks, for here they are, Bud Abbott and Luke Costello. <laughs> Costello, Costello, you're late again. Well, I was watching the girls admiring Lana Turner's new necklace. Lana Turner has a new le necklace? Yes, yeah, made out of her old wedding rings. <laughs> hey, who is that girl you were out with last night? Oh, that's my, that's my new girl. What's she like, Lou? What's she like? She likes bourbon, scotch, gin, rye, wine, scotch, <laughs> bourbon. Look, where, where did you meet this girl? Oh, at the Palladium. I asked her for a dance. Did you dance the foxtrot, the tango, or the waltz? The one step. The one step? One step and I changed my mind about dancing with her. <laughs> Why, wasn't she a good dancer? No, but she makes you forget about dancing during intermission. When I took her home, I kissed her goodnight and got a real kick out of it. Uh, she kisses that good? No, her father caught us. Right. <laughs> Instead of running around every night with a different girl, why don't you settle down and get married? Luke? Not me, Abbott. Getting married is like going to a cafeteria. Like a cafeteria? Yeah, you grab what you want and pay for it later. <laughs> If you're fighting crime, you'll need a man like me. Appoint me sheriff, and I'll go from house to house and pinch every cook. <laughs> no, no, not every cook. You mean you'll pinch every crook? You'll pinch what you like, and I'll pinch what I like. <laughs> Costello, you, you'll pinch what you like, and I'll pinch what I like. You said that. You said that. Costello, why were you late tonight? Well, I overslept, that, but I had a very peculiar dream. I dreamed I was a pincushion in a, in a room full of balloon dancers. And am I mad? Why are you mad? Well, I woke up just when things were beginning to pop. Right. <laughs> After next week, I'm going to get my whole... I'm going to get my own room. I can't sleep with my brother Pat anymore. All night long, he dreams he's Roy Rogers. Well, why should that disturb you? He also dreams I'm triggered. Right. <laughs> Heaven, if you will appoint me Chef Vincino, I'll clean up the town. I'll mop up all the pool rooms. I'll clean out all the saloons. I'll scour the alleys. How can you do that? On the side, I'm a street cleaner. <laughs> Costello, if I make you the new sheriff, you've got a lot of brave men to follow. Listen to the records of the background. Sheriff Jones, Redcoats, Northwest Mounted, 1931. Oh, yeah. Sheriff Brown, Redcoats, Northwest Mounted, 1938. Sheriff Costello, Sportscoats, Bullock's Basement, 1975. <laughs> To do criminal work, you have to know something about the law. For instance, do you know do you know how to put up a defense? Oh, sure. All you have to... Could I have that again? I said, do you know how to put up a defense? Why should I put up a defense? I already put up at the wall around my house. <laughs> I also got at the hedge in the backyard. Why do I have to put up a defense? No, no, Costello. When I say you put up a defense, I don't mean you put up a fence like you uh, do when you put up a fence. I mean a defense like when you put up a defense. Yeah, but I think you nuts. Now, you say... <laughs> it's no so use. You wouldn't know how to act in a criminal investigation anyhow. Oh, is that so? Yes. I was down at a morgue yesterday to see a gangster that was killed. I lifted up the sheet, and there he lay, the corpus delicatessen. The... <laughs> that dummy. Corpus delicti. It's not corpus delicatessen. This was a corpus delicatessen. He was stabbed with a salami. Right. <laughs> up in Sino, but you didn't have to dump that heap of rubbish here on the table. <laughs> rubbish? Oh, pardon me, it's Costello. I... <laughs> oh, I have a 
Well, you can't tell a sheriff of Encino. He's going to chase all the criminals out of town. Well, buddy, you ought to put me on that job. You know I'm a regular bloodhound. From the looks of your ears, you must be pot cocker spaniel, too. <laughs> from you, Costello. I can see through you. I've got eyes like a hawk. And a beak to match. <laughs> Costello. How dare you insult my wife? She's beautiful. Why, before I married her, she had men falling at her feet. And why not? She was refereeing fights at the Legion Stadium. <laughs> oh, you pigeon puss pop eyed penguin. When I was a girl living in the country, boys used to court me from ten miles away. They had to. They were afraid to come any closer. <laughs> Pay no attention to money. Say, that's a pretty hat you're wearing, dear. Oh, I just bought it. Mm -hmm. and, and do you think I should wear it to one side off the face? If you're smart, you'll wear it over your face. <laughs> oh, low life. Low life? Uh, by the way, buddy, I got some new shoes, too. Do you like them? They're pumps. On, on you, they look good. Well, thanks. Considering that your legs look like pump handles. <laughs> oh! How dare you? I have beautiful legs. You're bowling. My wife is not bowling. She's the only woman in the world that can walk down a bowling alley while the game is on. <laughs> Costello, for insulting my wife, I'm not going to make you sheriff of Encino, and I'm not going to give you this beautiful badge. Oh, please have it. Let me be the sheriff. I've always wanted a badge. Everybody's got a badge but me. A cop has a badge. A fireman has a badge. Even a little boy scout has a badge. Abbott, I've just got to have a badge. But, uh, why do you have to have a badge? I'm tired of holding up my pants with my teeth. <laughs> oh, all right. I hereby appoint you sheriff of Encino. Step forward, and I'll pin this badge on your shirt. Thank you, Abbott. I mean, Your Honor. Okay. Right. Well, out. Hold still. I'm tearing your shirt. I ain't wearing any shirt. <laughs> Come on. We're going over to the sheriff's office and seeing her right now. So you can start to work immediately. <laughs> well, Sheriff Costello, you can take over at once. I've got it, Abbott. What? Ma'am, broke into your room? Yes, ma'am. I'll put it on the police radio right away. Calling all cars. Calling all cars. Go to 237 Mulberry Street. An old maid found a burglar in her room. Proceed with caution. The old maid is armed. <laughs> well, Costello, you're catching on to your job fast. Oh, my God, I'm glad I found you here. I have news for you. I just picked up a cent. Here's nice cents more. Grab a bus and get out of town. Uh Cut that out, Costello. My wife may be in trouble. Oh, that's right, buddy dear. Something terrible has just happened. What did they do? Find your birth certificate? Uh, <laughs> Cost Costello, pay attention to my wife. As the sheriff of, of Encino, it's your duty to hear her out. Well, if it'll make you happy, I'll throw her out. Uh, uh, no, never mind him, dear. For the last couple of nights, there's been a lot of strange noises. Screams and gunshots coming from that empty house next door to us. Suddenly, at two o'clock in the morning, as I was standing by the stove baking fudge... Ah! What happened? What happened? Oh, she burned her fudge. She burned her fudge. peering out of the attic window. He made an ugly face at me like this. No, no, don't do that. I haven't made the face yet. How can I tell? <laughs> Quiet, Costello. This may be more serious than you think. I'd like to see the sheriff. Ah! That's him! That's the mysterious man! Costello, look! It's Bella Lugosi. Bella Lugosi. <clears throat> Just a minute, Costello. Mr. Lugosi, I am the chairman of the uh, Committee for Crime Prevention in Encino. Now, uh, just what is the nature of your complaint? Well, I'll put it in a simple language that even a moron can understand. Step aside, Abbott. He's talking to me. <laughs> now, listen, Lugosi, I'm the sheriff around here, and I'm going to ask you some questions. Now, what were those screams in your house at midnight? That was my business. And what about those gunshots? 
That's my business. Ask him about those dead bodies in the basement. He's also my business. This guy is doing a heck of a business. <laughs> that settles it, Costello. You, a Sheriff, will have to investigate and search Lagosi's house tonight at midnight. You will like the house, Costello. It's the only house in Encino where every room has a, a bat. <laughs> and a strange man should suddenly appear with a long, sharp knife in his hand and offer to cut your throat. Yes? Refuse him. <laughs> Abbott, take back the badge. I don't want to be sheriff anymore. Get me out of here now, Abbott. <laughs> It's only half the fun, folks. Just as many laughs yet to come. Well, Costello, here we are at Bella Lugosi's house. Have it. It's awful dark in that house. But you've got to go in there. You're the sheriff. You've got to go in there and look for the trouble. Couldn't I look for it out here? There's more light. <laughs> look at me. I'm not scared. Shh. Have it. I think I hear something. Or is it my imagination? Thank goodness it was only my imagination. Well, Sheriff Costello, I see you have come to investigate my house. Come in. I'm making myself a sandwich. What kind of a sandwich? It's a rattlesnake burger. Covered with pickled toads and diced bat wings. Do you put ketchup on it? What? To get heartburn? No. <laughs> it's too bad you won't be here for breakfast. We are having shrouded wheat. Shrouded wheat? Abbott, look, there's a casket in the corner with rubber sheets in it. Rubber sheets in it? Yes. I line all my caskets with rubber sheets. So the rain can't get in. Why? My beer is the dry beer. <laughs> hey, Costello. Look at that funny-looking machine over there in the corner. Now, that's my Sears machine. On that, I manufacture robots. Get it, Abbott? Sears a robot. <laughs> Which one? Don't be so choosy. <laughs> Abbott, I'm getting out of here. I don't like the looks of this place. Look at the grandfather's clock in the corner. Oh, lots of people have grandfather's clocks. With their grandfathers hanging in it like a pendulum? <laughs> Never mind that, Costello. Question Lugosi about the house. Mr. Lugosi, where is the former owner of this house? Do you see that pile of freshly dug dirt in the corner? Yes, sir. Well, that's not a vegetable garden. Hmm, <laughs> that's strange. I thought I felt a draft on my neck. What's strange about that? I have no neck. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lugosi, what are you whispering for? I was born in a library. I had to stay there six months. How come? My father lost his card. <laughs> hey, look, Costello. There's a skeleton in this room. <laughs> and it's, there's two skeletons in this room. Two skeletons? Yeah, I just jumped out of my skin. <laughs> hey, Abbott. Look, Lugosi has just disappeared through that wall. Pardon me, Abbott. I want to see somebody outside. Who? Me. That... <laughs> Come back here, Costello. You're scared? Why don't you sing? Go ahead and sing. It'll keep up your courage. Carry me back to old Virginia. You keep singing like that and they'll drag you back. Who are you? I'm a ghost. 
I'm the ghost of Richard, the lion-hearted. Who are you? I'm Costello, the chicken-livered. <laughs> Mr. Ghost, Costello is the sheriff, and we've got to investigate this house. Why don't you start in the cellar? Here, I'll open the door for you. You can go right down those stairs. <laughs> Costello, where are you? I'm down in the cellar, Rabbit, but look out for that first step. It's a Lulu. <laughs> All right, Costello, here I am. I'll turn on this flashlight and we'll take a look around. Yeah, but quick, look over there. There's a body on the floor. Is he dead? I can't tell. His head is missing. I... <laughs> out of here, Rabbit. Costello, what are we? Mice or men? I don't know about you, but I'm glad there's no cat around. <laughs> look. Mila Lagosa's back. Costello, it is indeed regrettable that you choose to prowl around in my cellar. I'm in a bloodthirsty mood. So far this week, I've only killed nine people. This guy sounds like a California driver. <laughs> Just a minute, Lugosi. Costello's the sheriff of this town, and you've got a you've got a dead man lying down here in your cellar. Yes, I know. He lives here. But he's dead. He's dead, I tell you. Why don't you throw him out? I can't. His rent is paid up until fir- June first. <laughs> We've got to continue with the search. Well, go ahead with your search. If you want me, I'll be in the morgue lying on my slab. That's where I'm happiest. I'm lying on my slab. Don't look now, Abbott, but I think he's a little slab happy. <laughs> Come on, Costello. Let's look in this room. Open the door. the world was that? I don't know, and I ain't getting down off this channel here to find out. <laughs> Come on down there, Costello. Hey, look. I just found a secret closet. Let's open it. Now, don't touch that door, Costello. Look at that sign. It says, this closet has never been opened in over 175 years. I don't believe that. I'm going to open it. Costello! Costello, where are you? I'm hiding over here under this bed. Come on, crawl out from under that bed. Okay. Now, I wonder who put that piggy bank under here. (laughs) Hey, look, Costello. There's a panel sliding open in that wall. Ah, gentlemen... How can I ever thank you? You've released me from a hypnotic spell that I've been under for over a thousand years. Oh, Abbott, she's beautiful. Tell me, miss, are you a mummy? Oh, no, I'm not even married. (laughs) Gee, you're lovely. Where did you come from? I remember coming here on Noah's Ark with all the animals. They all came in pairs. The birds came in pairs. The rabbits came in pairs. Did everything come in pairs? Everything but the worms. They come in apples. <laughs> what, are, what are you two doing here? Well, we're trying to solve the secrets of this house. I can help you. I know this house. I've got the inside. Uh, what you've got on the outside ain't bad either. <laughs> Be careful. Be careful. Didn't have enough material, eh? No, Lou, Lou, be careful. This girl is a vampire. She may be dangerous. And besides, she's a thousand years old. You ought to be able to handle a rabbit. She's the same age as your wife. (laughs) Which one of you gallant gentlemen opened that panel and released me? I did. 
Ah, I'm going to reward you. Come, put your arms around me. I'm going to kiss you. Uh. 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 There, how was that? Abbott, this kid is more than a thousand years old. Ah, oh, you're very sweet. You remind me of an actor I used to go with 500 years ago. Really? You went with an actor 500 years ago? What was his name? Al, Al Jolson. <laughs> hey, what's that? Oh, it's, it's Lugosi coming back. He mustn't find me here. I've got to get back behind my panel. But before I go, you may take my hand and kiss it. Thank you. Thank you. Costello, what are you doing? I'm kissing her hand. But Costello, the girl is gone. She's gone back behind that panel. Now, wasn't she sweet? She gave me her hand a kiss. I've got her hand and I'm holding it in mine and she's gone. And I wasn't that. She's gone. Come on, I still got her hand up. Quiet. What are you trying to do? Wake up the living? <laughs> Costello! Costello! It's Bella Lugosi! He's coming towards us! Well, Sheriff Costello, I got to go now before I get into trouble with the police. Are you afraid of the police because you killed those nine people last week? No, it's not that. Are you afraid of the police because of the dastardly crimes you've committed? No, it's not that. Then why are you afraid of the police? Yes, why? Why do you have to leave here so suddenly? Oh, I just remembered I left a, my car parked in a one-hour zone. And you know those Los Angeles cops. Good night, Mr. Costello. <laughs> Good night, Mr. Lugosa. Isn't he a lovely <laughs> Chuck Costello? Yes, he sure is. I'd like to have known him when he was alive. Here are Abbott and Costello with a final word. Good night, folks. Good night, everybody. Now let's join a true legend of American comedy who also entertained troops for nearly 60 years, Bob Hope. The Pepsodent Show, starring Bob Hope and his guest star, Kate Smith. March has marched away, folks. What's the day today, folks? As a rule, it's April Fool, and here's Bob Hope. Thank you so much. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob New Wavelength Hope telling you, radio listeners, you may have to change your dial, but if you use Pepsodent, you'll never have to change your smile. <laughs> Or, <laughs> this is Bob April Fool's Day, Hope, telling you that while we can't keep you from grabbing at pocketbooks on the sidewalk, if you use Pepsodent, your teeth will never be the victim of a bum yank. <laughs> well, I suppose, I suppose by this time you're sick of April Fool, but here I am anyway. <laughs> what an April Fool's Day. Have you tried to tune in a radio station today? All the numbers on the radio stations have been changed, and it's very confusing. On my radio, I pressed the first button and then opened a bridge in Omaha. <laughs> I pressed the next button and the top of my car went up. <laughs> I pressed both buttons, a little man came out and said, Go away, we got a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and all the stations moved about 20 points to the left. That means H.V. Caltonborn has to talk out of the corner of his mouth like this. <laughs> I didn't realize how confused it all was till I tuned in one station and heard Cecil B. DeMille giving Edward G. Robinson a bath in Lux. <laughs> it's the first time we the people couldn't find we the people. <laughs> I wish I could find a joke there, too. <laughs> but I found out the reason for those new dial changes. The Federal Communications Report says the antenna disturbance provoked by short-wage frequencies is interfering with interhemisphere reception. 
which is French for hope is lousing up the air again. <laughs> I didn't ask for any applause either. <laughs> But I know my sponsor likes me anyway He sent me a beautiful box of candy for April Fool's Day I didn't know whether there was any pepper in the candy or not So I tried one on my dog It's the first time, first time I ever heard a Pekingese give a Tarzan yell <laughs> And you know how kids tie a string to a $5 bill And when you reach for it, they pull it away? Well, I've been over at Paramount all day Diving for my option <laughs> But they can't fool me This afternoon somebody told me to watch my steps Because there was an open manhole in front of me I opened my mouth to say April Fool I got as far as April as the water closed over my head <laughs> But I had plenty of fun I dialed Carol Lombard's number and said Hello honey, this is Clark And a man's voice said No kidding, it's your end too <laughs> But we all went to an April Fool's party last night Out at Skinny Ennis's ranch It's a very lovely place It's known as El Stancho Grande <laughs> Which is Mexican for El Grande Stencho But it was a nice party And Skinny introduced me to a nice girl It was sort of a blind date for me And I wasn't disappointed at all One of her heads was quite pretty <laughs> What a girl They needed a new needle for the Victrola So they took off her pivot tooth And held it on the record <laughs> Nice party They gave out a prize for the most original costume Some guy with a clean shirt won it <laughs> but what an April Fool's Day party The champagne flown like 7-Up And Skinny served the cheapest martinis on record He just hired W.C. Fields to breathe on the olives <laughs> Hey, Bob Yeah, what is it, Bill? Well, Bob, I, I have to do some Easter shopping And I've got to buy a lot of clothes and Things like that Yeah, Bill Well, Bob, I thought I'd like to talk to you about my salary Last year's <laughs> Now, no kidding I've got to buy my wife a new Easter hat Do you buy those new Easter hats? I thought they hatched them Look, look, at, <laughs> look at that hat on the woman over there Look at that Uh-huh Well, mm. say, that looks just like the hat Mrs. Roosevelt was wearing mm, No wonder she's got to keep traveling <laughs> <laughs> Well, she's probably in a hurry As a matter of fact, a lot of folks are in a hurry these days They've heard that there's only a couple of weeks more to take advantage of Pepsodent's big free gift offer. And they, like all smart people, don't want to miss it. At drug counters all over the country, here's what's happening. I'd like a Pepsodent 50 Tufts toothbrush, please. Yes, ma'am. Here they are. Right here in this display tower. Would you like to choose your own favorite color handle? They're all sanitary, sealed in glass. And how about the free 25-cent package of Pepsodent? Oh, here it is. Free from Pepsodent to you. There's no charge for it, just the regular price of 50 cents for the toothbrush. Thank you very much. I'll take a free package of tooth powder. And there you have it. Every one of you is entitled to a free gift of Pepsodent toothpaste or Pepsodent tooth powder, whichever you prefer. All you do is go to your store, buy a Pepsodent 50 tough toothbrush at the regular price, and your salesman will present you with a free gift of toothpaste or tooth powder, compliments of Pepsodent. But don't wait, please. Take advantage of it now. The offer will expire in a couple of weeks. Get your 50 tough toothbrush and your free Pepsodent dentifrice while there's still time. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I have a really delightful surprise for you. May I present one of radio's most beloved and outstanding personalities, the songbird of the South, Kate Smith, singing... I can't remember to forget. All right, Kate. So I promise to erase every memory of your face. I can't remember to forget. It makes no difference how I bow, my heart taunted by a ghost. I can't remember to forget. Am I too late? I've seen the light at last I'll make up in the future for the past So with my pride in full retreat My heart kneeling at your feet And you remember to forget I can't remember 
remember to forget. Makes no difference how I pose, my heart's haunted by a ghost. I can't remember to forget. Do 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 do. Am I? That was really wonderful, Kate. Really wonderful. Well, thank you, Bob. Kate, I want to welcome you to the Peps and the Show. It's a thrill to have you here. And it's a thrill to be here, Bob. Really, yours is one of my favorite radio shows. I tune your program in every single Tuesday night. Is that a fact, Kate? Honestly, Bob. It's become a real habit with me. In fact, I don't think I could sleep without it. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Bob, while I'm here, I want to thank you for appearing on my show last Friday. Well, you know, Kate, I really enjoyed working on your program with Dorothy L'Amour and Una Merkel doing that bit from the road to Zanzibar. But, Bob, Bing Crosby was in that picture, too. How is it he didn't show up on the broadcast? Well, one of his horses was dying, and he had to sit up with him. (laughs) It was the first time he'd ever seen one of his horses finish. While we were on the air, you actually kissed Dorothy L'Amour. You know, you weren't supposed to kiss her. We have a sound effects man who takes care of that. Yeah, how do you get into that union? <laughs> well, Bob, the way you kiss, I wouldn't want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> Say, I noticed when you were on my show, Bob, that you were dressed in the usual fashion, but you were wearing a pair of rubbers. Why was that? Well, whenever I get near that Dorothy L'Amour, the water on my knee percolates. <laughs> I really had the audience over at your place laughing, though, didn't I, Kate? Yes, Bob, you sure did. You're the first guest I ever had that stood at the door as the people came in and gave them all shots of adrenaline. (laughs) Well, I had to do that, Kate. The ushers refused to run through the audience with feathers. But I I enjoyed doing The Road to Zanzibar on your show. You know, it's a sequel to The Road to Singapore. Road to Zanzibar, Road to Singapore. Why doesn't Paramount just hang a red lantern on your nose? (laughs) They can't. W.C. Fields has it patented. Hey, I have appeared in all the road pictures, though I even took a test for that picture, Tobacco Road. Did you get the part in it? No. Then why don't you change back to your regular clothes? <laughs> How do you like that? Wait and uh, let my brother-in-law have a line there, but I'm disregarded. But I'm doing, I'm doing all... I took such a big t- take, I lost my place. But I'm doing all right in those road pictures. I have enough money, I don't have to worry. You don't, Bob? No, I've got so much money, I can even talk back to a waiter at the Brown Derby. <laughs> I suppose you've been around seeing places like the Brown Derby and the Pirate's Den during your visit here, Kate? Yes, and there's something I'd like to ask you about California. What is it? Does it really rain out here? (laughs) Survivors! (laughs) But, Kate, I haven't introduced you to the members of our cast. Would you like to meet our band leader, Skinny Ennis? Oh, I'd love to, Bob. What a lovely word, skinny. (laughs) Is that him over there, Bob? Goodness, has he always been so thin or just since you've been paying him? (laughs) Oh, he's always been small and thin. In fact, he was four years old before anyone knew he was born. (laughs) To be perfectly frank, Kate, compared to him, you look a little big. Bob, compared to him, there's no comparison. (laughs) Yeah, I wish my dog were here now I'd love him to see Miss Annis You'd like to have your dog see Skinny Annis? Yeah, I want him to be satisfied with the bones he's getting now (laughs) Well, I'll call him Hey, Skinny Yeah, Bob Come over here Kate, this is Skinny Annis Skin, this is Kate Smith Are you kidding? (laughs) So this is Skinny Annis Yeah, and if you're all through examining me How about putting me down? I'm glad to know you, Skinny I said I'm glad to know you, Skinny Well, say something 
comes the revolution, all the weight will be divided equal. <laughs> you know, Skin, Kate's from Dixie, too. Oh, are you a southerner, Skin? They call me the songbird of the South. What do they call you down south? Yankee. <laughs> Yankee? But, Skinny, there are no more Yankees and Southerners. We're all together under the stars and stripes. Why, even Bob Hope belongs as much to the South as he does to the North. <laughs> Don't go to North Carolina seceding again. <laughs> Guys, you know, Kate, you know, I'd like to be big and husky like you. Well, that's easy, Skin. Have you ever heard of grape nuts? No. No, we don't hear much from the outside world on this program. <laughs> well, well, what do you talk about? Just Pepsi. <clears throat> really? Yeah, we talk Pepsi and eat Pepsi and sleep Pepsi and nothing but Pepsi and day and night. Well, don't you ever go out with girls? No, when we get in the mood, the sponsor sends over a couple of tubes that can rumba. <laughs> Say, Kate. Yeah. How do you get your voice to sound so powerful when you sing? Well, skin, it's really very simple. Before you start to sing, you just take four deep breaths. Now, go ahead. Okay. <sighs> hey, what's that? One of my corpuscles writing a letter to Ripley. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> mate, so long to you, and I want you to know it's, it's been nice seeing you. It's been nice hardly seeing you, too, Skin. <laughs> You know, Bob, Skinny isn't a bad singer Yeah, he's a pretty good singer And you're a good singer, Kate But when I sing, everyone in the United States hears me Everyone in the United States hears you? Everyone in the nation, listen Ha-ha! I did it for national defense <laughs> Thank you very much, Kate And we can't let you go away without singing another song Ladies and gentlemen, Kate Smith singing I Hear a Rhapsody Please
really belts them out, doesn't he? <laughs> you just heard a rhapsody there. Say, Bill, yes, what's Bob? that machine you and Skinny have been fussing with over there in the corner? Oh, that? Well, I'll tell you. Skinny has invented a memory machine, Bob. You just press a button and the machine remembers stuff. Hey, go ahead, Bob. Ask you something. Okay, what's Hattie Lamar's telephone number? That number is Adams 95623. Hey, that's right. <laughs> is it? <laughs> See if it remembers what she did when I asked her. Yeah, you had to go open your big mouth. <laughs> well, no, 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 just no. And Bob Goodwin was going to give it a real memory test. Hey, what were you going to ask it, Bill? Well, Skin, I was going to ask it if it remembered how many tufts there are in ordinary toothbrushes. Now, the brush that most of you ladies and gentlemen are using probably has 17, 19, 23, or 25 tufts. Now compare that with the new Pepsodent 50 tuft toothbrush. And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have the answer to a sensational overnight success. No other toothbrush contains 50 tufts of Fibrex, DuPont's marvelous synthetic fibers. No other toothbrush gives you double power cleansing. And no other toothbrush combines this high efficiency with gentle and springy fibers that whip into hard-to-reach areas, yet that are gentle on your gums. No, sir, ladies and gentlemen, never before have the number of tufts in your toothbrush been so important to beautiful, bright teeth. These new Pepsodent 50 tuft toothbrushes cost no more than ordinary brushes, just 50 cents. But what a whale of a lot more you get. Comfortable-feeling handles, a choice of many sparkling colors, and a sanitary sparkling glass package. Get your Pepsodent 50 Tuft brush tomorrow. It's just like walking on air. Feel like a bubble, no trouble, no care. Feel like a And now, Bob Hope offers his version of walking on air. Our scene opens with two of Hollywood's most lovable characters riding in their auto. Hey, Brenda, what is it, Colpina? <laughs> Nice to be out driving like this. Yeah. You know, I think I got spring fever. <laughs> spring fever? What's that? You know, when you feel so lazy you don't want to do anything but neck with fellas all day. <laughs> that means it's spring. You mean for 40 years I've been living in the same season? <laughs> look! Look! We're passing a man. <laughs> No, it's not right to whistle at man. <laughs> is it is. No. Uh, just get up on the hood and drag him off the sidewalk. Oh, he didn't pay no. He didn't pay no attention. We should have brought the harpoon. <laughs> Say, Kobe, there's a gas station over there. I think we need some gas. Drive in. Brenda, we just got gas five minutes ago. We don't need any more. <gasps> oh, look at them good-looking attendants. <laughs> Fill her up. <laughs> Uh, can I do anything for you? Are you kidding? <laughs> oh, come on, let's go. Oh, look, there's Clark Gable. Won't you climb into my car, Mr. Gable? Here, sit next to me. You dear boy, it was sweet of you to send me those flowers this morning. What's that? Oh, certainly I'll tell my chauffeur. Up here, drive Mr. Gable and me through Lover's Lane. Oh, Clark. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> Oh, your mustache tickles my ear. Oh, Clark. Hmm. And they gave Ginger Rogers the Academy Award for acting. <laughs> oh, look, Copina. Look at that handsome man crossing the street. <laughs> well, let's get going. He's no good to us now. <laughs> Say, I meant to tell you, I went to the doctor today about the water on my knee. Look how he fixed it. Watch what happens when I shake my knee. <laughs> well, what do you know? Seven up. <laughs> Corbina, I just noticed your lipstick's awful red today. Lipstick nothing. Every time we stop suddenly, I kiss the cigar lighter. <laughs> Kissing a cigar lighter. <laughs> Why, you silly girl, that's the most idiotic thing I... Is it good? <laughs> 
Well, compared to the fellas I usually get, yes. Oh, gee, I'm afraid we'll never get any fellas. Colbina, don't be so pessimistic. Why, when them fellas see us driving in this swell car, two gorgeous dames with lovely complexions, beautiful features, luscious figures, very exotic looking. Brenda, I told you to put that Ethel in the car. <laughs> Two fellas sitting on the bench. Let's sneak up on them. All right. Uh, don't forget, though. Take it easy. This is our last monkey wrench. <laughs> Come on. Let's sneak up on them and hear what they're saying. Say, William. What is it, Robert? <laughs> <laughs> Gee, it sure is romantic here in the park, isn't it? Say, is that girl still watching me? No, you can stop walking on your hands now. <laughs> oh, I guess it's no use. Why can't we get girls? What's wrong with us? You think it's true what they say about Sen Sen? <laughs> Say, look at that Look at that girl over there Oh, Bob, that girl isn't so nice Only an average fellow would even consider flirting with her Only an average fellow would be willing to be seen with her Only an average fellow would be willing to make love to her Meet John Doe <laughs> Well, anyway, it's nice seeing you here in a park, Bob Gosh, I'll bet the corner of Hollywood and Vine doesn't look the same without you I didn't like that remark, Bill I don't want to get a reputation as being the only fellow in Hollywood Who hangs around on corners on Hollywood Boulevard whistling at girls other actors do that, too Well, yeah, but you're the, you're the only guy in Hollywood Who has a stand-in for the night shift <laughs> Gee, look at that gorgeous blonde Oh, what a beautiful blonde Yeah Oh, look, it's starting to rain Oh, boy, it's raining hard mm, She don't look bad as a brunette, either <laughs> Say, Bill, look, there's a cop over there Behind those bushes Why, it's Professor Colonna Colonna, so you're now a cop Yes, officer of the law, servant of the people, upholder of human rights, and defender of womankind. Also bets taken for Bay Meadows. <laughs> well, are you attending your job, Professor? Yes, Hope, tell me, is it true that there's a guy in this park who holds up fellows and then takes their pants so they can't chase after him? That's right, Colonna. You see, ladies, I ain't just absent-minded. <laughs> officer Colonna, get back in your beat. Okay, now just a minute. I want to help this little girl over the puddle. Now, little girl, it's just a small puddle, so when I say three, jump over it. One, two, three. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many kids we lose that way. <laughs> hey, Bill. Yeah. Bill, look at, that, yeah. look at that small, thin pigeon over there hunting around for crumbs. Yeah, say, who's that fat pigeon behind him? That's his agent. <laughs> Oh, gee whiz, I wish some girls had come by Boy, what legs What legs What legs Oh, come on, give me back my caterpillar <laughs> Come on, honey No one can see us here Flip your little kit Why, Officer Colonna, have you got a girl back there? Oh, no, no, I'm just playing with a sparrow A little teeny sparrow <laughs> Big son of a gun, wasn't she? <laughs> Never mind. What are you doing now, Colonna? Oh, I'm just picking a little dandelion. Long roots. <laughs> Say, Bob, look. Here come a couple of girls in a car. Gee, Bill, this is our chance. I'm going to be daring. I'll whistle to them lightly. I wonder if they whistle back. <whistles> <laughs> this is the first time I ever picked up a factory whistle. <laughs> We're not a factory whistle We're girls Come, come This is no time for April Fool jokes <laughs> Well, yes Say, gee Here comes a cop Let's all hide in these bushes Yeah, let's hide Yes yeah. All right Now I'll hide And you see if you can find me <laughs> Kelowna Come here Come over here Bell-bottom pants <laughs> Bell-bottom head That did it These two here are under arrest But, Professor, they're Brendan Cabina I don't care what their names are They can't run around this park Without a license on their collars <laughs> Now you're all under arrest Everyone get in the car Oh, but, oh, Professor but Now, now get in, get in Here we go Wait, Scott, Professor We're going 110 miles an hour Yes, and sideways, too <laughs> Colonna, watch how you're driving Can't you see that sign? No U-turn? No, U-turn I haven't got a driver's license 
Colonna, watch out. We're headed right for the lake. Don't worry. As soon as I get the car up to 120 miles an hour, we just skim over the lake. 110 miles, 115 miles, 120, and here we go, right over the lake. Colonna, look out! <laughs> You'd be surprised how many cars we lose this way. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. I guess that's all, isn't it? True Crime Stories of the 1940s and 1950s are up next with Jack Webb's Dragnet. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to narcotics detail. A gang of veteran dope peddlers moves into your city. They offer $100,000 worth of heroin for sale. They make their contacts. They're ready to do business. Your job, stop them. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. Buy a pack of Fatimas. You'll find they now cost the same. Light a Fatima. Your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, what a difference. In Fatima, the difference is quality. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Because of its quality, its extra mildness, its better flavor and aroma... Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. Try comparing Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all, long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. <laughs> the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, June 24th. It was sultry in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of narcotics. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 9.27 a.m. when I got to the Charing Cross Apartments on 12th Street. The side entrance. crime lab came out and fixed it last night, went next door and replaced the microphone. I'm getting real sour on this detail, Joe. Well, here, let me take over for a while, huh? Yeah, you bet you. Here. My ears feel like a couple of baked cauliflowers. Two solid weeks holed up in this place with a pair of earphones on. Yeah. What do we got to show for it? That woman next door hasn't even mentioned narcotics in two weeks. All she does is eat, sleep, and play solitaire. Goes out for groceries once in a while. Hold it. Somebody ringing the buzzer next door. First visit in a week. Yeah. Just a minute. Yeah, go ahead. Hello? Yeah, 
like to introduce myself, Miss Washburn. My name's Howard Scully. You and George were uh, former associates, I understand. Mm, we worked together a little. What can I do for you? Well, George and I are old friends. We were in business in Hong Kong before the war. He's a nice fellow, George. No, I have a date downtown in half an hour. I don't have much time to talk. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't realize you're in such a hurry. I'll get right to the point. Yeah. My business partners and I just came up from Mexicali a few days ago, and we have some merchandise that's ready for the market. It's good quality. That's right here. I contacted George, thinking he might introduce me to some prospective buyers. He said he didn't want to handle any merchandise at this time. Why not? Oh, it's something about the police. They seem to be watching him. He just didn't want to take any part in any business venture. Just wanted to just get it. And George gave you a bum steer sending you to me. I can't help you. Well, you haven't heard my proposition. I don't have to hear it. Count me out. I don't fool around with junk, any of it. It's a tough rap out here. Well, if you'll just listen to my proposition, Mr. No. Washburn. I'm not, no, please, I'm not asking you to be involved. I'm a perfectly safe and legitimate transaction in mind. You'll be well paid for your time and effort with no risk whatsoever. Yeah, I know. All you big connections make it sound good. <laughs> George tells me you're acquainted with the right kind of people. People with money, that's... Kind of people that my partners and I want to meet. Now, all I'm asking you to do is introduce me to a few such persons for our mutual benefit, and then you just leave the rest to me. Yeah, it's still too much. If I gave you an office to a buyer and you were caught, they'd get me for conspiracy. No, there's no, not. I've seen too much of it, Scully. It's no sale. Well, you'll just have to believe me, Miss Washburn. No one's going to be caught. Now, we work in an entirely different manner. The police haven't any idea of our method of operation. We've tested it in six big cities in the Orient. And not once did it fail us, and I tell you, it's not going to fail us here. It's your story. Well, it's perfect. I'm not chancing a rap to prove you're wrong. What? Here, do you want a cigarette? Yes, thank you. No, I'm not ready. Okay. Now, I'm only asking one thing, Miss an introduction to the right party, and that's all. Now, you know my reputation. I'll make it well with your wife. If the connection is right, you can live on your take for the rest of the year. I don't have many friends, just a few whom so? I guaranteed for my payoffs. Well, I can deposit the money with George. He'll hold it until the deal is made. What do you say? An introduction. That's all. That's all we'll need. Our product speaks for itself. I know a fellow out in Hollywood. His name's McMillan. Mm. I can call him and tell him to meet you. That'll be fine, huh, Sue? I'm not going to introduce you. No, that will be... I'll set up a meet for you, that's all. All right, that's all we ask. Do you have this, Mr. Uh, McMillan? McMillan. Uh, you have him meet me tonight? I think so, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Now, tonight at 11.30, I'll be at the corner of 7th and Alameda. Now, remember this now. Yeah, all right. Corner of 7th and Alameda at 11.30 exactly. I'll have on a gray coat, and I'll be carrying a book. Now, McMillan shouldn't have any trouble recognizing you. You just tell him to walk right up to me, put out his hand, and say, My name's McMillan, that's all. I'll know if he's the right party. My name's McMillan. That's all he has to say. All right, I've got it. I'll pass it on. All right. Well, I'll make arrangements with George as soon as possible to take care of your fee. Thank you very much, Miss Washburn. Not at all. Just don't be too sure of yourself. The fuzz in this town can smell a bite three miles away. We'll take care of the police, Miss Washburn. The system should teach him a few lessons. <laughs> well, goodbye, Mr. Washburn. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, don't, uh, don't come here after this. Call me on the phone. Certainly. Goodbye. Joe? Wait a minute. She's going for the phone. Come on. Police officers. All right, what's the pitch? I'd like to talk to you downtown. About what? Howard Scully. What about him? We know why he was here. Get your coat, please. I haven't done anything. Come on, lady, let's go. I told Scully I didn't want him. He made the proposition, but I didn't buy it. You know that. I didn't buy a word of it. We did. Before the suspect was taken downtown, we informed her landlady to tell anyone that she'd be out of town for a week. That information was to be passed on to any of her friends or business acquaintances who might try to contact her. After that, we took May Washburn back to the office. After being questioned thoroughly, she was detained for further investigation. At 2 p.m., Ben and I met with Captain Kearney, Central Narcotics, and Inspector Virgil Beckner, State Narcotics Bureau, Southern Division. 
$100,000 buy. Is that what they have in mind? That's the word around town, Skipper. Washburn girl told us the same thing. The Washburn woman was approached for an office, huh? Yes, that's right, Beck. She was ready to go when we picked her up. Pusher's Howard Scully, you remember him? About nine years ago, wasn't it, the Tijuana deal? Eight or nine years, yeah. That big heroin buy, they tagged every one of the gang but Scully. Yeah, he's no amateur. He's got every narcotic law in the book memorized. He sets the deals, takes the gravy, but he never gets tagged. How about the federal narcotics men, Romero? They've been briefed on this deal? I called Harry Stone over there this morning. They've been following you, too. Said he'd be over this afternoon. They're the setup for this McMillan guy. What do you think, Captain? Clear sailing there, Beck, as far as I can see. Scully set up to meet with Mae Washburn. Ben and Joe grabbed her before she could contact McMillan. Unless Scully's got a Ouija board, he still must figure everything's Jake. Then we could have a man meet with Scully tonight and pass himself off as McMillan. Well, shouldn't be too much trouble. From the way he talks, Scully's never seen McMillan. Has no idea what he looks like. It's just a guess. Uh, neither one of you are known to Scully, are you? I never met him or his friends. Mm -hmm. I worked that case last February when we grabbed Ray Murdoch. He used to be a mule for Scully. That's the closest I've been. Well, I'm afraid that's too close. You know how many hype friends Murdoch has in this town. If any of them spot you and pass the word to Scully, the whole deal's choked off. Joe? Mm hmm? You think you could pass yourself off as McMillan for a couple of days? I'd like to give it a try. Beck, what do you think? Good with me. We can help with the tailing. Only one possible hitch I can see. Yeah. We're not positive this guy McMillan's a total stranger to Scully. It sure sounded like it, didn't it, Joe? The way Scully and the Washburn girl were talking. It's possible Scully might have seen a picture of McMillan. Maybe he knows something about his background, his habits, how he does business. Well, it's possible, yeah. Suppose Scully starts asking you questions, Joe. How are you going to cover it? Well, we could talk to the Washburn girl again. She might brief us. Now, if we need the guy's life history, let's pick it up firsthand. How do you mean? Cat McMillan. Late that afternoon, Stanley McMillan was located at a small restaurant out in the valley and quietly placed under arrest. He was booked at one of the outlying stations on suspicion of violating the State Narcotics Act. We questioned him and got all the necessary information on his background that we needed. He told us that he had never seen or had any dealings before with Howard Scully. 7.30 p.m. I went home, changed my clothes, put away my gun, ID card, and the rest of my identification. An hour later, I checked in at a small hotel near 5th and Main Streets. 11.15 p.m., I left the hotel and started for 7th and Alameda Streets where the scheduled meet with Howard Scully was to take place. As in most cases, there was one all-important rule that I had to work by. If the suspects were to be arrested and successfully prosecuted, we had to get them with narcotics in their possession or under their control. And one of the first things that the working detective learns is that dealers such as Scully rarely do the actual handling of narcotics except at the actual moment of sale. If the officer fails to make an arrest at that moment, the odds are stacked heavily against the conviction of the narcotics criminal. 11.30 p.m., I got to the corner of 7th and Alameda Streets. I walked up to a man standing by a lamppost. He was short, heavily built, dark hair, dark eyes, and a small scar on his chin. He had on a gray coat, and he carried a book under one arm. I put out my hand. Yes. And my name's McMillan. Oh, glad to know you, Mr. McMillan. My name's Scully. Why are you? I uh, understand we have mutual friends, is that correct? That's what I'm told, yeah. Uh -huh. You're from uh, Louisiana originally, New Orleans. No. Oh, that's so? I thought you were from Louisiana. No, uh, Missouri, St. Louis. Oh, I see. I suppose we uh, go for a drive, huh? My hotel's down on Fifth. We could talk there. Oh, I think my car would be better. I can't afford to waste time. I got customers waiting. Oh, you can believe me. This won't be a waste of time. I'm prepared to do business. All right, let's go. Fine. Right. Hey, no, go ahead, McMillan. All right, thanks. Now, will you uh, raise that handle on the other side so I can get in? Yeah, sure. Fine. Thank you. You can't be too careful in L.A., I hear. Yeah, that's right. There's a lot of heat. Oh? I hope none of it's on you. Don't worry, I'm clean. No tumbles. Will I be here if there were? I got customers to protect. Good customers. Fine. You know, maybe we can do business. How much can you handle? How much you got? How oh, about 10,000 worth? Standard rate, full measure. Hard to cut it off. Sounds fair. We drove three more blocks, and then Scully pulled the car to a stop underneath a row of spreading palm trees on a deserted street. He pulled the emergency brake on, then he turned to me, clamped my arms to my sides, and shook me down. <laughs> What's the pitch here? What's the idea? No offense, McMillan. Simple precaution in case you had a gun. What do you take me for, mister? I'm not used to doing business this way. 
That might go real great in the East, but it's nothing out here. Oh, no, no. I said no offense. This is a hot town. You could be a fuzz. You can't be too careful. You know that. Yeah, well... You don't have to pull that careful stuff with me. Who set up this meet, anyway? You are listening to Dragnet. Authentic stories of your police force in action. Oh, no. Ah, that's different. Yes, what a difference. There's There's a difference you can hear, there's a difference you can see, but the difference in Fatima is quality. Yes, friends, when you compare long cigarettes, you'll find that in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos. The finest Turkish and domestic varieties, extra mild and superbly blended, to give you a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, plump cigarettes rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Quality even to the appearance of the bright, clean yellow package. Carefully wrapped and sealed to bring you Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. Fatima's cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all, long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. June 25th, Thursday, 12.30 a.m. I had two and a half hours to raise $10,000. The narcotics dealers, Howard Scully and his partner, Jim Rhodes, had laid it out for me. Either I had the money by 3 a.m. or there was no deal. If it failed to come off, our plan to trap the narcotics gang would be worth nothing. Rhodes and Scully could possibly find another buyer without our knowledge, make a deal, and flood the market with their store of narcotics. I knew it would be impossible to get the $10,000 together. We had only one alternative, fake our way as best we could. I went back to the hotel, put a call through to Captain Kearney at the office, and told him what had happened. He went to work on it. From the Narcotic Details Emergency Fund, set up for such purposes, we got together $600. From Chief of Detectives Thad Brown, Deputy Chief White, the State Narcotics Bureau, and anyone else available by phone, we succeeded in rounding up another $350. 2.30 a.m. The money was tied in two small bundles, with hundreds, fifties, and twenties on top. One dollar bills were sandwiched in between. The two bundles were placed in a briefcase and delivered to me at the hotel on Fifth Street. A gun was also in the briefcase. I took it out, put it in my pocket, closed the briefcase. 2.45 a.m., I left the hotel with the money and started for the big meet. 3 a.m., 7th and Alameda. McMillan, how are you? Scully, we're down this way. You the money? Your pal said all or nothing, I got it. Mm -hmm. Let's have a look. How about the merchandise? We can check it in the car. It's right down here. Rhodes? All right. Money? Yeah, that's right. I got the money. Now, how about a look at this stuff? I'd like to know what I'm buying. We can stop on the way for a sample. Okay, Howard. Yeah. Care for something, McMullen? What do you got? Cashew nuts. Have some. Mm, thank you. There's lots of heat in this town. Cops are thick as flies. Yeah, that's right. Rough time. I gotta be careful. What's the reason, anyway? When did it start? Well, oh, about six weeks ago. Bulls tagged some high school kids. Mm-hmm. Half dozen of them. Huh? What for? Well, they were regular hypes. Just punks, 18 year olds. A couple of them were 70. Young squirts. Yeah, and the heat's going to get worse. One of the punks cashed in yesterday. Read it in the paper. Overdose. Not going to help business. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I'm playing it close. I got good customers, and I'm not going to risk my neck. How much stuff do you think you can handle a month, McMillan? No thanks, no more. Oh, I got about 30 mainliners. They're regular, and they're sure. Eight, ten ounces a week, but they like good stuff. No alley hype junk. Howard must have told you. That's all we handle, good stuff. If it goes right, we could make it a permanent connection with you. I'd like to see what you're offering first. You'll have a good look. All right, Howard, you know where to pull up. Yeah. Hey, 
You stay in the comic mode. Hmm? All right. All right, Mac, you can get out. Yep. There you go. Some of the best white stuff you've seen in a long time. Satisfy yourself. Okay. All right. Okay, it's standard. It's all good. Not just that sample. Okay, I'll go. Okay, now how about the money? All right, have a look. There you are. One stack. Two stacks, hundreds, twenties, tens. A few fives in there. It's ten grand. Satisfied? Okay. Jim? Right. Oh, uh, excuse me, Mac. Just a minute. I'm just checking. What do you think you're doing? Get your lousy hands off of me. No, no offense, McMillan. These are simple precautions. Precautions, nothing. We're doing business, aren't we? You shook me down once tonight. Now, how many times is it going to take you? No oh, offense, Mac. He's just checking, that's all. Well, all right, then. Suppose I fan you two down. I got the dough. How do I know this isn't a hijack deal? Now, come on. This business works both ways. Either we have a deal or we don't. We play ball on both sides or not at all. I'm getting sick and tired of taking second place. Okay, Mac. Okay, take it easy. Forget it, Howard. Let's all go back to the car. Sure. I'm sorry, Mac. No offense. Yeah. Okay, let's close the deal. Where are we going to go? Don't worry, it's a safe place. Okay, Howard. Three thirty-five a.m. In another hour, it'd start getting light. I knew they'd planned to have the buy take place before then. According to our plan, Ben and Sergeant Hunt, along with the other team of men from the State Narcotics Bureau, they were to tail us to the place of the meet and move in on a signal from me when the buy was actually in progress. Three forty-five a.m. Scully drove out North Figueroa onto Pasadena Avenue and turned right onto Avenue 43. We headed up Montecito Drive. The area became more deserted. There were no homes around, no buildings of any kind to provide cover for anybody that might be following. Somewhere below, we could hear the rattle of a freight train on its way to the Southern Pacific Yards. Off in the distance, I could see the lights of the city. They looked pretty far away. Scully finally pulled the car to a stop on the crest of the highest hill in the area. We got out. What do you think, Mac? Well, a nice view. Yeah. Spent a long time finding this spot. It's foolproof. Yeah? Bring him over here, Jim. Let's show him. Come on. You see there? Clear view of everything down below. At least half a mile in every direction. No chance of getting trapped up here. Pretty smart. That's the way I like to deal. If there's any cops following us, we can see the lights before they get here. Plenty of time. Cover up any evidence. Cops ask questions, well, we tell them we're just looking at real estate up here. It's pretty good, huh? Well, I gotta hand it to you. You can't be too careful. What do you do for lookouts? Let me show you. Swede! Oh, Swede! Who's that? Friend. Yeah, Jim? Well, what's the pitch? Who is this guy? Business pal of Howard and me. Swede, this is Mr. McMullen. What do you say? How do you do? Look, how many people do you need to make a buy, Rhodes, huh? Swede's a lookout. It's a big fella, isn't it? We got enough people here for a Sunday picnic. We need a lookout. You just got to finish saying it. We can't be too careful. Well, come on, let's wrap it up. Where's the stuff? Swede, you want to go? Okay, all right. How far does he have to go? Close by. Stuff was put away down in the tall grass. Nobody ever found it. It's a good idea. I like the way you operate. Swede will have the stuff for you in a minute. Well, how about the money? Should we count it? Rather wait till Swede gets back. Okay. Swede for the car. Can't beat this spot, can you, McMullen? No, it's good. You had no idea how much time we spent looking for it. You did real good. Yeah. Here you can go. Okay, thanks. Now the money, hmm? Well, how about counting it out here? I'd feel better keeping an eye on that road down below. Okay, good idea. Well, let's count it, Mac, huh? Yeah, all right. There you go. There's one bundle, and there's the other. 
I'll come at you. Yeah, snap it up. We've been here long enough already. Well, well there's quite a few $1 bills here. Huh? Well, there's a few of them, but it's all there. Ten well, that's how it could be with all these ones. Here, let me see. Don't bother the roads. Here, what are you trying to fall? I right, get away from the car, Scully. You too, sweet. Put the gun down, Mac. You won't get away get with it. Get your hands behind your head. That means you too, Rhodes. Nobody's hijacked us, McAllen. You're not going to be the first one. It's no hijack, mister. This is a pinch. He's a fuzz. He's a... He's a lousy fuzz. I knew we should have found him again. Shut up, Howard. You know we can square this with you, Mac. Five grand cold cash, no questions. You're talking to yourself, Rhodes. I'll make it ten. Ten grand cash. Now, you can't afford to pass that up. Come on, how about it, Mac? You're human just like we are. You can use the dog. You keep your hands behind your head, mister. Use some sense, copper. Swede's as strong as a horse. I could put him on you, he'd break every bone in your body. You're gonna have to get past this gun first. You're not gonna stop all three of us. How do you think you're gonna get back to town? Don't worry, he won't have to walk. He'll never get us downtown. Swede will break you in half. He'll kill you. You just gave me an idea, Rhodes. Huh? You're pretty tough. Shouldn't bother you. I'll kill the Swede right now. You and Scully can carry his body in front of me. We'll start walking down that road where we hit the nearest place with a phone. I think that'll take care of it, won't it? He hasn't got the guts, Jim. Turn around, Swede. Look, don't kill me, mister. I'll, I'll go away. Don't shoot. Turn around. Stay where you are, Scully. Don't, don't, don't kill him, copper. Don't kill Swede. We'll do anything you say. Somebody coming. Look, Mac, we'll give you every dime we own. Fifty thousand bucks. And Come tell on. him nothing's happened. Ben, over here. Fifty grand, Mac. You can't lose. Right, you. Back. Back over this way. The three of them, Ben. Okay. All right, behind your back. Come on. Just couldn't get here any sooner, Joe. Had to park at the bottom of the hill and they'd have seen us. Stand still, mister. Yeah. We circled around on foot, climbed up through the grass. I was beginning to think I lost you. All right, you two. Get them behind your back. Back. Hi, Joe. There's the junk right here. These two packages. Good. That ought to sew it up. Look, uh... Talk it over with your partners, huh? Fifty thousand bucks. You do the right thing. It's all yours. How about it? Fifty grand. You can't lose. What are they talking about, Joe? Well, they got a big deal. They'll give us 50000 if we let them go. How about it, Tex? You could use the dough, new car, new house. Just forget you ever saw us. Easy as that. 50000 cash. What do you say, Tex, huh? Sorry, you got the wrong man. What? My name ain't Tex. <laughs> just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. In a moment, the results of their trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. In his training, the working detective is taught the importance of thoroughness. He has learned never to overlook even the smallest detail. What may seem unimportant to the novice may well be the one thing to help the working detective successfully culminate his case. So, with a cigarette... The people who make Fatima are well-trained and thorough in the manufacture of their cigarette. Fatimas contain the finest Turkish and domestic tobacco superbly blended. And pack after pack, Fatima is extra mild. If you're a long cigarette smoker like I am, smoke Fatima. They cost the same, but in Fatima, the difference is quality. Smoke Fatima. <laughs> Washburn, Howard Lewis Scully, James Henry Rhodes, and John Swede Nelson were tried and convicted. They received their sentences as prescribed by law and are now serving their term in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases, portions transcribed from official files. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Now it's time to pay a visit to Duffy's Tavern. Hello, Duffy's Tavern. Where do you leave me, Dee? Aren't you the man just baking? Duffy ain't here. Oh, hello, Duffy. A big crowd tonight. No, it looks like we ain't being hurt by the turf road. <laughs> well, uh, most of our customers is patriotic and realize that they have to carry their loads, too, so... <laughs> now that we're closing early, they get their load on early. 
In fact, Moriarty was so patriotic he was stiff at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the guy's kind of kid about the curfew. Yeah, they call it the witching hour. Because at 12 o'clock, they got to go home to their wives. <laughs> Say, Duffy, uh, you remember my friend, uh, Honest Dave Hossinger? Yeah, the crook. <laughs> well, he has went straight. Yeah, he's become a theatrical agent. And, uh... Guess who, say, uh, who he says he's bringing down here tonight? Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, Eddie Cantor, Donna Shaw, Kate Smith. Now, Duffy, don't get worried. Well, Dave says they're going to come down or drop. Free. Yeah. Well, Duffy, they got to show up. I got a big sign outside advertising them. Well, don't worry. I won't make a bum out of you. They'll be here. Duffy, look. Have you got any faith in me or haven't you? Hello? Hi, Eddie. Hi, Eddie. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, that big sign outside. Yeah. Uh, with them great big red letters. Yeah, yeah. The, does that mean what it says? Absolutely. What does it say? <laughs> well, it says tonight at 845, big all-star floor show. Well. Our artist guests would include Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, Donna Shaw, Nell Smith, Jeanette McDonald. Yeah, that's Mr. Archie. What a man. His dreams is getting better all the time. <laughs> I do. I do. Is all them stars really coming down here tonight? What well, Mr. Archie say they are? Well, if Archie says so, that's good enough for me. They ain't coming. <laughs> well, he thinks they are. Oh, Hello, I... fellas. Uh, hiya, Finnegan. How's your love life? Well, dude. <laughs> well, be patient. <laughs> Did you hear about the big show here tonight? Uh, yeah, I tell you, are we really going to see all them big stars? Certainly, you'll see them, every one of them. You know, uh, I got a drag. Uh, give me a drag. I'd like to see them, too. <laughs> yeah, Miss Archie, how can you believe that phony hockey? Now, that man is just too I soft. know, I know. I'm a sucker. I'm an idiot. I'm a jerk. That's telling them, Mark. <laughs> I ain't as scared of him. Oh, well, now look, Eddie. Leave us look at it on logic. Dave Hostinger is a friend of mine who has been a crook, right? Right. Now he writes me and says he's going straight. Touche? Touche. <laughs> he has become a theatrical agent. Possible? Possible. And he says to get my goodwill, he's going to get a lot of big stars to come down here for nothing. Could be? Could be. But you think he's pulling something crooked, right? Right? Possible? Touche? Could be a bingo. <laughs> well, look, Eddie, I know what you're thinking, but I believe that every man should be gave another chance. Don't forget, to wear is human, but anybody can make a mistake. <laughs> yeah, Archie, I agree with you. To me, you make a lot of sense. I don't care, Finnegan. I still think I'm right. <laughs> now, about this floor show, we got... Hey, wait a minute. That guy over there eating a free lunch, ain't that Sir Heathcliff Banner's wig? Uh, yeah, the comedian. Hey, I. I thought you fired him. I thought so, too. How are we ever going to get rid of that guy? Simple. Just let him keep on eating the free lunch. <laughs> hey, uh, Sir Heathcliff, what brings you down here? Well, hello, Archie. Well, as the teaching Tom said to the chorus girl, I just thought I'd look in on you. Now, look, Heathcliff, if this visit is social, we're glad to see you. If, on the other hand, you're going to try to ease yourself back here... Nothing of the thought, old boy. I'm a philosopher. We had a relationship. It's been terminated. Pip, pip, it was his myth. <laughs> Good. But I wanted you to know that it wasn't my fault that you got his medic. <laughs> it was Duffy, you know. It was, eh? Oh, sure. I used to defend you. I says to Duffy, I said, Duffy... Why don't you give Sir Heathcliff another chance, you know? We're only paying him five bucks a week, and he ain't a bad guy. So, Duffy says, go on, he's a bum. Well, you'll have to admit that he had me there. <laughs> By the way, you been out looking for another job? No, I've just been resting. My agent does my scurrying around. Oh, you've got uh, an agent? Why, of course. I pay him 20%. 20%? Ain't that a lot of dough to be paying him when you're out of work? Well, if I 
course, if I didn't give it to him, I'd have to give it to the government. Oh, yes. Yeah. Besides, I don't expect to be out of work long with my new act. A new act? Completely new. New joke, new song, new story. You want to hear it? New. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a minute, Heathcliff. You ain't a bad guy. I'll listen to it. But you've got to make me one promise. What? Well, if I listen to it, and I like it, see, and I offer your job back, you've got to promise not to accept. Very well, it's a deal. Okay, repeat, uh, play Sir Heathcliff's regular introduction, please. Uh, you may fire one gridly, Heathcliff. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to see you again. And, speaking of doctors... <laughs> uh, speaking of doctors, I said to my doctor the other day, Doctor, what shall I do? I have water on the knee. And the doctor replied, Wear pumps. Uh-huh. Speaking of hospitals, I happened to be in an operating room recently, and I heard one surgeon say to another surgeon, Pardon me, but may I cut in? I see. And by the way, have you heard about the nurse who was sent to work in a private room because she was too cute for ward? That one you should color. That one you should color and hide for Easter. <laughs> but carry on. During a recent illness of mine, I said to the doctor... Doctor, after I am cured, will I be able to play the piano? And the doctor said, why, certainly. I said, well, that's marvelous. I could never play it before. <laughs> How do you like that one, Archie? Uh, Heathcliff, is that one of your new jokes? Yes. Yeah. You ever hear of King Solomon? Well, of course. That joke was found tattooed on one of his wives. <laughs> Well, uh, Heathcliff, old man, sorry you have to rush off. Uh, leave us have lunch sometime, huh? Good. Well, how about tomorrow? Tomorrow sounds good. Call me next week and we'll confirm it. <laughs> hello? Oh, hello, Vera. Miss Duffy, your girlfriend, Vera Fogarty. Oh, uh, thanks for watching. Oh, hello, Vera, dear. I'm glad you called up. I've been busting to talk to you. <laughs> huh, my dress? Oh, well, I tried it on today at Madame Klein's. Well, the skirt is too short and it's too tight around the hips and the neck is cut a mile too low. Oh, simply disgraceful. When do you see me in a Sunday? <laughs> uh, Vera, we'll walk up the avenue together. You are gonna wear gloves? Well, why not? Vera, I told you a million times you should learn to whistle without your fingers. <laughs> okay, Vera. Yeah, goodbye. Oh, boy, am I glad I'm not a dame. What stupid-looking clothes you dames wear? Archie, I thank you to know that we girls aren't interested in you men's opinions of our clothes. Oh, you ain't interested in we men's opinions. No. Then what's the short skirt and the long neck for? Ventilation? <laughs> of course not. It's for comfort and health. With the short skirt, you can walk easier and faster. In case you want to catch up with a sailor. Oh, what's the use of listening to you? Your opinion about clothes wouldn't fill a ten-foot pole. Oh, yeah? Well, my lady friends do not subscribe with you. <laughs> Sir, many a dame has rushed home to change her dress because I have made some pointed criticism, such as, uh, where'd you get the awning, honey? <laughs> I don't know about clothes. Hey, Archie, what about that floor show you advertised? Oh, yeah, that's right. It's getting late. Now, stop bothering me, Miss Duffy. If I don't get the show started, your old man will be tearing me hair out.
Hey, Eddie, what are you doing? You've been sweeping that same spot for ten minutes now. Yeah, well, th this is where the entertainers is gonna work. See, I got to clean it up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, what kind of shape is the floor in? Well, I don't know. I ain't come to it yet. <laughs> well, you better keep digging. There must be something between us and the cellar. <laughs> Hi, Arch, is there any chance of me getting in on this floor show? Finnegan, what do you know about show business? Oh, Arch, you... <laughs> you forget that I worked two years in the theater. In the theater? Yes, yes, and I was a very important member of the company. An important... Then why did they let you go? Sure, the war came along and we couldn't get no more Hershey bars. <laughs> a Hershey hopster. Uh, look, guys, can't you use my talent somewhere in the show tonight? Well, let me see. I don't know what the... Could you do sound effects? Uh, sound effects? Oh, I'm great at that, Art. Hey, listen. Horses, hoofs. That's pretty good, Finnegan, but uh, how much of that pounding uh, can your head stand? <laughs> don't you worry. I can gallop on my head for hours. <laughs> So I got another great sound effect. This one is just panic. What is it? The ripping pants. Ripping pants, yeah. yeah. Now, close your eyes and listen. Hey, that was very clever. How did you... Uh-oh. Eddie, uh, bring Finnegan a needle and thread. <laughs> Hello? Well, look, Duffy, I can't start the show until Hossinger gets here with the stars. Well, you can't expect me to make a silk purse without a sow. Huh? Well, so the customers can wait another couple of minutes. Time don't mean nothing to these guys. They've done too much of it. <laughs> Why, sure. Well, hello, Art. Uh, Duffy, hasn't you just come in? The show will start any minute, I guarantee you. Okay, listen in, huh, Duffy? Okay. Hey, Dave, you did show up, Why, huh? certainly, Arch. I wouldn't let you down. Well, you know, I just thought that maybe... Arch, I have reformed. Besides, you have always been one of my favorite people. The first time I ever laid eyes on you, I took quite a fancy to you. Uh, just an old pigeon fancy. Uh, <laughs> quiet, Eddie. Uh, tell me more, Dave. Do you really like me? Yes, sir, I. That's why I came down here tonight. To extend the helping hand of friendship. Well, uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, by the way, where are they? Uh, who? The stars. Huh? Oh, oh, the stars. Yes, uh, um, uh... Now, just a second, Hossinger. I hope that is the hand of friendship you're extending and not a finger. <laughs> you sure this ain't some new kind of a swindle? Ah, tell me, how could I swindle you by bringing these stars down here? Tell me how. Look, Dave, I can't tell you how to run your business. All I can say is get them down here. I already promised up the Eddie Cantor, Dinah Shaw, Kate Smith, etc., etc., etc. Well, they better be here. Well, they'll be here. And besides them, do you know who else I got coming down? Who? Frank Sinatra, Burns and Allen, Rudy Valley, Nelson Eddy, Harry Hawkins, Jeanette McDonald. Boy, Nelson Eddy, Harry Hawkins, Jeanette McDonald. Who is Harry Hawkins? <laughs> A new sensation, huh? Oh, very clever. Uh, a new client of mine. Oh, well, we'll stick him in the show. Now, look, Dave, I, <clears throat> I want to ask you something. Now, maybe I'm stupid, but... Uh, Go ahead, I. Well, how could all of these big shots afford to come down here to work for free? Oh, very simple, I'll just cut down their income tax. I beg your pardon? Well, you see, when Bing Crosby works free, he loses $5,000, which he deducts from his accrued tax. Now, say his tax is 100000 that is, without the tax with help of source, each free job he works is a deduction from his surtax, which reduces his bracket for 5000 So that if he works more than 20 free jobs in a year, the government has to pay him a refund. Now, is that clear, Art? Huh? Are you kidding? Of course. <laughs> Hello? Well, not yet, Duffy, but they'll be here any minute now. Well, certainly, they'd be suckers not to. You see, if they work free, it surtaxes the withholding source a hundred grand from their accrued refund. <laughs> sure, and this uh, deduces them into a bracket. So uh, they gotta come down. You see, by working for nothing, they make a fortune. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Duffy. 
Well, Dave, I hope to get here soon. And, uh, by the way, to show you what a showman I am, I got the uh, order of the acts all wrote out. You have? Yeah. Aren't that very clever of you? You know, you're a man of many facets. Well, thanks, Dave, but I ain't always so clever. You know, like all facets, I run hot and cold. <laughs> Well, boy, you're sure hot tonight. Yes, thanks, Dave. Yes, sir. Well, if it isn't Mr. Hockinger. Huh? Now, look, lady, when I sold you that fur coat, I thought it was real silver fox, and you bought it at your own. Oh. Oh. Oh, it's you, Miss Duffy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Hockinger, I understand you're a theatrical agent now. That's right. Well, you know, I'm a soprano. Uh, do you think there's a market for a voice like mine? Well, let's hear Ah, 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 ah. Well, now, Miss Duffy, I don't know if there is a market for that. Well, uh, Dave, what about the farmer's market? Uh, <laughs> Mr. Morning. Well, maybe I'm not a Jeanette McDonald. Hey, that reminds me, Dave. Where are the stars? I can't understand it. I can't understand it either. Wait, uh, let me make a phone call. Uh, hello, is Mr. Crosby there? Oh, Bing! Bing, this is Hoppy. That's coming down? Oh, why not? Oh. Well, maybe we can make it another time. What's the matter? Yeah, there's nobody home, and he doesn't want to leave the Oscar alone. <laughs> but don't worry, Arc. It still leaves us... Uh, Let's see, uh, Bob Hope, Eddie Cantor, Dinah Shaw, Rudy Valley, Nelson Eddie, Harry Hawkins, and Jeanette McDonald. Hello? Hello, Duffy? What? But Duffy? Duffy? Hey, he says I gotta start the show right away or I'm fired. But they'll be here any minute. Okay, but I gotta put something on in the meantime, no matter who it is. Hey, <laughs> Ready to go on there, huh? Oh, from a dinner. All right, I'll announce you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we now give you a famous singer, a man that is down there as good as Rudy Valley. I might call me sweet buttercup, dear little buttercup, although I could never tell why. They call me sweet buttercup. Dear little buttercup, sweet little buttercup, I... <laughs> oh, they call me sweet buttercup, I ain't nothing but buttercup, although I don't know the reason why. 
Now they say I'm sweet buttercup, my name is buttercup, and sweet little buttercup, I... That's all. <laughs> Hello? What, Duffy? Yep, I agree with you. Yep, he's the same old Rudy. <laughs> yeah. Well, will you hear the next act, Duffy? Uh, <clears throat> and now, folks, uh, we present the little blackout sketch uh, that will be played by a well-known group of stars who are taking the place of Bob Hope, Eddie Cantor, George Burns, and Gracie Allen. Our scene is a luxurious uh, upstairs penthouse on Lower Park Avenue. Uh, music, please. Come in. Darling. Dearest. Come to my arms. Oh, oh, it's my boyfriend. Quick, hide in the closet. Okay. Come in. Darling. Dearest. Come to my arms. Oh, it's my boyfriend. Quick, hide in the closet. Okay. Come in. Uh, darling. <laughs> It's me. Dearest, at last, come to my arms. The what cheek bite? <laughs> Look, it's uh, I'll call Room Shivers. Hello, Room Shivers. Send up some ham bites. Yeah, I want onions on mine. Honey, you want onions on yours? Yes, dear. Well, hey, hey, there's somebody in that closet. Oh, oh no! Oh no! Let me open that door. Aha! Well, what do you two guys got to say? No onions on ours! <laughs> oh, wow, room service? Only two onions. Watch out! Hello? What, Duffy? Certainly that was Bob Hope. You thought it was Finnegan? Duffy, if that was Clifton Finnegan, I hope you choke. Hey, Dave. Duffy is beginning to get wise. You've got to do something. Archie, don't quit. You believed in me before, didn't you? Well, now, uh, Archie, you must have the courage of your convictions. Well, I'd have a little more courage if you hadn't had so many convictions. <laughs> well, okay, here goes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our next attraction is them two famous lovebird singers. And believe me, I wish there was Nelson, Eddie, and Jeanette McDonald. <laughs> This Hawkins will be great. I got him in the back room making up so he can go on right away. Now, look, Archie, Dave. Archie Duffy will love him so much he'll forget about everything else. Yeah? Well, then what are we waiting for? Leave us put the guy right on, though. Uh, just a second, Arch. Uh, Hawkins is my client, and he'll have to be paid his regular salary. Ten bucks a week. Okay, Dave, it's a deal. And a contract for ten weeks. Okay, Dave. And one week's salary in advance. Okay, Dave. Here. Ten bucks. Uh, now, now, let's see. Uh, before you close the register, did we forget something? 
Uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, my commission. Your commission? <clears throat> How uh, much is it, then? How much is in the register? Uh, 20 bucks. Well, you're an old friend of mine. I'll take it. Okay, Dave. Here. 20 bucks. Okay. Well, Hawkins, you're on. Nice show, Mr. Hawkins. Introduction music, if you please. <laughs> That dirty Hossinger, he done it again. Hossinger, you dirty cook. Duffy Snavin. Hello, Duffy. <laughs> Duffy, uh, hey, look, Duffy, I, I, I got a terrible confession. Yep. Well, I'm sorry, Duffy, but you see, we're, we're stuck with Heathcliff about his week for ten weeks at ten bucks a week. What? Oh, gee. Gee, it's nice of you to take it so calm, Duffy. You know, I thought it... Huh? I get fifteen bucks a week and you're gonna... But Duffy! Hello? How am I gonna keep up my social position on five bucks a week? <laughs> The Armed Forces Radio Another exciting tale of escape is up next. Have you shaken that spring cold yet? Wondering if you'll get a new Easter bonnet this year? Want to get away from it all? We offer you escape. <laughs> You were aboard a Chinese junk when aground off the coast of Borneo, and paddling toward you are the canoes of the deadly Dayak headhunters. Your powder is wet, and your throat is dry, because for you, there is no escape. <laughs> escape, produced and directed by William N. Robeson and designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escaped to the Orient of 150 years ago, to the Manila of 1790, in Richard Matthews Hallett's story of a wooden ship and an iron man. Misfortune's Isle. <laughs> which was lying at anchor so close up against the jetty I could have leaned over and spit on the wheels of the elegant Spanish carriages clattering along the promenade. Ah, and that's exactly what I felt like doing. I'd been away from Salem for three years now. Three years of sailing a trader brig through the China Seas and south into the Spice Islands. <laughs> All for what? The whole thing had grown stale suddenly. I was Plainly and simply bored. Young Poe stood beside me there at the path rail and tried to console me with philosophy. He'd anchored his sailing junk alongside earlier in the day, and 
come aboard to renew a friendship that started two years before a tin scene when I hauled him out from under an executioner's act. He was under it because he just sold me six fine fat pigs without remembering they happened to be the sacred property of the Tim Sing Temple. <laughs> oh, Yang Po was a real philosopher, all right. Uh, anyway, my friend, I reserve my sympathy for the poor. You have gained much wealth and trade. Aye, and a few measly gold pieces. But the trouble is out here, a man can't go it on his own. He needs backing. What more backing could a rush man desire than... Those eight brass cannon at the rail. Ah, they're fair guns, all right. But it's a flag I'm speaking of. Do these unworthy eyes not see a pin up there at the masthead? The bunning of Salem swings no weight out here. In the south, it's the Dutch who call the turn. On the coast, the British, and here in Manila, it's the Spanish. There, man has... Young Po. There she comes now, in the second carriage there. That's the fourth time since high noon she's come back. Four fine horses and two footmen. She rides in style. Watch. Watch. She'll look up at the ship. She has every time today. <sighs> there you see. Ah, that one. The little catered bird. You know her? I know of her. She is wife of Don Narciso Crispo, the Spanish nobleman who is captain general of the island south of Zamboanga. He is in residence here in Manila. Oh, she looks very sad. Uh... Why is she called a little caged bird? One glimpse of Don Narciso would answer your question better than thousand words. Ah, she's very beautiful, too. I swear she looked back and smiled just then. Captain Arad, once in pity, I set free a parakeet which I had found caught in a net. I still bear a scar from its beak. Some things may be worth taking chances for. <laughs> ah, me, I find it so much simpler, too. Go to sleep and dream of maidens on the moon. Oh, but the moon's too far away. Hey, that! Where are you? Huh? Oh, up here, Michael, on the quarterdeck. Oh, then the honorable red-headed one is still your first mate? Aye, that he is. What's the matter, Michael? Oh, matter indeed. Haven't you heard all the excitement in town? I've been looking... Well, uh, young fool, haven't they hung you yet? <laughs> this on what they want is touched by your concern, Mr. O'Keefe. <laughs> what do you mean by excitement? I've been on board all day. I know. Last night, with all the soldiers on guard and the stone ramparts and all, a band of pirates slipped ashore down coast and got through into the city. Pirates? Aye, came south on bushels of his fortune. They may possibly think it was me. Oh, they <laughs> had no clue as to who it was. Got away scot-free, they did. And they almost abducted the captain general of Zambuango and Seth. What? Aye, aye. An important grandee by the name of Don uh, Cisco something or other. His guard finally heard him. Ah, oh, pity. Fortune not with you, Captain Arad. Ah, but here's the part that'll stop you. There is no one in Manila that knows who they were, except yours truly, Michael O'Kane. Go on. Eh? <laughs> Here, have a look at that. Oh, well, it's a Manchester Cutler. Aye, and there's the mark on the handle. Aye, it's one we traded to Ceres. Aye, aye, the bandit king of North Borneo. And it was me found this morning on the beach where the pirate boat came ashore. You found it? No, 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 not quite. Uh, a melee by the name of Jambu brought it to me. Oh, Jambu. Ten thousand sampans filled with spoiled fish. You know the fellow? I have used him as interpreter. He speaks Dayak. But in some former incarnation, he undoubtedly was ill. Oh. You know, I think this may be exactly what I need. Need? For what, I read? To make fortune for the three of us. Uh, I certainly remember an unexpected appointment. Ah, uh, uh, young Po. It's a plan that won't work without you. I'm not talking a bare profit. This means a fortune. I, I am amazed. There is much talk of money, and yet very little talk of Spanish ladies. <laughs> I've heard rumors on shore about these Spanish classes. For one thing, they wear no stockings. Huh? And how's the man to know it, Michael? You can't count too much on his thing. Well, no, it was a Spaniard that told me. All right, now listen, lad. Let me tell you the plan. And if we're all agreed, I'll go ashore and talk to this Don Narciso. Uh, after I have heard it, I think I shall go and sacrifice White Rooster to Queen of Heaven, though I doubt it will do a great deal of good. The only thing I can't understand is why this damn boo didn't take the cutlass to Don Narciso in the first place. It is quite possible he did take it there in first place, Captain Harrod. 
it is quite worth consideration. It took a bit of talking right enough, but finally the others agreed to the plan. And no more than two hours later, I was talking to a captain general of Zamboango himself. He turned out to be a little monkey of a man, yellow as a faded sunflower and much older than I expected to find. I'm quite well satisfied regarding your identification of those who perpetrated the outrage, Captain Arnott. But, uh, objections and fatalities. I have also heard the stories of this pirate, Salif. No, I think a broadside of my 32 pounders can furnish him enough fatalities, Excellency. Oh, it's not that simple. They say his headquarters on the Borneo coast is nothing less than a fortress. Ah, it's only a bamboo stockade lying at the mouth of the river. And it's in range of the guns on my break. My friend Yang Po has been there. But hard against the mouth of the river is the blue chalaka. Hmm. Misfortune's eye on and on it, limestone caves filled with birds' nests worth $50 a pound in Canton. That may well be, Captain Arat. But there is also the Yupa tree. You must have heard of it. Aye. <laughs> but I count a little on hearsay, Excellency. It is not hearsay. The Dyak headhunters poisoned the spirits and owls with its juices. I have seen men scratched by them die like that. Some things are worth taking chances for. I must say that I quite agree with you, Dusty. Delfina, eh? Uh, Captain Arad, uh, may I present my wife, Doña Delfina de Crispo? Uh, Captain Arad, I'm on it. Maripito, I've heard it all. You must agree to this expedition. Huh? You know the king's offer? Any man who reached these islands of pirates to be made a conde with lands and titles. To have both lands and titles, my dear. Uh, what is it you expect from this, Captain Allard? A fortune, Excellency. Huh? The birds' nests themselves should be worth a half million Yankee dollars. And there's gold and antimony in the river. And trade with the Dyaks. Uh, precisely what is the plan of yours? Well, 50 of Seraph's men are Chinese who once served Yang Po. They'll come in with us if he can get word to them. That'll make things easier. And how do you expect to get work to them? Well, Yang Po and I'll sail in ahead of his junk and try to contact them. My mate will bring up the water witch 24 hours later and then we'll attack. And exactly why have you come to me? Oh, were I to do it without official support, I'd, I'd be just a pirate myself, wouldn't I? <laughs> I don't know. It would be a great thing uh, if it could be done. Not if so. Eh? Why not think of it tonight, then? Decide in the morning. That may be a wise suggestion. May allow me to show you out, Captain Arad. By your leave, Excellency. I'll yeah, see you tomorrow then. Good day, Captain. This way, please. He will agree. You may depend on it. Good. I hope also that His Excellency will accompany us personally. He will. You can be certain of it. You uh, seem quite sure of that. Who do you think it was who had the cutlass sent to you? You? Here is the door, Capitan. I would say, are you sit or not? In our language, it means goodbye for a little while. For a little while, huh? Well, in that case, adiosito. <laughs> Delfino was right. The next morning, he agreed to it. And two days later, we sailed out of Manila Harbor. Don Narciso accompanied me on Yang Po's junk, and Michael O'Kane followed at the helm of the water wind. Our luck deserted us as we rounded the corregidor and sailed square into the tail end of a typhoon. There was little wind, but a heavy sea was running, and it took us on the port bow for all that night and the next day. We lost sight of the waterway, and the leaky old junk pitched and rolled like a dory. Young Po stayed mostly below in his bunk and dreamed peacefully of the maidens on the moon, while I stayed on deck and skipped her through it. It was late the second night before I had a chance to go down to my cabin. Well, it's not your Captain. Delfina, what in the name of the devil are you doing aboard? Being forced about mostly. It 
He's a very unsteady ship you have, Capitan. Well, there should be a lot more unsteady when a hundred Dayak headhunters start trying to board her. How did you arrive here? In a sack of feathers. It's really all that saved me during the storm, you know. Oh, confound it. Don't you realize your husband is on board? Sleeping in the deck cabin. Suppose he should come down here for something. He did once. I hid in the wardrobe. Oh, all the fool tricks. But he did say all your people. For a little while. Yes, but it wasn't an invitation. Who could tell? Anyway, I shall prove quite valuable to you. I doubt it. You will see. But Peter will become frightened at the last moment. He always does. Now, what will you do? Whatever is required at the time. I am not afraid of fighting my captain. I have seen it before. Found it. We had a fortune in our reach, and now you come along and ruin it. You underestimate me. Well, I won't do that again. You are very rude. I meant to be. Uh, why did you marry him? I had no choice. My father was ambitious. Her sister was influential. And did your father realize his ambition? He, he became a colonel and was killed at San Diego to kill him. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. And now if you'll remove yourself from my bunk, I need some sleep. If you are going to move in here, then what am I going to do? Oh, you'll think of something. You made all your own plans so far. Oh, thank you. But if my husband sees me, then he may think you brought me on board. Well, in that case, I shall be forced to kill him in a duel. Good night. You... You are going to sleep? I hope to. Try the shrine of the Queen of Heaven. It's the last cabin in the stern. No one goes there but Yang Po, and he'll have to be told about you anyway. Good night. <laughs> Even when you are rude to me, your mouth is so very sweet. Well, I see what Woman or no woman aboard, it was too late to turn back now. And so two days later, we dropped anchor at the mouth of Serif River. Off the port rail, a quarter mile away, lay the pirate stockade. It was backed up by the dark green mass of jungle. And on the opposite side of the junk, across a hundred yards or so of water, was the beach of Miss Fortune's Isle, sloping back to break sharply on the foot of the limestone cliff. On the upper shoulders of those cliffs were the caves with a fortune in edible bird's nest. And between the cliffs and the water stood the upas tree. A hundred legends were told about the upas tree, how its shadow could kill a man, how the spirit of a white goddess was prisoned in the thick, dark foliage of its top and how birds that lighted on its branches fell dead to the ground. Well, one thing at least was true enough. The Dyaks made a horrible poison from the juice of its bark, and they worshipped the tree. <laughs> Young Po took the renegade interpreter, John Boo, with him and went ashore to pay his respects to Ceres and at the same time was to pass the word to his Chinese friends. It was late afternoon when he came back, and I'd become nearly as uneasy as Don Narciso. Yang Po came aboard alone and motioned me to follow him below, saying nothing until we were alone in my cabin. It is my humble opinion, Captain Allard, that heaven favors us with the decided lack of fortune. Why, what happened? But, sir, if most polite, I most polite, we enjoy most friendly conversation while we both held our knives beneath our robes. All very polite. Well, did you get word to your men? Uh, Sarif blessed with presence of 200 Dayaks and 50 Malays. My own brethren are unfortunately down the coast for two days. Oh, that's a bad piece of luck. Ah, but I have news of much worse one. Jambu, that son of 10,000 devils, has deserted us. Deserted us? He what? has joined Sarif. Oh, he'll tell them exactly what we're planning. Do not believe Jambu would do such a thing. Delfina, I told you to stay out of this cabin. Jambu worships me. He's my slave wife. It was he who helped me sleep on board. Oh, so that's why he's done it. He has not deserted. What could he hope to gain by it? 
You probably. This on what they want offer suggestion that we stand out to sea until what are which come tomorrow. A fine idea, except for one thing. Your sleepy little sons of heaven left the cable slack. We're grounded on a mud bar with no chance of moving before the tide tomorrow morning. Well, we'll have to stand and fight. Ah, yes, they are so callous. I forgot to tell you, they even neglected to cover powder during storm. The water ruined it. Well, then we'll not even have the four cannons. Really a matter of slight importance. they only ornaments. They would blow up if we fired them. <laughs> you could hardly have picked a more suitable time to tell me. Well, we'll fight without them. The impetuosity of youth. I think I sleep for a while and dream of maidens on the moon. Young Po, you'll stay on your feet and start your men boiling kettles of oil and piling rocks by the rail. It would be so much pleasanter to die in one seat. Well, if I know Sirius, you'll not attack until nearly midnight. Delfina, can you swim? I can do anything. Primarily, I want to know if you can swim. I can. Good. Young Po, I'll be back and help you in an hour, but I have a job to do first. Come along, Condesa. It was dark when we slipped into the water and struck out for the island. If I had tried to lower a boat, they might have seen us from the shore. I could see no other way to keep her out of it. The rest of us had no chance. I knew how the Dyaks fought. We could expect no help. And on board, she would have been the only one of us left alive. Aye. Jambu would see to that. We made the beach safely, crossed it, and worked our way up the steep path on the face of the cliff. Finally, we reached the ledge in front of the cave. Oh, it is so dark here. It frightens me. Well, there's nothing to harm you. Bats in the caves, perhaps, but nothing else. I am to stay here alone, then? Aye, until the water which comes into anchor tomorrow. Light this torch, then, and signal them. They'll come ashore and take you off. Tomorrow? Where will you be tomorrow, Alec? You are going back there to die with them, aren't you? We'll have a fighting chance. You have no chance at all. You know it. Don't go. Stay with me, Alec. You know that's impossible. No. But this man, young boy, is no better than a pirate himself, and you cannot help him by losing your own life or stay with me. And... And what of your husband? Do not go back. I beg you. Please, Harriet. Delfina, you have a deadlier poison than the upas tree itself. Will you force me then to stay here in safety and watch you die on the deck there below? Well, well it makes so very much difference to you. So much that I would not care to be alive tomorrow. In Manila, I hated my life. I prayed for earthquakes, pirates, death, anything. But now I pray only that you may live through this night. Delfina. Delfina. There's nothing can be said. Leave then if you must. Aboard the junk, I found young Poe rushing preparations for the hopeless fight that stood ahead of us. Don Narciso was shivering on the quarter deck, and I saw no reason to tell him his wife had made the trip with us. The Chinese crew had piled stones and smoke pots at the rail, ready to throw down on the heads of the Dyaks who had tried to board us, and kettles of oil were being heated over a brick hearth by the mast. Paper lanterns had been lighted and hung about the rigging. But outside the narrow limits of the deck, we could see nothing. 
Nothing but the black wall of the Borneo night. The same dark wall shut off any side of the upas tree and of the cliff face where Delphina lay hidden. But I knew from the ledge she could see us moving about on the lighted deck. I loaded my pistols with the only dry powder aboard and we waited. There was no light on shore and no sound. And three hours went past. Um. My venerable Captain General, I have offered incense and rice to Queen of Heaven. If our enemies prevail after that, then we have mistreated them in some former life. I go below to sleep. Sleep? And who is to give orders to your men? Uh, they give them to one another, Excellency. They are all commanders in their own right. We may perhaps meet later in third or fourth heaven. Quick powder, trigger a boat. And the ground of the sheep. I might warn you before the attack starts, Your Excellency. Stay away from the rail. At least until after the smoke parts are thrown. Oh? The Dyaks use bamboo poles with iron hooks on the end. and well, They can reach up and drag a man over the rail easier than picking coconuts. Captain Arad. Hmm? Perhaps we could uh, surrender. Uh, make peace somehow. Well, take uh, no surrender. They want our heads. Look! They're on it. Young boys! Here they come! What's the rail, Your Excellency? Use your cutlass if a head comes over the side and look out for the hook. On sight! There is Dyak warriors that run their boats in against the sides of the junk, and now we're pushing their murderous hooks over the rail. The Chinese crew is fighting like madmen, tossing over smoke pots, smashing those heavy rocks down on the heads of the pirate mob, pouring out smoking kettles of boiling oil. And the whole curtain of night was torn by the screams of anger. Captain Ellard, we find ourselves suddenly without smoke pots or soothing oil, and rocks are nearly gone. All right, they'll be swarming aboard us in another two minutes. Where's the Captain General? Uh, he has retired to cabin. It would be uncharitable to say he hides there. Well, a lot of good it'll do him. What happened? Hey. Young Paul. They're on the island. Look. It would appear top of sacred Yupas tree has burst into flame. The great flaming torch of the tree spread into full bloom and leaped up to the heavens, lighting the whole sea around us. And everywhere about us, screaming in hoarse terror, the Dyad drew off in their boats and stared at the blazing death of their sacred tree. And then in full view on the glaring face of the cliff, the beautiful and weird figure of a woman, hair streaming behind it, swung slowly out from behind the flame, and up and up and then disappeared over the ledge in front of the cave. And at the sight of their white goddess escaping from her prison in the tree, the Dyaks broke in panic and turned their boats and raced for the shore. And while I thought of the signal torch I'd left with Delphina, suddenly the battle was over. Ten thousand bushels of our unexpected good fortune. The little pair have saved our worthless lives. All right, then you recognize me. Uh, these vulnerable eyes have never looked upon sight more fair. I shall address her hereafter as Princess of Heaven. Uh, and I think perhaps another recognized her also. Caramba, did you not see it? That was Delphina. It was my wife. I know. She was aboard with us. Aboard with us? By your permission, senor? No, she stowed away and asked that the knowledge of her presence be kept from you. I have no doubt she found you quite agreeable to such a plan. Take care, Excellency. Take care? I will see your hand, senor. And that's for her. I shall rip her through the streets of Manila. We will discuss that later. I do not discuss my decision. In fact, it may be better that I bring her boat at once and perhaps beat her or dead on this very deck. you pardon me. It is my humble opinion that elderly men should learn to control their wait, emotions. Wait, wait. There's a Dayak warrior hiding there by the rail. Uh, the boats have gone and left him. Excellency! Excellency, away from that rail! Let's take no from you, senor! Get back! Look out! Silence! Stop it! Wait, Captain! Oh. Oh. Very commendable shooting, Captain Arad. Aye, but little use to the Captain General, I'm afraid. See what you can do from young Po. I'm going ashore to look after her. See what I can do for him. 
Now, how can I be expected to replace man's head on his body, especially when head seems to have rolled overboard? It's not the least bit of use in giving me a poet's blind, you old reprobate. It was nothing but pure luck that kept me from sailing in here this morning and finding nothing but your heads all a-smoking in a row. Life moves only according to dreams of Queen of Heaven, Mr. O'Kane. Not to mention, of course, those of uh, a princess. Oh, that funny class, eh? <laughs> and quite a one she's turned out to be. I plan to devote the remainder of my unworthy life to rescue of small birds from nests. Now, that's a silly way for a grown man to spend his time. Oh, oh. Come in, Arad. I've been wondering where to find you. I was short in the course. Uh, well, we can sail in the morning. Both ships are nearly loaded. Good. We'll head for Camp Top. Uh, young Poe, this friend of yours there, this Hong Kwa, do you, do you think he might have some good quality of silk to trade? It is possible. Ah, silk, is it now? And what will you be wanting silk for, Arad? Well, uh... Well, it's not silk. I, 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 I mean, come not exactly. man, come man. It's what, what? Uh, it's not silk, eh, Rad? Then what is it, huh? Oh, all right, Michael. If you have to know everything, I want to trade with him for for a dozen pair of silk stockings. <laughs> is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. And tonight brought you Misfortune's Isle by Richard Matthews Hallett. Adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield. With Paul 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 Crutchfield. Now let's see what Fibber McGee and Molly are up to. The Johnson Wax Program. <laughs> Makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, Incident 260, written by Don Quinn, music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. The show opens with The Sun Will Be Up in the Morning. How many of you can remember when Saturday used to be floor scrubbing day in your mother's kitchen? Perhaps you can still remember her calling out, don't go in the kitchen, I've just scrubbed the floor. And then there were those newspapers spread all around to protect the linoleum while it was drying. Of course, we know now that wasn't really protection. And that continually scrubbing the linoleum was actually ruining it. First, the colors would fade, then the linoleum would develop cracks and bumps until finally it had to be replaced. Think of how glad your mother or grandmother would have been to have Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. The no-rubbing floor polish that saves so much work, makes linoleum so beautiful, and makes it last so long. Glow coat is a time and labor saver, and a money saver, too. With glow coat protecting your linoleum floors, your kitchen is easier to keep clean, and the colors are fresh and bright. If you aren't already using Johnson's self-polishing glow coat, try some tomorrow. <laughs> The gang's all here, all ready to pile into Fibber's car for a merry trek to see the Notre Dame West Point football game. And in the McGee jalopy, it's a good trek if they do it. Here's Mrs. Uppington, Horatio K. Boomer, Mr. Gildersleeve, the old timer, Billy Mills, Nick DePopolis, yours truly, and Fibber McGee and Molly. Everybody, I guess we're all set. Is everybody here, Molly? Well, I think so, McGee. 
Will you please sit in the back seat, Mrs. Uppington? Oh, of course, my dear. <laughs> and I suppose, as there are so many of us, I shall sit on someone's lap. <laughs> ah, yeah. I guess you better at that, Uppy. Sit on Gildersleeve's lap. Oh, no, don't. He ain't got any lap. Now, look here, McGee. <laughs> uh, she can sit on Billy Mills' lap. Can't she, Mr. Mills? Why, sure she can. And I'm glad it isn't going to rain today. <laughs> How do you know it ain't going to rain, Mr. Mills? I just had my pants pressed. Oh. <laughs> well, I knew it would either rain or something, and this is something. <laughs> Come on, Snooky. <laughs> well, now let me see. Where's Harlow Wilcox? Here I am, Molly. But don't you think before we start, I'd better touch up the car a little Put with Put that it. can of car new away and get in, Wilcox. <laughs> Johnson's car new. As long as we're mentioning it, we might as well go all the way. Move over, Billy. Oh. Mr. DePopolis, now you sit next to Mr. Wilcox. Huh? Sure, Cookie. Have you got the room in the back seat for this big chunk of ice? Ice? What'd you bring ice for, Nick? Oh, soft drink? No, Fizzer. But if it gets hot driving, the radiator is liable to boil over. And if it's that hot, the ice will melt and it'll be water for the radiator. You got me? <laughs> Well, why bring ice? Why didn't you just bring some water? I thought of that, Cupid, but I couldn't carry it with these ice tongs. <laughs> well, climb in, Nick. Uh, we'll have to double up, Depopolis. Do I sit on your lap or do you sit on mine? Let's flip a coin for it, Golden Sleeve. Uh, have you got a half a dollar? Why, yes. Yes, I have. Good. Give it to me and you can sit on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, where's the old-timer, McGee? I don't know. He was here a minute ago. Hey, hey, old-timer. Here I am, Johnny. Where? Back here in the luggage compartment pool. Well, heavenly days. Is there room for you in there? Nope. But I didn't realize that till I got in, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's too uncomfortable, old-timer, let a little air out of that spare tire and use it for a cushion. <laughs> I've been trying to, Johnny. This jackknife of mine seems to be too dark. <laughs> Yeah, that's better. <laughs> well, I guess we're all set, dearie. Have you got the road map? Road maps? Yes, 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 the road map. Road map. You know those big pieces of paper that show you the best roads to take, which always happen to be the roads with the most filling stations of the company that puts out the map? <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, the road map. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned them. I left them in the house. I'll be back in just a few minutes, folks. <laughs> See, I think I left them in the hall closet here. Hey, Molly. Yes? Remind me to straighten up that hall closet when we get home. <laughs> All right, dearie. And Mr. Boomer wants to know where he's going to sit. Now, get in the back with the rest, will you, Boomer? Why should I be the exception, Winsaw? Uh, oh, yeah. come, come, come. Let us be going, Miss McGee. Oh, I'm so impatient to get started that I... Oh, William. <laughs> was that you kissing me on the back of the neck, you dear boy? <laughs> no, baby. That was my Notre Dame pennant. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if everybody's all set... Oh, well, wait a minute, McGee. We're awfully crowded back here. Can't one of us sit up in front? You stay where you darn are, Gildersleeve. <laughs> Don't forget, me and Molly have got the lunch basket and the road maps up here. Besides, this car was built before they made front seats for three people. This car was built before there were three people. <laughs> Quit crabbing, Kilter Sleeve. <laughs> okay, Molly, hop in. Okay. Well, here we go. Hang on to your hats, everybody. Oh, okay, boy, it's going to be fun. <laughs> mm. Oil must be a little stiff. <laughs> well, that's much the best way to go to a football game, I'm thinking. <laughs> Dad rat the dad rat a thing. I'm just... Hey, Molly, did you clean them spark plugs yesterday like I told you? Yes, dearie. And they scratched up my washing machine. Something terrible, too. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. <laughs> oh, well, am I too heavy on your lap, William, dear? No, baby. Did you ever play any football? Oh, you silly boy, of course not. Why did you ask? I was going to ask you to shift your backfield a little. <laughs> better. 
choking a little, will you, Molly? With pleasure, and it's much too good for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ain't this a panic, folks? <laughs> it won't start. <laughs> Why, it's excruciating, McGee. That noise reminds me of my Uncle Dennis. He used to grind his teeth just like that in his sleep. I know. He never got started either. (laughs) Oh, well, I'll be him. Hi, everybody. What you doing, mister? Who wants you? I'm trying to get this dad ratted car started, if you must know. We're going to a football game. Well, gee, don't get upset about it, mister. Remember what Mr. Schaffner said to Mr. Mark? Well, what did Mr. Schaffner say to Mr. Mark? <laughs> he said, let's not take this to heart. Oh. <laughs> now, look, sister, and I got trouble enough without you coming hey, along. You sure got a lot of people in your car, mister. How can it hold so many pedestrians? <laughs> <laughs> you mean passengers. Pedestrians are people who walk. Yeah, you're telling me. <laughs> Now, you keep quiet, sis. My impatience is just about exhausted. Hey, any of you fellas like to get out and give me a little push? <laughs> they look like they'd all like to give you a push, mister. Right off a tall building. <laughs> Ungrateful mugs. Here I use my car to take them away off to the football game. And what do I get? Hey, mister. Sis, if you don't quit bothering me... Good looking, mister. Doggone it, sis. How can I get this car started if I have to sit here and listen to your childish gabble? Much easier, I bet. Well, I... Huh? If you listen to me, you can start up much easier. What do you mean, sis? Well, gee, looky now. Huh? Excuse me for leaning in front of you like this. Now try it, my Oh, kid. shucks. If you can't... <laughs> hey! Hey, it's going. Hey, what'd you do? I just turned on the ignition. Oh. <laughs> Well, much obliged, sis. Oh, that's okay, mister. We all make mistakes. But gee whiz, I never saw so many people making the same mistake at once. (laughs) So long, mister. I am sprinkling tarts on the road as we go along. Oh, how utterly thoughtful of you, Mr. Boomer, to bring tarts with you. I didn't bring them, Fat Forty and Unfair Union Beauty Parlor. 
I'm picking them out of the upholstery. Hey. But I'm afraid it's no use. Why, Mr. Boomer? The gentleman you're expecting is here now. Oh, All right. Pull over to the side. Shall I chip him off a few pieces of the old Blarney Stone, McGee? No. I'll handle it. Now, look, officer, we may have been going a little too fast, but we're on our way to the Notre Dame Army football game. And I think it's everybody's duty to support the Army these days, don't you? Because with the situation the way... Oh, it... keep quiet. Huh? You were only going 22 miles an hour. What? Go on, we haven't been out an hour yet. <laughs> I'm not arresting you for speeding. Huh? It, uh, you ain't? No, no, I... Uh, well, I just, uh... Well, there was a girl in the back seat of this car who was waving her handkerchief at me, and I... Well, this is a pretty lonesome job, and I... <laughs> oh, oh, officer, you, you look so noble and handsome sitting there on your motorcycle, and I, I simply couldn't resist the temptation. It was I who waved. <laughs> oh, was it? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to have stopped you, folks. <laughs> You know how it is. These dark goggles of mine, they, <laughs> they make everything kind of funny. <laughs> now take the goggles off, bud, and see how funny the old man is. Well, now the tax has been cleared up, my young haunter of the highways. Let us be on our way. Let us not dally, Jilly. Hey, uh, just a minute, you. What's your name? Why, officer, that's Mr. Horatio. Fix me, I can cray Ollie May. <clears throat> Uh, you were inquiring about me, my friend? Why, I'm, uh, I'm the Honorable Sidney Green, the well-known wholesale grocer. You must have heard of Sidney Green's kidney beans. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Green, but you look like a man we want. You got any identification with you? Oh, certainly, certainly. Never traveled without them. Let me see now. Why well, I put those identification papers? Had them right here a moment ago. Well, hurry up, Mr. Green, please. I won't get your puttees in a panic, Saddlebarn. <laughs> Have my papers right here. Let me see now. Here's a small collapsible bucket I got in a small bucket shop that collapsed. <laughs> Memo from Freddy the Firebug. Ambitious fellow, planning on giving a big shoe factory the hot food. <laughs> What's this? Ah, yes. A small ditty bag for people who can't carry a tune any other way. <laughs> Here's a pivot tool. Very handy if you want to turn the other cheek. <laughs> An army blanket with no draft ventilation. <laughs> a check for a short draft beer. Well, well, imagine that. Here are my identification papers. Oh, hey, well, everything seems to be in order, Mr. Green. Sorry to have bothered you. Didn't bother me a bit, my young handlebar Hawkshaw. Not a bit. <laughs> Drop in my grocery store sometime, and I'll see that you get a nice, ripe tomato. <laughs> Gee, thanks, Mr. Green. <laughs> well, so long, everybody. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, hey, that was a pretty smart piece of work. How'd you do it? Elementary, fiddle face, elementary. Huh? This happens to be Mr. Sidney Green's coat I'm wearing. Oh. <laughs> Picked it up by mistaken restaurant last night. <laughs> well, maybe you weren't scared, Boomer, but I never seen a guy turn green so fast. <laughs> uh, don't you get it, Molly? I said... Ah, uh, it ain't funny, McGee. Okay. Okay, well, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> well, uh, Mr. McGee, why wouldn't this be a good place to eat our lunch? Yes, yeah, oh, right. 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 How about it, Molly? Personally, I I'm just about furnished, really. You mean famished? I thought famished meant well-known. No, that's famous or notorious. No, a notorious is a man who stamps things on a paper for two bits. <laughs> I... <laughs> sure, my oldest boy, Demetrius, is a notorious. <laughs> uh, that's notary, Mr. DePopolis. I thought notary is meaning to go around and around. That's rotary, like a rotary club. They go around to different places for lunch. Dad, better, that's just what I've been trying to say, ain't it? This is the place for lunch. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Well, now that we've got that settled, I hope, let's see. Mr. Gildersleeve, will you take the picnic basket over by that big tree? Oh, yeah. And Mr. Wilcox? Mr. Wilcox? Oh, uh, speaking to me, Molly? Yes, what are you doing? Studying bird life? No, I was just looking up at that beautiful maple tree. Isn't it a lovely thing? I don't know what you're getting so wide-eyed about, Harlow. Only a wheat cake could get sappy about a maple. <laughs> Ah, but think what this tree has to look forward to. I'm sorry, folks, but we got to pay for this wonderful entertainment some way, you know. <laughs> well, Wilcox, what has this tree got to look forward to? 
What a question, Fibber. What a question. Why, think of that noble tree doing its darndest to grow up and get cut down so it can be made into floors and furniture to be Johnson waxed and live happily ever after. Oh. <laughs> Knowing in its every little knot and grain that it's protected against dirt and wear and hard usage. That it will be so easy to clean that every pore will be sealed against dust and dampness. Why, with Johnson's wax? Oh, woodman spare that tremendous builder. Oh. Wow. <laughs> yes, that's one of the most lumbering commercials I ever heard, Mr. Wilcox. <laughs> now, come on and eat lunch, yeah. both of you. Get the thermos bottle and... Say, where's the old timer? Huh? What? Hey, he's still in that luggage compartment. Oh, I hope he hasn't smothered. <clears throat> Open it up quick, dear. <laughs> well, heavenly day. Hey, hey... Hey, old timer. <laughs> Wake up, old timer. <laughs> it's time for lunch. Uh, hey, oh, what's he? Oh, that ain't the way I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> the way I heard it, one feller says to the feller, Hey, what's that a smell, daughter? Hot coffee? <laughs> yes, it is. So hurry up. We're going to eat lunch. Okay, daughter. I'll hurry. One feller says to tell a feller, see, he says, see when there's epidemic of children's quiz programs. Hip says, tell a feller, it's getting so your time a kid has to stand in the corner when he can't get a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> Singing McNamara's band. Oh, we work for McNamara, he's the leader of the band. Although we're few in numbers, we're the finest in the land. We play at wakes and weddings and at every fancy ball. But for our own amazement, we can play the best of all. Oh, the drums go banging, the cymbals clang, and the trumpets they blaze away. McCarthy pumps the old bassoon while all the pipers play. Tennessee, Tennessee, toodles the flute, and the music is simply grand. Proud we are to be a part of McNamara's band. Patterdy, Finnegan, Flanagan play the saxophone. They play so very pretty that the girls won't leave them alone. Oh, Donald O'Connell, O'Hannigan, Carrigan on the trumpets play. We had to build a fence around to keep the girls away. Oh, the saxophones and the slide trombones can hypnotize the crowd. The papers say the way we play is certainly good and loud. Donovan, Sullivan, Tweedles, the fife, and the music is simply grand. Everybody's awful proud of McNamara's band. Johnson, Johnson, Marcus, and Johnson come from old Norway to play with McNamara's band. We traveled all the way. Would then be marched the street along, we get the jolly hand. We're Johnson, Johnson, Marcus, and Johnson with an Irish band. Oh, we got a bunch of shamrock, and our uniform is green. We're the funniest looking speeds that ever you have seen. There's O'Brien's and Ryan's and Sheehan's and me, and they come from Ireland. By him and he build the only speeds in McNamara's band. <laughs> Oh, the drums go banging, the cymbals clang, and the trumpets they blaze away. Everybody dances when the band begins to play. Tennessee, Tennessee, toodles the flute, and the music is simply grand. Proud we are to be a part of McNamara's You know, you know, Molly, I'm worried. I'm worried about the way this car's running. Why, it's running beautifully, dearie. That's, that's what worries me. It never run beautiful before. <laughs> now, how are you folks doing in the back seat back there? Uh, uh, personally, I've never been so uncomfortable in my life. Well, I should think you would be, with your leg twisted up back of your neck like that. <laughs> that isn't his leg. That's mine. I had to put it someplace. <laughs> well, Billy Mills looks happy and contented anyway. Look at him, sleeping like a boy. He is not sleeping, Mr. McGee. Huh? He's unconscious. <laughs> what? He is? Yes. When we went around that sharp curve about 20 miles back, Mr. DePopolis knocked him out with his elbow. Yes, the lucky dog. Come on, DePopolis, don't be selfish. Knock me out, too. <laughs> Nothing doing, Garden Sleeve. Look what it did to my elbow. Uh, please, Mr. DePopolis, that's my elbow. Oh, I me very much. <laughs> You see, McGee? Huh? We're so crowded back here, we have to look ourselves up and who's who before we dare cross our legs. <laughs> Don't be silly, Mr. 
Mr. Gildersleeve. I think you all look nice and cozy back yeah. there. Uh, all snuggled up together. I almost envy you. Almost. Yes, I'll bet you do. Gildersleeve, if I wasn't such a gracious host, I'd tell you to zipper your lip. The trouble with you is you ate too much lunch. You not only ate too much, you ate too fast. No, look here, McGee. <laughs> I won't have you criticizing my etiquette, you little ignoramus. Who's an ignoramus? Not me. I'm a Greek Orthodox. <laughs> Quiet, Potless. McGee, one of these days you and I are going to tangle. You know that, don't you? Gildersleeve, that's a thought that will sustain me through the long winter nights. <laughs> that's probably where you'll be during the long winter nights, too. Huh? Back on sustaining. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, don't worry your curly little head about that. You know what I mean to our sponsors? Yes, I do. What? You're a hired man, McGee. <laughs> Come, come now, boys. This is no way to act when we're on our way to a nice football game. Yeah, step on it, Fibber. I don't want to miss the kickoff. Well, me either. I want to get there in time to see Pat O'Brien put on his makeup. (laughs) Always like to give the coach a little advice. Advice? What do you know about football? (laughs) Who, me? You seem to forget, Golden Sleeve, that in 1912, I was the All-American end to end all all All-American ends. Uh... (laughs) Why, when I was on the offensive... Oh, were you offensive? Huh? Oh. (laughs) Well, furthermore, in two wit, when it came to blocking, I was always right ahead of the ball carrier. Blockhead McGee, I was known as in that Oh, my. Blockhead McGee, the boldest and bravest back that ever bounded from the bench to bring back the bacon by booting the ball over the brim of the bowl. The best boy in the business at blasting the boulevard through big bunches of bewildered baboons by banging and bending betwixt and between them like a bird in the brush. Banqueted and barbecued as the brilliant bozo who baffled, befuddled bevies of beefy blacksmiths because blubber and brag can't beat brain and brawn, bud. <laughs> Bill is the bold Brummel who bops balloons to the balmy breezes with a bang of the bunion, battered and bruised when I went to bed, but hang on there, folks, there's a red light ahead. <laughs> Now all we have to do is go across town to the stadium. You can let me out anywhere. I'll take a cab, McGee. Oh, no, you don't, Gildersleeve. No fair breaking up the Why, party. Why, I should say not. You know how to get to the stadium, Fibber? Oh, I, I ain't very familiar here in South Bend. I, I better ask this cop. Uh, hey, officer. Yes, what is it? Well, I tell you, officer, we're going to the Notre Dame Army football game. Can you tell us how to get there, sir? Why, sure, McCushler. Turn right to the next red light and take Route 66 east about 900 miles. <laughs> 900 miles east? Ain't this South Bend, Indiana? Sure, but they're playing that game at West Point. <laughs> hey, let go of me, Gildersleeve! Moore, lay off of me! I didn't realize... Hey, quick! Hey! Hey! <laughs> products have been received with more universal satisfaction than Johnson's self-polishing glow coat, the floor polish that's saving so many hours of work every day for housewives everywhere. The reason for this satisfaction is the service glow coat gives, how easy it is to use, how beautiful it makes floors of all kinds, especially linoleum, how economical it is to use, and how it saves its cost many times over by making linoleum last so much longer. Glow coat is called self-polishing because it really does polish itself. It shines while it dries, needs no rubbing or buffing at all. You simply apply glow coat with a cloth or long-handled glow coat applier, then go on about your other work. In 20 minutes, come back to find your floor gleaming with a hard, beautiful polish. Still, things are quickly wiped up with a damp cloth. And that's the glow coat story, which you can easily verify by trying it yourself on your own floors. Ask your dealer for Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. Next Tuesday, November 5th, is Election Day all over the USA and 
We hope you'll all get out and vote. That's right. Vote any way you like, but vote. And let's be thankful we all live in a country where you are just told where to vote and not how. Good night. Good night, all. This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat, inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. Is your car ready for winter? Besides servicing it for cold weather, don't forget to clean and wax polish it with Johnson's Car New. Both of these jobs are now comparatively easy to do because Car New both cleans and wax polishes at the same time in less than half the time they used to take. Whether your car is old or new, you and your family will enjoy it more when it's had a Car New beauty treatment. Buy a can of Car New from your regular wax dealer, auto supply store, or service station. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Flash Gordon is going to be taking you on an intergalactic adventure next. Presenting the adventures of Flash Gordon and Jungle Jim. Last week we met Jungle Jim, gentleman adventurer, down in Malaysia. With him was his faithful man, Kolu. They rescued a missionary, the Reverend Manly Chalmers, from a wildcat and were invited to stay for supper with him and his wife. While they were getting acquainted, there was a terrible crash. Kolu came running with the news that an airship of some kind had landed in the bush. Jungle Jim and the missionary, closely followed by Mrs. Chalmers and Kolu, ran to the wreck. It proved to be the spaceship containing Flash Gordon, Dale Arden, and Dr. Zarkov. After they were revived and it was found that they weren't seriously injured, Flash and Dale asked to be married by the missionary. The Reverend Chalmers declared that such a solemn step could only be taken after due deliberation and led the way back to his camp to discuss the matter. These thrilling adventures of Flash Gordon and Jungle Jim are pictured each Sunday in the big comic weekly the world's greatest pictorial supplement of humor and adventure. For Comic Weekly, each page printed in full colors is distributed everywhere as an integral part of your Hearst Sunday newspaper. And now we continue the story. Back at the camp of the Reverend Chalmers and his wife, after supper, Flash pleads his case. You see, Reverend... Dale and I have been trying to get married for a long time. Flash and I love each other very much, Mr. Chalmers. I'm sure you do, Miss Arden. But as I said before, marriage is something that can't be decided in a hurry. Excuse me, Reverend, but I did decide it in a hurry. The minute I saw Dale sitting across the aisle from me in that transcontinental plane... And so did I. The minute I saw Flash look at me. Excuse me for interrupting, Reverend, but I can assure you that never have I seen such true devotion as Flash and Dale bear for each other. The sincerity of these two young people impresses me greatly, Dr. Sarkov. And what you say adds weight. I know you men of science. Truth is paramount in all things with you. Science is based on truth, reverence. No matter who may be benefited or who may be hurt, the truth must at all times be spoken. Well, sir, what's your verdict? My earnest young friend, I shall be delighted to perform the ceremony which will make you as one. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chalmers. That's mighty nice of you, sir. Well, it is in my party, but I'm delighted myself. This is the first jungle wedding I've witnessed, uh, uh, between white people, I mean. A jungle wedding? Oh, Flash, how exciting. It's going to be different from the ceremony we kept looking forward to in Mongo. I don't care about anything, as long as I have you, Flash. You darling. And as far as I'm concerned, having you is a darn sight more important than any kingdom ever created. Oh, my dear. Uh, excuse me, you two. I hate to break in, but uh, just when is the ceremony going to take place? There's a steamer leaving for the States tomorrow night. There is? Yep. Then why can't we be married tomorrow noon? You can, my dear boy. And then Mrs. Chalmers and I will escort you in our motorboat to the steamer. Won't we, Mary, dear? Of course, Manly. Oh, that will be wonderful. Then tomorrow morning, Miss Arden, we'll go through the box of clothing we're taking to the mission and find a wedding outfit for you. Find something for Dr. Zarkoff and me, please, Mrs. Chalmers. Yes, I surely need it. Uh, oh, Cole, certainly. Colo and I will build an altar for you in the middle of the jungle. I'll gather some flowers for my bouquet. I'll help you, Dale. We'll trim the altar Jim and Colo build. Well, uh, I'll set up our portable gramophone and dust off the recording of the wedding march. Oh, 
Oh, Flash, isn't it gorgeous? Not half as gorgeous as you are, Dale. Thank you. But just think, we couldn't have an altar all trimmed in orchids if we were being married in the States. That's only too true. Your color of gardenias is beautiful. I thought it was when I made it. And to think all this was had just for the picking. I wonder what that can be. Uh, Jim? Jim? Hello? What are those tom-toms for? Oh, some natives having a powwow. Say, you're the prettiest bride I ever saw, Miss Arden. Why, thank you. For once, Dale can't use the usual feminine reply to a compliment. Oh, these things, heavens, they're old. I could say that, <laughs> and it would be true. But I'm grateful to Miss Somebody for them. As I am to Mr. Somebody for this blue suit and bow tie. But, uh, Jim, have you the ring we borrowed from Mrs. Chalmers? Right here. Uh, keep your shirt on. Where's Dr. Zarkoff and Mr. Chalmers? Oh, well, Zarkoff getting dressed. The Reverend setting the gramophone so Mrs. Chalmers can play the wedding march. All right, Mr. Gordon. I think we're ready. You and Dr. Zarkoff will come from the tent, Miss Arden, when the wedding march starts. He's waiting for you. Well, Miss Arden, when we part again, you'll be Mrs. Flash Gordon. I can hardly wait. Well, I guess we can take our places at the altar, gentlemen. It's funny, sir. This is the thing I've wanted more than anything in my life, marrying Dale. Now I'm more scared to stand in front of that altar and go through the ceremony than I ever was when I rescued her from our enemies in Mongo. It's the solemnity of the occasion, my dear boy. Yeah. Now, uh, you and Jungle Jim stand here at my left. That's it. All ready, Mary? I've never seen Colo so excited. Uh, wait a minute. Stop the gramophone, please, Barry. Master Jim, chief of tribe here say no wedding without native wedding. He got warrior all round here. Oh, so that's what the tom-toms mean. They saw us preparing for this. Do you mind being married a la native first flash? It will simplify things. Uh, no, of course not. Uh, Dale, come here. Uh, here come chief to perform... Ceremony. What's the matter, Flash? The natives intend to start trouble if we don't let them marry us for the local ceremony. Do you mind going through with it? Of course I don't. I think it's thrilling. Our wedding will really be a jungle wedding in more ways than one. <laughs> All right, Chief. Shoot. What do we do? Weini Daunga, Magataga Daraita, Ipang, Pananaga Nimawai, Babuega, Yamunagasira, Et Magayan, Nagapa. Ak Marua Nagapanulos. What's he saying? We asked Derry to make a happy union. Give good hunting, and may you have all the things you need for the rest of your lives. Hold out and What's he going to do? Anoint Flash's forefinger with coconut oil. See? He's tracing Flash's finger from the tip to the pulse. Abayat Magayan Nagap Balad. That means may your good fortune ascend. Abayat Yagaman Naga Lapay. And that means May your bad fortune descend. And now he goes from the pulse to the tip of the finger. You're next, Miss Arden. Apayat magayen naga alad. Apayat yagamen naga lapai. Here I to unplash. Missy, what do we do with these balls of rice? The chief is making signs for you to exchange them. Oh, here, Dale. And you take this one, Flash. And now, friends, everything's okay with the chief. You're married. Is that all there is to it? Yes, that's all. Why, it's terribly unimpressive. Well, that's because it doesn't mean anything to us. Let's really be married now. Please take your places. Come, Dale, back to the tent. All right, Mary. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of his company to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is commended in holy scripture to be honorable among men and therefore not to be entered into unadvisedly or lightly, but irreverently, discreetly, advisedly and soberly in the fear of God. Into this holy estate, these two persons present come now to be joined. If any man can show just cause why they may not be lawfully joined together, let him now speak, or else hereafter forever hold his peace. Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? I do. Flash Gordon, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love her? 
comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep the only unto her, so long as ye both shall live, I will. De Laden, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou obey him and serve him, love, honor, and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live. I will. The ring. Flash. Place the ring on Dale's finger and repeat after me. With this ring. With this ring. I thee wed. I thee wed. And with all my worldly goods. And with all my worldly goods. I thee endow. I thee endow. Let us pray. O eternal God, creator and preserver of all mankind, giver of all spiritual grace, the author of everlasting life, send thy blessing upon these thy servants, this man and this woman, whom we bless in thy name, that as Isaac and Rebecca live faithfully together, so these persons may surely perform and keep the vow and covenant betwixt them made, whereof this ring given and received is a token and pledge and may ever remain in perfect love and peace together, and live according to thy laws. Amen. Those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. For as much as Flash and Dale have consented together in holy wedlock, and have witnessed the same before God and this company, and there too have pledged their troth, each to other, and have declared the same by giving and receiving a ring, and by joining hands, I pronounce they are man and wife. You may kiss your bride. Dale, dearest, wife. Flash, darling, at last I can call you husband. This has been the most beautiful wedding I have ever seen in the field, Mrs. Gordon. Allow me to wish you every happiness. Thank you. I don't need to tell Mr. Gordon that he's a very lucky man. Indeed you don't, sir. Nor the happiest man in the world, for I know I am. And please accept my good wishes. You deserve the best of everything. Say, folks, I don't want to be left out. Mrs. Gordon, all happiness to you. Thank you. My congratulations, Flash. Thanks very much. You've been awfully kind to us, Jim. Dale and I will never forget you. I should say not. And when you come back to the United States, you must come and see us. Thank you, ma'am. I sure will. And uh, speaking of the States, I don't want to hurry you, but... Uh... Bless my soul. We'd better be getting started if you want to make the steamer. Are you all ready? Yes. We're going with just the clothes we have on our backs, thanks to your people back home. Uh, come on. Let's get into the motorboat. This old Prince Albert could be a little looser, but it's very dressy looking, don't you think? You look terribly distinguished, Dr. Zoss. Oh, thank you, Dale. Well, uh, since the charmers are taking us to the steamer, I guess there's just you and Colo to say goodbye to, Jim. Wish you were coming to see us off. Well, we might if there'd been room, but it's just as well parting now. We can say it all here. And Colo and I better be getting back to that camp of ours, if there's any camp left. You're right, boss, Jim. Maybe river pirates set fire camp while we're gone. Flash, hurry. We're waiting. Coming, dear. Well, so long, Jim. Thanks for everything. That's okay, Flash. Good luck to you. Goodbye, Colo. Goodbye, two on Flash. Hurry up, Flash. Goodbye. 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 There go mission two on boat. Down river against sun. Yes, Colo. There goes Mission Tuan's boat. You know, Flash Gordon's a great fellow. Maybe we'll see him again sometime. Well, I wonder what's going to happen to us next, Colo. Be sure and be with us next week at the same time for the beginning of a long series of thrilling adventures with Jungle Jim. Each week, the Comic Weekly, distributed everywhere with the Hearst Sunday newspapers, reproduces Jungle Jim in full-color action pictures. Get acquainted with this sterling adventurer and with Colo, his man Friday. See pictured for you by a famous artist, all the leading characters as well as the natives, the wild animals, and the many queer forms of vegetation in the steaming jungle, which forms the background to these thrilling adventures way down at the southernmost tip of Asia. Then, of course, you don't want to miss next Sunday's colored poster stamps. These wonderful poster stamps appear exclusively in the Comic Weekly and are drawn by famous artists especially for you. The official album of the Poster Stamp Collectors Club is available at stores everywhere. So if you haven't yet started your collection, 
Be sure and get the Comic Weekly with next Sunday's Hearst newspaper and become an active participant in Young America's newest and most popular educational hobby. And now, goodbye until next week when we will be back with a thrilling adventure story of Jungle Jim. Now it's time to pay a visit to the only man in old-time radio who wrote all his own material, Fred Allen. The Fred Allen Show, with Fred's guest, the Metropolitan Opera star, Lawrence Melchior, Portland Hopper, Minerva Pius as Mrs. Nussbaum, the DeMarco Sisters, and Al Goodman and his orchestra. And if you ever want to have me paid... My name is Kenny Delmar. <laughs> Gentlemen, a certain news commentator starts his program saying... Ah, there's good news tonight. We start our show by saying, ah, there's bad news tonight. And here it is. Meet Fred Allen. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And Kenny, speaking of news, it may interest you to know that I was called to Washington this week. Oh, still trying to get out of the draft, huh? No. <laughs> no, Kenny. General Grant straightened that out for me. <laughs> Was your family income higher in 1944? And if it was, what accounted for the increase? Shall we go? As the nostril said to the Kleenex, I think I'll blow. <laughs> ah, something tells me the Senate is home. I smell chitlings cooking. Somebody I say somebody now. Yes, I know. Uh, Claghorn's the name. Senator Claghorn, that is. You don't have to... I'm from the South. The only candy I eat is cotton candy. I don't care what... I've seen Gone with the Wind 72 times. Look, I don't when care... When I'm in New York, I refuse to drive through the Lincoln Tunnel. Now... <laughs> Now, look, Senator. Now, what's eating your son out with well, it? I just would your like... jaw keeps wagging, but nothing comes out. <laughs> well, I don't get You're it. You're like Charlie McCarthy without Edgar Bergen. Well, if you just give me a chance... Take it dummy. Dummy, that is. Now, wait a minute. I... <laughs> Put me down off your knee, Senator. <laughs> now, what about families earning more money in 1944? Well, it ain't what people earn, son. It's what they can keep. You mean... Most people end up with nothing. It's the law of averages? It's the Ways and Means Committee. The Ways and Means? If you've got means, they'll find ways to get it. <laughs> so long, son. So long, that is. So long, Senator. Uh, don't forget, vote for, I say vote for Jefferson Davis. I'll write him in. <laughs> You can tell the senator's doing a whale of a job. Instead of a cane, he carries a harpoon. Oh, well, let's see if Titus Moody is here. Howdy, Bob. Well, <laughs> you, don't, you don't look so well tonight, Mr. Moody. No. Oh, you have sinus trouble? Yeah. When I was a little boy, my mother used to pick me up with the nose. <laughs> Your mother picked you up by the nose? I had small ears. Oh, I... <laughs> well, I, uh... 
I couldn't see your ears. You have your ear laps on there. Yeah, I've been out chasing my wife. Chasing your wife, huh? My wife had a dog biscuit, accidental. Ate a dog biscuit? Yeah, last two nights. Uh-huh. She's been running up and down the road barking at strangers. Well, about these uh, higher wages, how did uh, how did you do in 1944? Only made one deal. One deal, huh? Yeah, in January, I bought a pig for $8. I see. Fed the pig $12 worth of swill. Yeah. $20 worth of mash. Yeah. December, I sold the pig for $40. Now, wait a minute. If you bought the pig for $8, spent $12 for swill, that's $20. $20 more for mash, that's $40, and you say you sold the pig for only $40. Yeah, I didn't make no money. No? No, but I had the use of the pig all the year. So long, Buck. <laughs> well, Mr. Moody will never know enough to bring home the bacon, I guess. Let's see what happens at this next door. No? Oh, Mrs. Nussbaum. You are expecting maybe Russell and Yussel. <laughs> Tell me, Mrs. N., did your family make more money in 1944? Money is all over. Oh, really? In the closets is money. Closet. On the shelf is money. The cat, a little pussy, is sleeping on money. <laughs> well, were you, with all this money, were you and uh, Pierre both working? I am welding with overtime. Oh, welding, huh? <laughs> Pierre is working in the shipyard. Fine. He is a funnel sealer. <laughs> a funnel sealer? Yes. When our ship is finished, uh -huh. Pierre is sealing up the funnel. Well, why should he seal up the funnel? If nothing is in the funnel, yeah. smoke can go out. Oh, I <laughs> Well, what happened to all this money you made? Pierre is buying a filling station. Good, a filling station. Pierre's gasoline heaven. Gasoline. <laughs> Open 23 hours a day. 23 hours? Why not 24? A man has to sleep. Oh. <laughs> Pierre ran the whole station alone. And what service he is giving. You mean when a car drove up? Pierre is running out and combing the raccoon tail on the radiator cap. <laughs> Next, with a squidgy, he is cleaning the windshield. Good. He is waxing the chassis, uh -huh. putting air in the tires, Good. polishing the fender. I see. And for the driver, he is shining the shoes, pressing the suit, and blocking the hat. Hey, with that service, Pierre must have made a fortune. In two months, he is broke. <laughs> broke? Pierre is so busy combing, cleaning, waxing, shining, and flapping. Yes? He is forgetting to sell gasoline. And today? He is still calling it Pierre's gasoline heaven. Uh-huh. But the business is going to... I see your point. Thank you. <laughs> well, here we are at the last house in Allen's Alley. Let's see what happens here. Well, the DeMarco kids. Have you rented McGee and McGee's house? Yes, we got it for a song. And the song is? It's been a long, long time. Oh, it's well. <laughs> Goodman has just rendered a shorthand version of It Might As Well Be Spring. That's as much music as Mr. Goodman's men can hold on their stands without crowding off their racing form. <laughs> so that happens every Sunday the same way. Yes, Portland, you, uh... uh... Who is our guest tonight? Well, our guest is a little mix-up, Portland. I did have Balsam Bemis. Who is Balsam Bemis? Who is Balsam Bemis? <laughs> He is the manager of the only theater in New York City that isn't showing an Ingrid Bergman picture this week. <laughs> but uh, he just called up. He can't make it tonight. His popcorn machine went haywire. It squirted two pounds of butter on a statue of Louis B. Mayer in the lobby. <laughs> and he's 
there with some bread mopping up the lava. <laughs> That's what happened. Our guest stars drop out like that. We never uh, know. Well, is anyone coming? Well, Lawrence Melchior, the big opera star, may drop in. He called me up and said that he wanted to see me. Wasn't Mr. Melchior here two years ago? Oh, it's over two years ago. He was griping about Sinatra making $30,000 a week, remember? Mr. Melchior wanted me to get him on the radio. Well, what does he want tonight? Well, at that time, I told him to stay in opera. He became a big star, so he probably wants to thank me for giving him that advice. Oh, this must be Mr. Melchior now. Come in. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present Mr. Lawrence Melchior. As a lover of shellfish, Mr. Melchior, I welcome you to our little clam bag. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The last time I saw you, remember, you wanted me to get you in radio. Here I am again, sir. Lawrence, you mean? Wait, you've got to get me in radio. Radio? Why, you were one of opera's biggest stars. I went by the Metropolitan a few weeks ago. You were billed outside. There was a line... The line wasn't for the opera press. No? That was the end of the Paramount light waiting to see Sinatra. <laughs> again with Sinatra. Lawrence, stop worrying about the narrow nightingale. <laughs> Don't forget that you are the great Melchior. But see, that's a mix. $30,000 a week. It's ridiculous. You, the great Wagnerian tenor, would like to be in Sinatra's shoes? Why not? My shoes have holes in them. Look! <laughs> Gosh, you've got paper in the sole. It's an old copy of Downbeat. <laughs> well, what are a few holes in your shoes? In opera, you are a star. Fritz, make me another Frankie boy. <laughs> no, Lawrence. Another Perry Como. No, Lawrence. Dick Haynes. Not even Dick Haynes. Lawrence, think back. What did I tell you two years ago? Uh, you said uh, Sinatra was just a flash in the pan. That's right. He's been in the pen a long time. <laughs> Lawrence, you came to me whining before. I told you to stay in opera. And I stayed in opera. Well, I wish I was dead. <laughs> but, Lawrence, in, in opera you sing to audiences in top hats, evening gowns, mink windbreakers. <laughs> You want to sing for kids in Sloppy Joe sweaters and Bobby socks? For thirty thousand dollars, they can sit in the union suit. <laughs> now, Lawrence, listen to reason. Thirty thousand dollars, and what does he sing? She got it. She can We took some liberty with the lyrics, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, who could take your place in opera? Carmen Lombardo is on the road by request. Who could take your place in opera? Carmen Lombardo is on the road by request. <laughs> you can't give up Tannhäuser, Lohengrin, and Tristan in his shoulder. Thirty thousand dollars, but think of your opera tradition. What would the great Melba say if she could hear you now? Oh, but thirty thousand dollars a great Melba would think. <laughs> oh, I don't understand what you want in life. You have fame. You just made a picture in Hollywood, didn't you? Yes. Wait, I wasn't thrill of a romance. Thrill of a romance with Esther Williams and Van Johnson. It was a big MGM hit. Sure. But who saw me? Who saw you? The men who looked at Van Johnson. The Hollywood autograph fans didn't mob you? Oh, just, just one little girl asked for my autograph. Well, that's something. She thought I was Edward Arnold. <laughs> well, you did better than I did. They kept mistaking me for Thunderhead, son of Pasternak. <laughs> Fred, uh, you've got to get me into it. No, Lawrence, and that is positively final. You be my manager, Fred. Be your manager? We'll split the $30,000, 50-50. And you'll never regret it, Lawrence Melchior. When do we stop? Right now. 
You know, a lot of radio producers and sponsors listen to this program. Now, if you can give an audition, we might get an offer tonight. Is there something you can sing? Uh, how about uh, Because? Because, fine. The Jack Benny contest uh, theme song. I like Jack Benny. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Melchior is now available for any and all radio engagements. After his audition song, any producers or sponsors interested in Mr. Melchior for radio can phone us here at the Fred Allen Program. Go ahead, Loris. Give it plenty of schmaltz. Bravo, Melchior! Bravissimo, Melchior! <laughs> Andy Russell was in the hall and thought it was a choir. He never heard it. <laughs> that was wonderful, Mr. Melchior. Any, any phone calls yet? No phone calls. Keep your leotard on, Loris. <laughs> When those phone bells start ringing, you'll think it's a good humor man with St. Vitus dance. But are you sure the telephone is Yes, it's working, Lars. Now stop biting your nails. Every big producer in radio is probably fishing around for a nickel to call us. Now relax. <laughs> ah, there's the phone. Here's the first nibble, Lars. I've got it. Hello? Fred Allen, manager of Lars Melchior speaking. You heard the audition? You want Mr. Melchior right away? Well, I'll see. A chuck? Yes, it's the four chicks and a chuck. They want you to fill in. <laughs> Do they want me to sing at a chick or a chuck? Well, I'll find out. You have a choice there. Hello? Oh, you you wanted to sing with four other people? Now listen. Mr. Melchior sings as a soloist or not at all. Goodbye. But, but, but wait, it was a job. What job? A job just for two weeks. One of the chicks was molting. <laughs> if you go into radio, Lawrence, you're not sitting on a nest singing with any group. You are singing a solo. Right, right, the telephone. I'll get it. Hello? Oh, uh, Mr. Manville? It's Tommy Manville, Lawrence. <laughs> yes, Mr. Manville. Hold the line. I'll see. Lawrence, do you know, oh, promise me... <laughs> Fred, I, I can't sing at wedding. When I open my mouth, I always get a mouthful of rice. Well, it's a good offer, Lawrence. Not much money singing at Manville weddings, but it's steady work. <laughs> no, 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 Fred. Uh, sorry, Mr. Manville. Thanks for calling. What? No, I don't know Lucy Monroe's number. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Maybe I should sing again, Fred. Now, Lawrence, stop worrying. Something big will come in any minute. Uh, maybe we could call back the chicks and the chuck. No, no, Lawrence. Uh, if the next is big enough, I could sit Now, down. please, Lawrence, please. Hello? Yes, Mr. Melchior is here. Hold it, I'll ask him. Uh, Lawrence. Yes, sir. Can you sing in a blonde wig and slacks? In, in a blonde wig? It spills for tall <laughs> What, uh, what shall I tell him? Uh, tell him my week size is seven and a half. Yes, Bill. What? No, I won't let him sing falsetto with 14 dames. Goodbye. You're going to sing a solo or nothing. But, Fred, I'm hungry. Hungry, Lawrence. Hello? Yes? An offer for Mr. Melchior? What? You sing a solo? We'll be right over. Goodbye. Lawrence, this is it. Grab your hat and alpine stock. Never mind my hat. Let us go. All right, let's... This is the studio, Lawrence. See that sign on the door? Radio Productions Incorporated. Let's go in. Can I help you, Jim? I am Mr. Melchior's manager. This is Mr. Lawrence Melchior. Oh, Mr. Batou, Mr. Melchior is here. Ah, Melchior, the great Melchior, it's you. How do you do? Mr. Melchior, everything is ready. Not so fast, Badu. Before we sign anything, remember Mr. Melchior will only sing a solo. It is his solo. The orchestra is 100 musicians. At last, you're in radio, Lawrence. Are you happy? Great. I can never thank you. Well, the oh. studio is ready, Mr. Melchior, right through here. And what an orchestra. What an orchestra. Toscanini personally is playing the cymbal. We're ready, Mr. Badu. <laughs> here is your music, Mr. Melchior. We're all set to go. Good luck, Lawrence. Thanks, Fred. Quiet, everybody. Let's go. We're on the air. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the glorious voice of the great Lawrence Melchior. Singing the past, oh, singing for joy. Oh, I know the life I 
Carter, famous for chasing crime. Take a trip back to Dodge City with Marshal Matt Dillon in Gunsmoke, coming up next. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. If I sit here a while, Marshal. <laughs> of course not. Sit down, Billy. Hey, you look worried, Billy. Boy like you shouldn't look worried. I'm 21. That's a man's age, isn't it, Chester? Oh, sure. 21's pretty old, Billy. Old enough for Frogmouth Kate, anyway. Every time I come to town, that woman won't give me a minute's peace. Well, maybe she's sweet on you, Billy. Sweet on me. <laughs> look at her at the bar over there. She'll come to and miss me pretty soon. Old enough to be my mother. Well, then why do you stay here? Why don't you go over to the Longhorn or someplace? Aw, oh, Kate's all right when she's sober. Just when she gets drunk, she's such a nuisance. Well, she sure looks drunk now. She is. And when she's like this, there's no worse woman in the whole world. I could kill her when she gets like this. <laughs> Somebody's always going to kill somebody around here. Oh, that's that's just a way of talking, Marshal. <laughs> yeah. I hate to tell you, Billy, but I think Frogmouth Kate has spotted you. Yeah, I knew she would. She gets lonesome awful fast, that woman. So that's where you went, Billy. Leaving me all alone? Shame on you, honey. I gotta catch my breath once in a while, Kate. Well, you can catch your breath with me, honey. Not with Marshal Dillon and Chester and all the rest of them. Now, nah, Kate, take it easy. I'll take it easy. You and me will take it easy in St. Louis, Billy boy. And quit talking about St. Louis all the time. I ain't about to go to St. Louis. I'm broke right here in Dodge. I got the money, Billy. Almost I got it. Almost enough. <laughs> you and me, huh, baby? Oh, Kate. Why don't you pick on somebody who can at least buy you a few drinks? Well, they've been buying me drinks. I don't care about them anyway. Let's get married, Billy boy. What do you say, huh? You and me. See what I mean, Marshal? Ain't she <laughs> awful? <laughs> <laughs> well, she likes you, Billy. Sure. We're a couple of real lovebirds. Yeah. Hey, now stop that. <laughs> let, let go of me, Pete. I'll break your head open. Ah, uh, you cute Billy lover boy. Yo, cut it out. Uh, well, if you'll excuse us, we better be moving on. Uh... <clears throat> Chester? Mm -hmm. Well, all right, Chester. Yes, sir. <laughs> so long, Billy. Kate? Now, you never mind them, Billy boy. They're just a couple of crooks like everybody else except you, sweetie. <laughs> you and me, huh, <laughs> Poor Billy. <laughs> well, he's got to learn somehow. I suppose. <sighs> well, the town seems pretty quiet, Chester. I think I'll go to bed. Good idea, Mr. Dillon. I'll sleep in the office tonight. All right, I'll see you in the morning. Good night, sir. Uh, 
Oh, uh, well, who is it? It's Chester, sir. Open up. Oh, oh, well, just a minute, Chester. Oh. Oh, what is it, Chester? There's been a shooting, sir, in that room in the house next to the Alphaganza. What? Oh, well, I'll get dressed. Come on inside. It's been raining a little, Mr. Dillon. Oh, good. Light that lamp there, will you, Chester? Yes, sir. They sent for Doc, and he woke me up on his way out. He know what it was all about? No, sir. He just said it was in that room in house. Oh. What time is it, anyway? Oh, it'll be daylight soon. Must be about 4.30. 4.30. It's pretty late at night for a gunfight, isn't it? Yes, sir. That's what I thought. There. There. All right, Chester, I'm ready. Blow the lamp out. Huh? Yes, sir. That rain sure helped. Wouldn't it be fine if it stayed this cool all day, Mr. Dillon? No, you'd be lost if you couldn't complain about the heat, Chester. Well, I'd be willing to think of something else. Yeah, I suppose. Ma Torvester still runs this rooming house, doesn't she? Last I heard, she did. Yeah. Marshal. Down here, Marshal Dillon. It's Ma Torvester, all right. Ma. Right in here, Marshal. Who was it, Ma? Frogmouth Kate. She got shot. Kate? It's no use, Matt. She hasn't said a word, and she's not likely to now. Uh, who did it, Ma? Oh, I was asleep, Marshal. Heard a shot and come right down. I sent everybody else back to bed and told them to stay there. You don't know who did it, then? He must have jumped out that window right there. You go get him, Marshal. He's got a head start already. A uh, who, Ma? Well, that kid, Billy Daunt. Must have been. Well, why do you think it was Billy? Because he was drinking with her all night over at the Alifraganza, that's why. Been with her all yesterday, I heard, too. Couldn't be nobody else. He stole I... her money, too. How do you know he did, Ma? Oh, she showed me once. She kept it right under the mattress there, and it's gone. She had quite a lot of it saved up, too. Everybody knew that. She's planned on going back to St. Louis with it. She wanted Billy to go with her, but I guess he couldn't wait, the little rat. I sure hope I see him hung. Uh, uh, Chester, start looking for him. I'll join you in a few minutes. Yes, sir. I'll go out back for him. She's dead, man. Oh, that poor girl. It's a wonder she lived this long, being shot so close up. She didn't say anything, not a... Not a word, man. She was unconscious the whole time. Yeah. Well, I'll uh, chip in toward burying her, Doc, seeing as how she was sort of broke when she died. Nonsense. Kate was a good girl, and I'll be responsible for her getting a fine burial. Finest there is, but you catch that devil Billy Daunt, Marshal. Don't you let him get away. We'll find him, Ma. Well, you sure better. Well, let me know if you hear anything. I'll see you later, Doc. Sure, Matt. Chester and I spent the next couple of hours looking for Billy Daunt, but nobody had seen him since he and Kate had left the Elifraganza together the night before. We did learn, however, that he'd been riding for Luke Atkins, and since it was our only lead, we decided to go out to the ranch and have a talk with Luke. It was mid-morning when we rode up to the main house, and at first the place looked deserted. Anyway, it's cool here under the cottonwood. Maybe Luke's out on the prairie somewhere. Well, if he's smart, he's keeping away from the sun right there in the house. Uh, oh. Now, uh, leave the horses, Chester. They'll stand. All right, you... Who's there? It's Matt Dillon, Luke. Oh, I just rest a little, Marshal. Hello, Chester. Hello, Luke. It's cooler out here. Sit down. My gracious, what happened to you? Does it look bad? Yeah, bad enough to skip church this Sunday, Luke. 
Black eye, huh? I ain't got a mirror. Your jaw's swollen, too. Fool kid, I never saw him like that before. He must have been drunk. Billy Daunt? He's been spending his pay in Dodge the last couple of days and... Say, is that why you're here, Marshal? Billy get in trouble there? Maybe. What'd he beat you up for, Luke? Why, well, he just rode in here this morning early and said he needed a better horse than his and wanted my buckskin gilding. He was all excited and I started to argue with him. He jumped me before I knew what was happening. Knocked me out for a minute, I guess. He's gone then, huh? Sure he's gone. I came up to the house here and got my rifle and watched him go. Funny thing, though, he didn't leave right away. Well, what do you mean? He fooled around down there in the barn for most an hour. I don't know what he was up to, but I just sat here on the porch with my rifle in case he got any more crazy ideas. He finally rode off, though, headed west. Well, we're after him, Luke. Billy in bad trouble, Marshal? Yeah, it looks like it. I'm sorry to hear that. He's always been a pretty good boy. Where are the rest of your men, Luke? Still in Dodge, Marshal, spending their pay. Yeah. Well, you take care of that eye. So long. Goodbye, Marshal. Chester. Bye, Luke. There's not much question about Billy now, is there? Yeah, there sure isn't. Start looking for tracks, Chester. Yes, sir, I have been. The ground's still damp from the rain last night. We ought to cut this trail easy. I don't see anything. Now, look there, over there. Those are fresh tracks. Yeah, they're fresh, all right, but they lead toward the ranch, not away from it. Yeah. Well, let's follow him anyway, Chester. What? Come on, let's ride. Chester figured either Billy was riding backwards or I was crazy. But he stopped arguing after a couple of hours, and we rode in silence the rest of the day. Long about dusk, I figured we were catching up with him, but we couldn't afford to lose the trail. And when night came, we made camp. Next morning at daylight, we went on. By noon, it was clear Billy hadn't taken any rest at all. A couple of hours later, we began to wonder how much longer his horse could hold up. This is the doggondest hunt I was ever on. Billy just isn't very smart, that's all. Well, he must be half crazy, beating up Luke Atkins like that. When a man's in a panic, he'll do almost anything, Chester. Well, you'd think he'd at least have sense enough to rest his horse now and then. Now, that'll be easier for us if he doesn't. Chester. Hmm? Look up ahead there. Hey, by heaven, it's a horse. Yeah, huh. That's a buckskin. It's not saddled. There isn't a thing around, sir. This side of that bluff, anyway. The bluff's too far away for an ambush. The horse doesn't look very good, does he? He's not even eating. Yeah. Oh. He may never be any good again. That fool kid. Well, he can't be very far away. Unless he's found another horse. Look at the buckskin's hooves, Chester. Why, he isn't even shod. Yeah, Billy pulled his shoes when he left him. He sure made a mistake, though. What do you mean? That's what he was doing in Luke's barn, putting the shoes on backwards. Now he's pulled them. He wouldn't fool anybody. All it did was help wear his horse out even more. He had me fooled for a while. Anyway, we'll catch him pretty soon now. Well, his tracks lead toward the bluff there. Probably into that clump of trees. Well, if that's where he is, he can see us. All right, we'll ride in from different directions. You can't get both of us. Okay, sir. Well, 
A half hour later, Chester and I had reached the trees about the same time and without being shot at. There was a spring there and a tiny cabin. Deserted. One set of footprints led up to the place and two sets led away from it. Billy had taken whoever lived there along with him. Figuring there wasn't too much hurry now, we watered our horses and let them breathe for a while. The way I figured, Mr. Dillon, Billy was here about dawn this morning. Billy won't be far away, not more than 15 or 20 miles at the most. Unless he's found a horse. Well, that's why he's carrying his saddle, isn't he? Yeah. Only Billy isn't carrying the saddle. What? He's saving his strength. Whoever was in this cabin is doing the hard work. You mean Billy took him along just to carry his saddle? Yeah, he found himself a pack horse, Chester. Mr. Dillon, I'm getting to have less use for Billy Don every minute. Come on, let's ride him down. Before it's too late for this poor fellow, whoever he is. All right, Chester. Well, our horses are in good shape. We ought to catch him in a few hours. I sure hope so. Uh, you take the side of the trail, Chester. Track about ten yards behind me, huh? All right, sir. All right, let's go. Don't bother to watch the trail anymore, Chester. It's headed right for that nester's shack there. So keep your eyes open. You think Billy might still be there? Yeah, he might be. Oh. Maybe he's inside, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Let's spread out a little. All right, sir. Now, wait a minute. It's the door. Who are you? Are, uh, are you alone, ma'am? You the law? I'm Marshal Dillon from Dodge. You're too late, Marshal. You mean he's gone? He's gone. Take a look around at the side, Marshal. Right around there. Go on, look. Both of you. Goodness, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. He was killed with a knife. Yes, sir, he sure was. That your husband, ma'am? Yes. I'm sorry it happened, but if it's any comfort to you, we'll catch that boy. I promise you that. Don't matter now. Uh, he had another man with him. Where's he? Inside. I've been trying to fix him up. He was near dead when they got here. Poor old Clabe. Clabe? He's 75 years old, Marshal, and that's too old to be used like an animal. Rotten kid. I'd, uh, like to talk to him, ma'am. Come on inside. All right, Claves. Marshal Dillon from Dodge. We've known Clave for ten years, Marshal, ever since we've been here. Never hurt nobody. Sure. Uh, can you talk a little, Clave? Uh, I'll be all right, Marshal. I'm just kind of wore out. Twenty miles packing a saddle in this weather. Fast, too. Had me walk fast. How long ago did the boy leave here? Three, four hours, Marshal. Took our mule, but he won't get far. Oh? Why not? Mule's too old. After ten miles, just quit. Your husband tried to stop him, is that it? Yeah. Got mad when he saw what the boy had done to Clay. And the boy knifed him. Never gave him a chance. He's wild crazy. He sure is, Marshal. Scared, too. I never saw anybody so scared. He's in a real panic, Clay. But how come he used a knife? That doesn't sound right. 
And it's all he's got, that's why. What? He ain't armed, except for that knife. He doesn't have a gun? He took our rifle, but there's no ammunition for it. We run out. Took it anyway. But when he came to your place, Clay, didn't he have a six-gun? No, sir. Just that knife, that's all he had. I got an old Navy pistol, but it's busted. I ain't been able to get it fixed. I sure don't understand it, Mr. Dillon. He's like a wild animal, that's what he is. He oughtn't to be loose. He won't be for long, ma'am. Clay, I hope you'll be all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm just plumb wore out. Clay's going to stay right here, Marshal. Too old to be living by himself anyway. Good. Uh, well, we'll be gone now, ma'am. But uh, we'll bury your husband first. Now, if you'll just show us where you'd like to have the grave. Thank you, Marshal. The woman wanted her husband buried right where he'd fallen. So we dug the grave there and laid him into it. She watched, straight-faced, without a tear. And she said goodbye and went back into the house. It was just after sunset when we caught up with Billy. Just as the woman had said, the mule had gone ten miles and quit. Billy saw us coming, started running across the prairie on foot. His panic had made him as nearly brainless as a man could get. Look at him, Mr. Dillon. Did you ever see anything like it? He's still got a knife, Chester. Hold it, Billy. You can't get away. Right up on the other side of him, Chester. Yes, sir. You've run far enough, Billy. You'll have to shoot me, Marshal. No, we won't. Take your rope down, Chester. Good idea, sir. All right, Chester, let's rope him. We both got him. Now stay on your horse, Chester. Just keep your rope tight. No, hold, hold. I'll cut you, Marshal. Let go of the knife, no. Billy. All right, Chester, slack up a little. All right, drop your rope, Chester. I'll tie him up with no, it. No, you stay. Go on me. Hey, you're a wild one, Billy. You'll never get me back. Not alive, you won't. Never. I think we will. Let's make him walk back, Mr. Dillon. I won't walk. You can drag me, but I won't walk. Now we'll throw him across your horse, Chester. You and I can ride double till we make camp. Maybe that'll calm him down. <laughs> That Billy won't eat a thing, Mr. Dillon. He's just been crouched over there looking like a cornered animal ever since I woke him up this morning. Still pretty spooky, huh? No, oh, he sure is. Well, let's go talk to him. There, uh... There's some bacon over there, Billy, if you want it. Aren't you hungry, Billy? I didn't kill her, Marshal. Oh? You've been running awful hard for an innocent man. I didn't kill her, I tell you. Uh, we'll let the judge decide that, Billy. I was waiting for her outside, and I heard the shot. I went around, and her window was open, and she was lying there. I didn't kill her. Then why did you run, Billy? I knew you'd be after me. I had to get away. I ain't going back to Dodge. I ain't going. Yeah. All right, let's get packed up, Chester. How is he, Chester? He just keeps standing there looking out the cell bars. But he did drink some of the coffee I left him. Yeah. 
I don't know, Chester. Sometimes I think just the act of running itself makes a man afraid. The more he runs, the more panicked he gets. Anyway, it ain't healthy. A young boy like Billy... Well, maybe you'll come out of it in time. Morning, Marshal. Yes, sir. Morning, Mr. Green. Now, you're up early, Mr. Green. Well, I heard you brought Billy Dawn in last night, Marshal, so I figured I'd better turn this over to you. A six-gun? Who's this? Is? Yeah, it's Billy's gun, Marshal. I've been fixing it for him. Billy's gun? That's right, Mr. Dillon. Billy didn't have a gun, remember? How long have you had it, Mr. Green? Oh, he brought in the first day he came to town, Marshal. A cylinder was loose, been shaving lead. It's okay now. I fix it fine. You've had it all the time? Yes, sir. I was just keeping it for him until I heard he'd been arrested. I see. Uh, well, thanks, Mr. Green. I'll see that you're paid for your work. Oh, sure, Marshal. That's all right. Goodbye. Oh, uh, goodbye, Mr. Green. Mm -hmm. Looks like Billy was... Tell him the truth. Yeah. Well, you sure can't convict a man of a shooting if he didn't have a gun. No, sir. But there's that nester he killed. Yeah. And all for nothing. Yes, sir. Well, Chester, it's pretty hopeless now, but... Let's see if we can find out who did kill Kate. Probably just some thief. Heard about her money. Yeah. Probably. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Harley Bear is Chester, Georgia Ellis is Kitty, and Howard McNear is Doc. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> America's favorite miser is coming up next. It's the Jack Benny program. Now, wait a minute. Does it go like this? With beauty so near, words fail me, I fear. And this is one time I wish I could talk in rhyme An artist in love would need, it is true, a heaven above if he Oh, <laughs>
Kenny Baker granting a request from Mary's mother. Say, Kenny, I told Phil what I thought about his work in the minstrel show last Sunday, and that goes for you, too. Your blackface dialect was really great. Thanks, Jack. I didn't like it. <laughs> Why, Philbert. <laughs> and now, folks, as we announced last Sunday... Tonight, we are going to offer our version of that current 20th Century Fox picture, Girls' Dormitory. I will play the part of the hair director of the school, which was enacted by Herbert Marshall. Simone Simone's role will be played by Mary Mary. <laughs> pronounced Mary Mary. And Don Wilson will play the part of the dormitory. Now, as you folks all know, Girls' Dormitory is a story about a school for girls only. But inasmuch as we are a little short of actresses on this program, the girls will have to be played by the male members of our cast. <laughs> is that okay with you fellas? I mean, will you play the parts of girls? Sure. Sure. I will too, but I feel silly. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I think uh, we need two or three more people. Uh, say, Phil... Would any of your boys in the orchestra be willing to help out? Why, certainly, Jack. You can have my arranger. You remember Ben Blue. Oh, yes. You introduced me to him a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. Say, Ben. Oh, uh, Mr. Blue, uh, would you like to help us out in our little play this evening? Well, it's a little bit out of my line, Mr. Benny, but if everybody else is willing, I guess I can do it, too. <laughs> uh, now, you know, uh, this is a schoolroom scene. Uh, you've, uh, you've been to school, haven't you? Yes, but I never liked school very much, so I quit when I was about 35. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he doesn't have to change character. <laughs> but you'll like it in this school. Of course, you'll have to be a girl, but you don't have to change your voice, you know. Well, I don't mind as long as I don't have to change my girl. <laughs> That's fine. Now, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> who else do we need? Here? Come in. Uh, hello. Hello. Am I talking to Jig Banny? <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Uh, what can I do for you? Here's my car. Take a look and don't bend it. <laughs> Card. Um, let's see. Pat, Pat C. Flick. What's the C for? Salesman. I see. And the uh, last name is Flick. Yes, sir. Pronounced Goldberg, Goldberg. Exactly. <laughs> now, Mr. Benny, I understand you're putting on tonight a show entitled Girls' Dormatory. Yes, sir, but what's that got to do with you? I sell doormats. <laughs> Now, look here, uh, Mr. Flake, I don't need any doormats. What I need are actors. Can you act? Can I act, he's asking. <laughs> I've been a Hector since Hector was a pope. <laughs> well, look, I'll give, you, I'll give you $5 if you go into our show. What do you say? Make it seven fifty. No, 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 $5. $7.50, take it or leave it. And don't leave it. <laughs> Now, listen, I'll give you $5, and that's final. Do you want it or not? Well, give me time to think it over. I'll take it. 
Now, remember, this is girls' dormitory, so I'll call you Patricia. Call her. I'll be glad to meet her. <laughs> well, I guess we're all set then, fellas, and we'll go into our sketch immediately after the next number. Play, Phil. Five dollars. Vada chislet. <laughs> classic story coming up next. From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray in Alice Adams with Walter Connolly. <laughs> Lux presents Hollywood. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the first of the 1938 programs in your Lux Radio Theater. I say your Lux Radio Theater because it is your loyalty to our products, to Lux Toilet Soap and Lux Flakes, that makes these productions possible. We want you to know that we sincerely appreciate your enthusiastic support. Tonight, we bring you Claudette Colbert, Fred McMurray, Walter Connolly, Ann Shoemaker, and Benny Baker in Alice Adams. We also bring you, as special guest, George Harrell most famous photographer of Hollywood stars. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers. And now, here's our producer, Hollywood's internationally known director. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The praises of Claudette Colbert have been sung in many ways and by many tongues. But for sheer enthusiasm, nothing I've seen or heard approaches the verbal acrobatics of a foreign critic printed in a newspaper in Manchuria. The article reached me last week. It's a review written in English of Cleopatra, the last film in which I directed Miss Colbert. And the temptation to read a portion of it is more than I can resist. Our oriental commentator writes as follows. Quote, All that Cleopatra possesses is lavishness not only but also it contains some fine acting, especially in part of glamorous, flagrant, and competent Claudette Colbert, who makes the role as Cleopatra every inch an L. Eyeing from artistic points, this is just to get the passing mark to Boots. There is no space to hear repetition in these columns that the content of Cleopatra is too popular to insist it. You, the fans, certainly be struck all of a bump if you see the DeMille for sets of several thrilling scenes and of dancing by the Egyptian girls who swing and swirl, revolving through grand marble halls 
and on the sumptuous barge to the swish of gully slaves. Unquote. Tonight, Claudette Colbert comes to you without the swish of gully slaves. But I'm certain that her performance in the title role of Alice Adams will, to borrow a phrase, strike you all of a bump, whatever that may mean. We hear Fred McMurray in the role of Arthur Russell, which he played in the screen version. A couple of weeks ago, Fred made the first personal appearance in his motion picture career. It occurred in San Francisco in connection with the opening of his new picture, True Confession. It was a triumphant event, quite a contrast to Fred's last appearance eight years ago in that same theater. Then, as a member of the California Collegians, his performance consisted of impersonating a seal in a vaudeville act. Today, the man who barked for a fish ranks among Paramount's most popular stars. As Virgil Adams, we are proud to present Mr. Walter Connolly, long distinguished on the legitimate stage as well as in films. His presence here is all the more interesting in that Mr. Connolly is the first prominent performer to have been cast in that much-talked-of film, Gone with the Wind. Also from the original cast of Alice Adams is Anne Shoemaker, resuming the part of Mrs. Adams, while Benny Baker of Paramount Studios plays Walter. Our play is taken from the RKO film, based on the Pulitzer Prize novel by one of America's most beloved authors, Booth Tarkington. RKO Studios will shortly release what promises to be one of the outstanding pictures of the new year, bringing up Baby, starring Katherine Hepburn and Cary Grant. And now... The Lux Radio Theater opens its season for 1938, presenting Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray in Alice Adams with Walter Connolly. bedroom of a small house in New England. In the bed, propped up by pillows, is Virgil Adams. He's a worn, gray-haired man with wistful eyes and an ordinarily friendly smile. But the smile's not in evidence at the moment, for he's gazing distastefully at a bowl of soup on a tray. His wife enters with a saucer of soda crackers. Is there anything else you want, Virgil? Why, Virgil, you're not eating your soup. I don't want it. Oh, but you must eat it. Well, you got to get your strength back, you know. Uh, Let me fix your pillows, dear. you got to get good and strong so as you can get around and find some really good business to get into. So that's it. Hinting at that again. Oh, I'm not doing any hinting, Virgil. But, of course, when you get well, you mustn't go back to that old hole again. Old hole, is it? Now, let me tell you that Lamb's is the best wholesale drug company in the state. Well, I don't care what it is. It's just an old hole as far as you're concerned. And if you don't owe it to me to look for something different, at least show it to your children. Mother? Yes, I'm coming. You look at your daughter. Going to a big party tonight, and she's got to wear a dress that's two years old. What? Well, how do you expect her to get anywhere? It... All right, all right. You just remember what I said, Virgil. I'd like to know uh, how I could forget it. You've been saying that for... Oh, Mother. What? For heaven's sake, Mother, can't you wait until Father's up and around before you start to nag him? I don't nag him. Besides, I think, Alice, that I ought to know by this time how to handle your father. Yes, but, Mother... Well, then you handle him if you're so good at it. Go on in and see what you can do. Oh. Hello, Daddy. Oh, hello, Alice. How are you? Come in. Oh, all right. Oh, poor Daddy. Every time he's better, someone talks him into getting mad, and he has a relapse. It's a shame. Well, it's kind of funny for a man who's been in business with Lamb and Company as long as I have to hear it called an old hole. That's what your mother calls it. Why, it's a mighty pleasant place to work. Yes, but, Father, it's just that Mother feels that they don't appreciate you there. Well, they've heisted my salary every two years all the time I've worked for them. And they took your brother Walter right on as soon as I asked them last year. And old Mr. Lamb has been wonderful to me, holding my job open while I've been sick all this time. Don't you think that looks as if they thought something of me? Oh, of course they do. It's just that it's kind of funny. When you think you've done fairly well, and the men at the office seem to think so, too, it's kind of funny to have some folks think you're mostly a failure. You're not a failure, Father. You're not. I'm going to talk to Mother. No, no, you'd better not. I didn't mean to start anything. Don't worry, you didn't. 
Mother, I'm in the kitchen. Oh. Can I help you set the table? If you want. Mother, don't you think we're both a little selfish trying to make Father go out and look for something better? Now, after all, we've got enough. Enough? I suppose you have a limousine to take you to the dance tonight. And I suppose you've only to call the florist and order up some orchids. <laughs> oh, no. Not orchids, Mother. I like violets much better. I picked a whole bouquet in the park. The first of the season. Hmm. I suppose you picked yourself a new dress, too. My organdy dress looks like new with those flounces you put on it. What's Mildred Palmer going to wear tonight? Oh, I don't know. Her, her maid's Georgette, probably. Yes, the one she brought from Paris. Yes. Hello. Oh, there's your brother. Mother, are you sure he's going to take me to the dance tonight? Why, of course. Why shouldn't he? Oh, you know, Walter, he may have one of his mysterious dates oh, downtown. Don't you worry, Alice. You just leave him to me. I'll go speak to him. Hello, Walter. Hello, and supper ready? Now, Walter, there's no hurry. Yes, for me, I got a date. Well, I'm so glad you remembered Mildred Palmer's dance, dear. What? I've laid out your clothes for you. Listen, I told you a week ago I wasn't going to that old dance. Oh, but, Walter... Don't Walter me. I'm no society snake. I'm just as liable to go to that Palmer dance as I am to eat a couple of barrels of broken glass. Oh, but, Walter, you've Let got Alice to... get somebody else to take her. She ought to be able to get one man, I should think. She tries hard enough. Oh, be quiet, dear. She'll hear you. Oh, I now, haven't got to... any time to argue. I'll grab a bite to eat now. You can't do this, Walter. You can't. Now, it's more than I can bear to see her disappointed when she's planned it for days. Why, she spent hours in Bellevue Park this afternoon gathering violets to wear because, well, she can't afford to buy a decent bouquet like the other girls. And now, now you act this way. Oh, blub. All right, I guess I'll have to go. Oh, that's a good boy, darling. You'll never be sorry. That's what you think. Let me know when dinner's ready, will you? <sighs> oh, Alice. It's all right, dear. Is it? Why, what's the matter? Nothing. But, dear, it's all right. Walter will be glad to take you. <laughs> yes, he sounded like it. <laughs> You want to go to that dance or don't you? Coming. Well, come on. What are you doing up there? Admiring yourself in the mirror? Just a minute. What did you say, Mr. Jones? Oh, well, just two dances. That's all you may have, and that's all for you, too, Mr. Robbins. What? <laughs> oh, you naughty boys. Why don't you dance with the other girl? Oh, you naughty, naughty boy. Walter. Why didn't you get one of those make-believe guys you're always talking to to take you tonight instead of dragging me? Ah, oh, you know you just love to escort your little sister. How do I look? Just about the same. Come on, let's... Well, what's it going to be this time? What do you mean? Well, do we dance again, sit it out again, or walk around the garden again? I'm sorry if you're not enjoying it, Walter. Well, I'll bet you are. Of course I am. Don't give me that. If I wasn't here, you'd be pasted right over there against the wall. The only one who said a word to you, old Michael's a door man. Walter, please. Oh, Walter, you say the funniest thing. Oh, cut it out. Nobody's watching you. Look, there's Mildred Palmer. So I said, well, if you must dance, try to step on your own feet. <laughs> hello, Mildred. Oh, hello. I just love your party, Mildred. Thank you. Well, anyway, when he came back, there was no use trying Boy, to... Boy, she was oh, certainly okay. glad to see you here. Uh, I guess she was busy. Yeah. Look, I want to grab a smoke. Can't you flag one of those other guys to take you on for the next? You can't leave me yet, Walter. You just can't. Well, I can't stand here either. My feet are sprouting roots. See you later. Walter! Walter! Oh, please, Walter. Good evening, Alice. Hello, Mrs. Dresser. Are you looking for someone? Yes, my brother. Um, um, my escort. May I sit down here, Mrs. Dresser? Why, yes, but why aren't you dancing? Oh, I have been. I just want a chance to catch my breath. <laughs> oh, who's that? Who? That that tall young man over there. I've never seen him around before. <laughs> I thought I knew all the handsome young men. That one is Arthur Russell. Russell? I, I don't believe... He's Mildred Palmer's cousin. A distant one, I believe. Cousin? Well, that's funny. Mildred's my intimate friend, and she never even mentioned him. That is funny, because they're engaged to be married. Oh. Or almost engaged, anyway. Oh. Oh, Alice. Alice. Yes, Mildred. Come along, Arthur. Alice, this is Mr. Russell. He wants to ask you for this dance. What? Oh, I, I mean... Are you interested? 
Why, well, well, yes. Oh, yes, I believe I am. Excuse us, please. You're not a very talkative young lady, are you? Usually, yes. And then why not now? Oh, when anyone dances as well as you do, conversation is scarcely necessary, is it? <laughs> that depends on who's talking. Oh, now, really, Mr. Russell, you can't mean me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's all. Well, I, I wish we could dance this next together, but I guess we're both all booked up. Where's your next? Do you see him anywhere? Well, my next? Oh, yes, my next. Yeah. Well, well, as a matter of fact, I promised to sit out this next one with, with my aunt. Oh, I'll take you to her. Where is she? No, 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 no. Don't bother, please. But you could do something. Anything. Will you see if you can find my brother Walter for me? He may be in the smoking room if it isn't too much trouble. No, certainly not. I'll bring him back with me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mildred, what, Ella? Where's Arthur? You haven't lost him to that little wallflower, have you? <laughs> Hardly. She did look pathetic sitting there alone. I really felt sorry for her. <laughs> oh, Miss Adams, I found him. Oh, thank you. Walter, where have you been? Thank you so much, Mr. Russell. <laughs> Not at all. It was a pleasure, Miss Adams. Thank you for the dance. <laughs> Don't ever do that again, understand? Uh, do what, Walter? Send somebody to find me. He found me all right, shooting dice with the boys in the cloakroom. Oh, Walter, did he see you? Unless he was blind. Oh, Walter. Oh, Walter. Well, what? <laughs> Nothing. I want to go home. <laughs> thinking about? Oh, just planning. Planning what to do when I'm able to go to work again. Well, what are you talking about? You're going back to your old place at Lamb's, of course. I... I heard you crying last night after the party. Oh, that was nothing. <laughs> just nerves, Daddy. Never mind, Alice. I know what was the matter. The only matter was I had a silly fit. It did me good, too. How's that? Because I've decided to do something about it. I guess it's my place to do something about it. Your mother's right, Alice. You ought to have as much as any of these girls you go with. Oh, darling, you. But uh, what I've been thinking... Well, I mean... I ought to be something besides just a kind of nobody. I ought to... What, darling? Well... <laughs> there's one thing I'd like to do. I'm sure I could do it, too. What's that? Uh... I want to go on the stage. I know I could act. <laughs> well, what's the matter? <laughs> well, I was just reminded of your Aunt Flora and your mother when they were young. They always used to spat about which one would make the best actresses. <laughs> Sometimes I had to go out in the hall to laugh. <laughs> oh, really? But then I expect 90% of the women are sure they'd make mighty fine actresses if they ever got the chance. Yes. <laughs> yes, I... Oh, so. Wait, what's the matter, Alice? Oh, nothing. Nothing. I, I, I've got to go downtown now. Now, you just stop worrying, darling. You're going back to land and everything's going to be all right. You'll see. I hope so. I sure hope so. You, uh, say you want to be a secretary, huh? Yes, I haven't had any experience, but I could learn. Well, we're just an agency, but if anything turns up, I'll let you know. Oh, thank you. Why, Mr. Russell! This is a coincidence. I've been hoping I'd meet you. Are you thinking of getting a job? What? Oh, oh, heavens, no. No, I've... I've got to hire a new secretary for my father. He's been quite ill, the poor man. But now that he's better and going back to business, he'll need a second girl. Oh. Uh, may I take you someplace? Well, I was going home. Well, that's fine. I'll take you home. You know, I've been thinking about you ever since Mildred's dance. <laughs> Goodness, I think I know what you've been thinking. <laughs> Are you a mind reader? You've been thinking that I'm the sister of a professional gambler, I'm afraid. <laughs> then your brother told you, huh? Very original, I thought, his uh, amusing himself with the cloakroom attendants. Yes, yes, that uh, Walter is original. He's a very odd boy. I was afraid you'd misunderstand. 
He tells wonderful darky stories, and he'll do anything to get them to talk to him. We think he'll probably write about them someday. He's rather literary. Are you? I... Oh. Oh, oh I'm just me. You know, you are different. From whom? Are you at your mind reading again? Here. Yeah. You know, I thought you were this sort of girl the very first moment I saw you. What sort of girl? Didn't Mildred tell you what sort of girl I am when she asked you to dance with me? Well, she didn't ask you to dance with me. That was my idea. Oh, it... But who did she tell you I was? She just said you were a Miss Adams. A Miss Adams? Oh, I see. Well, it certainly is unfortunate that I am so different from Mildred. Why unfortunate? <laughs> because she's perfect. Why, she's perfectly perfect. Oh, yes, we all fairly adore her. She's like some big, noble, cold statue, way above the rest of us. And she hardly ever does anything mean or treacherous. Yet of all the girls I know, I believe she's played the fewest really petty tricks. You say Mildred's perfect, but... Uh... That she does do some petty tricks? <laughs> oh, that is so funny. Of course, girls all do mean things sometimes. My own career is just one long, brazen smirch of them. <laughs> Not really. What, for instance? Oh, the very worst kind. Most people bore me, particularly the men in this town, and I show it. It made me a terribly unpopular character. For instance, at the average party, I'd a lot rather find a clever old woman and talk to her than dance with nine-tenths of these non at Oh, but you dance as if you liked it. Or you dance better than any other girl at the party. Oh, thank you, Mr. Russell. Well, I, I ought to dance well when I think of my dancing teachers. All sorts of fancy instructors. I suppose... I suppose that's what daughters have fathers for, though, isn't it? To throw money away on them. Did you take it up seriously? No, no, I've never had that particular name yet. Oh, but you ought to have seen me when I had stage fever. <laughs> you know, every girl has a time in her life she's positive, she's divinely talented as an actress. <laughs> yes, I, I used to play Juliet all alone in my room... Daddy used to make such fun of me. Oh, thank heaven I was only 15. I was all over it by the next year. Well, uh, here's our house. Oh. It's a queer little place, isn't it? But my father's so attached to it, the family have about given up hope of getting him to build a real house farther out. He doesn't mind our being extravagant about anything else, but he won't let us alter one single thing about his precious little old house. <laughs> oh, well, uh, and you? I, uh... Couldn't I come in for a little while? Oh, no, not now. I... You, you can come. When? Almost any time. You, you can come in the evening if you like. Soon? As soon as you like. Thank you. I'll, I'll make it very soon. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh. Oh, dear. <laughs> moment, we will go on with the second act of Alice Adams, starring Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray with Walter Connolly. But now, in this brief intermission, we would like you to listen in with us on a home in Beverly Hills, where a wedding is underway. Jane, a popular debutante, is going to be married, and her bridesmaids are gathered together, waiting to start for the church. Oh, I hope I can't do the Please, 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 I wonder how Bob is bearing up. Well, it was a good race while it lasted. It certainly was close. <laughs> I must say that rival of hers put up a good fight. Oh, really? Well, <laughs> you couldn't tell from where I sat who was winning. I didn't know it was Jane until I saw her picture in the announcement in the morning paper. <laughs> well, I knew all along it would be Jane. Myra's a lamb, but cosmetic skin. Well, that never struck a romantic chord in any man's heart. <laughs> You're right. Myra just couldn't compete with Jane's lovely skin. A knockout complexion like hers gets the men every time. The little bridesmaid is right. Lovely skin wins out every time. What a pity some women don't realize it, especially when it's so easy to keep complexions clear and smooth with Lux Toilet Soap. Its active lather removes dust and dirt, stale rouge and powder thoroughly. It's when pores become choked that those tiny blemishes and enlarged pores appear. Cosmetic skin develops. Nine out of ten screen stars use Lux Toilet Soap to protect their complexions. And now, Mr. DeMille sets the scene for the next act of our play. Alice Adams, starring Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray with Walter Connolly, continues. Three weeks have gone by. To Alice's amazement, Arthur Russell has paid her several visits. And basking in the sun of his attention, the little wallflower is beginning to blossom. He's expected again this evening... In the living room of the shabby little house, 
Mrs. Adams is off once more on her favorite topic. It's money, that's all. If you could dress like the other girls dress and Arthur Russell could see you then, well, there's no telling what might happen. I've tried to make your father understand that. But... Mother, what could father do at his age? Well, he could do what I've been wanting him to do for 20 years. Now, he's forbidden me to speak of it, Alice, but you may as well know. Your father has a secret formula for making the best glue in the world. The best what? Glue. For sticking things together. He and another man invented it years ago when your father first went to work at Lamb's. The other man's dead now, and that formula belongs to your father. At least it belongs to him as much as anybody else. Well, even if it does, what good is it? Can he sell it? No. But he could start up a factory and make the glue and sell that. Oh, nonsense, Mother. Why, it would take more money than Father ever saw to start a factory. Well, maybe it wouldn't. Maybe it wouldn't. And I'm going to speak to him just the same. I'm not asking anything of you that you can't do. Now, just a minute. What are you driving at? You know what I'm driving at. That glue formula. So that's it. Dang, dang, dang. You wouldn't care if your child dried up into a miserable old maid. Why, she's still young. She has a chance for happiness. If only she had a father who had gumption enough to be a man. Be a dirty dog, you mean? That glue formula belongs to you as much as it does to anybody. It belongs to J.A. Lamb. He paid us all the time we were working on it. It'd be like stealing, and you know it. And what's he stolen from you? Twenty years ago, he promised to do something with that formula, to take you into partnership with him, and has he done it? Has he? You've broken your word never to speak to that of me again. Oh, what do I care for my word? Do you suppose I'll let my word keep me from struggling for a little happiness for my children? Well, I'll struggle for that till I die. Your daughter's sitting out there on the porch right now with a young man who's just asked me to go to Henrietta's party with him. How do you know? I heard him. And you know what she said? She said no, because she had to stay close to home because you were sick. But what she meant was, I can't go because I haven't been invited, because I haven't any clothes, because we're poor, poor. <laughs> Mother, Daddy, for heaven's sake, what's the matter? Alice, can you get her out of here? Oh, Daddy, please, Mother. Wait. Alice, come here. She says you have a mean life. Is that right? I know, Father. Do you hear a lie? Look at me, Alice. Things like this Henrietta Lamb party now. Is that so hard to bear? No, no, Father. You hear her? She's lying. She's afraid to hurt you. All right, all right. I'll open the glue factory. If it takes every penny we have, I'll open it. But heaven help us if it doesn't pay, that's all. Now get out of here. Both of them. Get out of here. <laughs> Shall we sit this one out, Alice? Oh, yes, please. Oh, it was so nice of you to bring me here. I think public dances are so much more interesting than those stodgy private affairs, don't you? Of course they are. <sighs> what are you thinking of? I don't know. I think I was being sort of sadly happy just then. Sadly happy? Don't you know? Only children can be just happily happy. I think when we get older, our happiest moments are like this one. It's like that music. Oh, so sweet, but so sad. But what makes it sad for you? I don't know. Perhaps the kind of useless foreboding I seem to have pretty often. I'm afraid I'll miss these summer evenings with you when they're over. Do they have to be over? <laughs> oh, everything's over sometime, isn't it? Why should they be? Oh, good heaven. There's a laconic eloquence. Uh, almost a proposal in a single word. What? Well, uh, I didn't, uh, I mean... Oh, never mind. I shall hold you to it. No, something will interfere. Somebody will, I mean. People talk about one another fearfully in this town. Oh, no. I... And they don't stop at the truth. They make up things. <laughs> yes, they really do. <laughs> well, what difference does it all make? It's just that I'd, I'd rather they didn't make up things about me to you. I'd know they weren't true. Oh, but you must be careful not to mix up the girl you might hear somebody talking about. With the me, I honestly try to make you see. If you do, all this will be spoiled. It's so easy to spoil anything that's pleasant. We won't let that happen. Wouldn't it be pleasant if two people could just keep themselves to themselves? I mean, if they could manage to be friends without people talking about them. Well, we've done pretty well about that so far. And if you want our summer evenings to be over... 
You'll have to drive me away yourself. Nobody else could? No. Well, I won't. Oh, Alice. Oh, you, you kissed me. I, I couldn't help it. Did you mind? Oh, no. Well, I, I mean... Well, no. Going out with Mr. Russell again tonight? Mm-hmm. As soon as I finish the dishes. Oh, that's nice. Do you know, Alice, I think it's time your father and I showed some interest in Mr. Russell. Why, well, I actually don't believe he's ever been inside the house. No, he hasn't. We've always sat out on the porch. It's so much nicer. Well, I was thinking we could hardly put off asking him to dinner or something much longer. Oh, Mother, must we? Well, don't you see? It looks so queer not to do something. It looks so kind of poverty-stricken. Very well. I'll ask him if you think I've got to. We can get that colored girl in, Melina Burns, and she can serve for us. And you can get flowers for the table and put some in the living room, and we'll have a nice dinner. Something real stylish. Oh, please, Mother. Can't, can't we just wait for a while? But, Alice, why should we? Unless you don't want Mr. Russell to meet your father and mother. Oh, no. No, it isn't that, only... Oh, what's the use? Well, Alice, what do you mean? I don't know. He's so honestly what he is. Just simple and good and intelligent. I feel like a tricky mess beside him. I don't see why he likes me. Sometimes I'm afraid he wouldn't if he really knew me. Oh, darling, he'd just worship you. I know he would. Oh, Mother, you're sweet. <laughs> Well, sit down, Arthur. You're certainly a stranger around here these days. I'm sorry, Mildred. I, I've been pretty busy. You'll stay for dinner, Arthur. Well, I'd like to, Aunt Madge, but I, I have a dinner engagement already. Oh, I see. Oh, what's the difference? Look, Arthur, I've just been making up a list of guests for my garden party. I wonder if I ought to invite Alice Adams. Huh? Well, you remember her. You danced with her. Here. Oh, uh, oh, yes. A rather too conspicuous young woman, the Adams girl. I wonder if what they're saying about her father is true. I imagine it must be. Well, uh, what is it? Oh, nothing much. Just that I heard that this Virgil Adams had stolen some kind of glue formula from Mr. Lamb. Stolen it? Yes. It's quite upset Mr. Lamb, too. Mr. Adams has been his clerk for over 25 years. And Mr. Lamb has been carrying him and his son Walter along, even though they've been dead weight to the firm. And then, to show his gratitude, Mr. Adams walked off with a blue formula. Oh, well, I suppose you have to expect those things from people like the Adams. I don't think I'll ask her mother. I wouldn't if I were you. A pushing sort of girl, a very pushing little person. Oh, but I'm afraid all this is rather boring to Arthur. What? Huh? Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I, uh, I was just thinking about something. <laughs> Melina, as soon as the doorbell rings, you answer it. Now, that'll be Mr. Russell. You take his hat and show him in the living room. Yes, um... And then you go right out in the kitchen and you bring in the hors d'oeuvres. Uh, uh, the what, Miss Adams? The hors d'oeuvres. Uh, yes, um... And, Melina, you remember to have the... Mother! Oh, my goodness. Yes, dear? Coming, dear? What's the matter? Mother, it's almost seven. He'll be here soon. Well, I know, dear, but everything's ready. And, Mother, for heaven's sake, will you ask Melina to take the chewing gum out of her mouth before she serves? Yes, dear, I'll tell her about it right now. Alice, will you fix this collar for me? I never could get into a boiled shirt. Oh, Daddy, it's all wilted already. Well, I can't help it. It's hot tonight. Now, 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 stand still. Say, what's that smell? Is it fashionable to have cabbage for company dinner? That isn't cabbage. It's Brussels sprouts. What are they? Oh, there's the bell. Melina! Melina! Now, where is she? What was that? I don't know. It sounded like something... Mother! Mother! Oh, dear. Mother! Oh, it's all right, dear. Everything's all right. What was that noise? Well, Melina fell down the cellar step. Oh. But she's all right, dear. <gasps> I'll answer it myself. No, dear, no. I'll go down. Now, you hurry down, Virgil. All right. Give me a chance. Well. Good evening. 
Oh, do come right in, Mr. Russell. I'm Mrs. Adams, and I'm so glad to receive you informally this way in our own little home. Thank you. I'm afraid you'll think it's almost too informal, my coming to the door, but unfortunately our maid just had a little accident. Oh. Uh, sit down, Mr. Russell. Thank you. It's been quite warm today, hasn't it? Why, uh, yes. Uh, but... The only person I know who doesn't mind the heat the way other people do is Alice, but then she's so amiable, she never minds anything. It's just her character. Mm -hmm. I think character is the most important thing in the world, after all, don't you, Mr. Russell? Oh, uh, yes, Mrs. Adams. Mm -hmm. Why, here's Alice now. Mother, do you suppose... Oh, Mr. Russell, how do you do? Hello, Alice. Oh, how terrible of me to be so late coming down. <coughs> oh, well, come in, Father. This is my father, Mr. Russell. Well, how do you do, Mr. Adams? Oh, uh, how are you? Well, I guess dinner's more than ready. We'd better go sit down. No, no, not yet, Virgil. Eh? What's that? Oh, it's, uh, it's Melina. She had a little accident before. Come in, Melina. Does anybody want some of these here things? What's these? Sandwiches? Before dinner? I do have some of these up there, Mr. Russell. Uh, thank you. Father, you'll have some? All right, I'll try anything once. Oh, Father. <laughs> oh, it's too bad we can't offer you what ought to go with this, Mr. Russell, but we never have any liquor in the house. Father's a teetotaler. <coughs> Father, what's the matter? Supper's ready. Come and get it. <laughs> oh, oh, dinner. <laughs> Come along, Mr. Russell. Uh, thank you. Uh, I hope you won't hate us for making you dine with us in such fearful weather. Oh, I'm nearly dying of the heat myself, so you have a fellow sufferer if that pleases you. Will you sit there, Mr. Russell? Yes, thank you. Where's Walter? Oh, poor Walter. He's probably been delayed at the office. Really, Father, you shouldn't permit him to work so hard, particularly in weather like this. But that boy's so ambitious, I suppose you simply can't stop him. Who, Walter? Why, yes. Yeah. You mean our Walter? <laughs> I never thought that. I do have some bread, Mr. Russell. Thank you. Melina, will you please take this soup away? It's much too warm for soup this evening. I'm really surprised you even thought of it. Yes, and I was too, but, but Miss Adams... Well, you can take uh, mine too, please. Uh, yes. Uh, how unfortunate we didn't have something iced and jellied instead. I'm afraid we let the servants do too much as they like, Mother. Perhaps we should get new ones. Servants are such a problem for us, Mr. Russell. Oh, is that so? Do you want some of this, Miss Adams? Oh, Thank you, Melina. Do you want some, Miss Adams? What is it? Brussels sprouts, dear. Oh, so these are Brussels sprouts, eh? Well, they certainly smell up the house. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, it is warm, isn't it? Oh, what a funny thing weather is. Now, yesterday it was cool. <laughs> the angle that shot is it, shot is it, I guess. Oh, dear. Will you have some more coffee, Mr. Russell? Thank you. Then what's happened to the ice cream, Alice? It's all soupy. Oh, you know, Father simply must have a heavy meal in the evening. He works so hard in his terrible old factory. Oh, terrible new factory, I should say. And he needs lots of food to keep his strength up. I don't see why businessmen can't leave most of the detail to their secretaries. Secretaries, Alice? You know, I may be needing one of them soon. Never thought I'd one day be having one of my own. Sort of gives man a feeling of importance, don't it? <laughs> Won't you have some more coffee, Mr. Russell? I, uh, I just had some, thank you. Oh, yes, of course. <gasps> what the... Why, why, it's Walter. Come in. You remember Mr. Russell? Oh, I said... Come here, Pop. i got to speak to you. Pardon me. I guess my boy wants to see me. Pardon me, Mr. Russell. Oh, now, what was all that, I wonder? Oh, Walter's such a funny boy. He's so abrupt and unexpected. But, of course, you know that about him, Mr. Russell. I suppose all talented people are a bit peculiar. It's part of their charm, really. I tell you, Pop, I just gotta have that dough. Now, don't say you got that. I tell you, I ain't got it. Perhaps well, I'd better go and see if Walter's had his dinner. You'll excuse me, won't you? Uh, certainly. Well, we seem to be left alone. Shall we go out on the porch? If you want. Please sit down. Thank you. Oh, dear, cheer up. Your fearful duty's almost done. You can run home as soon as you want to. What? That's what you're dying to do. Oh, not at all. You're upset about something. Well, not at all. <laughs> What's the matter, little boy? Tell Alice. Nothing. Nothing's the matter. Of course, one is rather affected by such weather as this. 
We make one little more quiet than usual. Maybe it's this ugly little house. Maybe it's the furniture or Mother's vases that upset you. Or was it Mother herself or Father? Nothing upset me. You say that because you're too kind or too conscientious or too embarrassed or anyhow, too something to tell me. I wonder if they haven't done it after all. I don't understand. I wonder who has been talking about me to you after all. Isn't that it? Well, not at all. Oh, please don't say not at all again. You're not good at deceiving. I'm not deceiving. I... No, never mind. Do you remember saying that nothing anybody else could do would ever keep you from coming here? That, that if you left me, it would be because I drove you away myself. Yes, it was true. But I haven't driven you away. And it's gone. I don't know what you mean. Oh, you know, I have the strangest feeling... I feel as if I'm going to be with you only about five minutes more in all the rest of my life. Why, no. Uh, Of course I'm coming to see you often. No. I've never had a feeling like this before. It's just so, that's all. I'm never coming here again. Why, it's finished, isn't it? Why, it's all over, isn't it? Yes. Alice, I'm afraid you're awfully tired and nervous. I, I really ought to be going. Yes, of course you are. There's nothing else for you to do. When anything is spoiled, people can't do anything else but run away from it. Goodbye. Well, at least we'll only only say good night. Oh, you don't need it. Now, 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 there's no use wailing about it. I couldn't help what I tell you. Oh, Walter, Walter. Don't look so startled, Mr. Russell. We have lots of little arguments in this house. It all comes under the heading of a happy family life. Alice, Alice, listen. Oh, please go, please. Don't make it any worse than it is. You know what I am. You, you know that everything I've said and everything I've done has been a lie. I'm just nothing, a nobody. I don't blame you for running away. <laughs> we pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. In this intermission, before raising the curtain on the third act of Alice Adams, we hear from George Farrell. Every picture studio has its own staff of portrait photographers. But when they want really exceptional portraits, they call in Harrell. They've come to him in the past few weeks alone from MGM, Paramount, Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, and Selznick International. In Hollywood, they say that Harrell is to a portrait camera what Rembrandt was to paint and canvas. Suppose, Mr. Harrell, someone like the Alice Adams of our play walks into your studio for a sitting. A girl who's a wallflower. What can you do to help such a girl? Well, Mr. DeMille, let's forget the camera for a moment and get into a little elementary psychology. The difference between a wallflower and a girl who's always surrounded by admirers is a matter of personality. One is neutral, uninteresting. The other is vibrant, attractive. That's not news to anyone. But what may be news is the fact that a good photograph can take the wallflower type of girl and definitely bring out what she herself has failed to discover. It can make that neutral personality glamorous, alluring, beautiful. Very nice words, George, but exactly how is this done? Well, to begin with, Mr. DeMille, I'd spend a lot of time with with an Alice Adams type of girl before placing her near a camera. I'd try to show her how to dress properly and attractively, how to wear her hair, how to walk, and how to stand. Little things that create grace and charm. I can see that you who take pictures face the same problem as we who make pictures. That's right, Mr. DeMille. And the similarity continues. Most of our picture stars are not technically perfect. Some will have a square jaw or a cleft chin or any one of a dozen minor imperfections. But instead of denying them, they do just the opposite. Through proper makeup clothes and hairdress, they turn those little flaws into definite assets that spell individuality. In such a group, I'd place your own new star, Francesca Gall, Catherine Hepburn, Betty Davis, Marion Hopkins, and they are only a few. It's character, you see, that makes both a good portrait and a movie star. Character is intangible, but through the skillful use of three things available to every photographer, 
you can definitely make every portrait an interesting and compelling character study. Those three things are careful lighting, composition, and emphasis on skin texture. Skin that is properly photographed gives a lifelike effect that nothing else can duplicate. So you see, complexion is part of my business. I've asked many questions about it. And I can safely say that Lux soap is by far the favorite method used by Hollywood stars to keep their complexions in perfect condition. And I can recommend it to our listeners because I've had close contact with its splendid results during the ten years I've been in Hollywood. Now, we're grateful for your advice, George. But after all, you must have certain little tricks all your own that make your pictures so outstanding. Why don't you break down and tell us a couple of Harrell camera secrets? Well, a photographer must learn exactly when to snap the button that takes the picture. He shouldn't be afraid to spend hours in experiment, and on the other hand, if he gets what he wants quickly, he should have enough confidence in himself to stop. I once took 72 pictures of Wallace Berry in 45 minutes. I've also found that music can be very helpful in establishing mood, again proving the importance of psychology. I have a phonograph playing all the time during uh, sitting and during the time I'm taking a portrait. The music will range from hot jazz to a Beethoven symphony. Whatever happens to best fit the individual and bring out a quality that otherwise might not register. Then I'll do some really crazy things. I'll scream, whisper, kick a chair over, dance, fall on my face, almost anything to make the face of my subject come across with the exact expression I want. But I never let go of the ball that snaps the picture. There's the method in my madness, and there you have it. If you don't mind making a fool of yourself, you're apt to get some pretty good results. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, George. Good night. Back to Claudette Colbert, Fred McMurray, and Walter Connolly in Alice Adams. It's the same evening, just a few minutes later. Leaving Arthur on the porch, Alice ran back into the house, to the living room, where the family argument is still raging. Oh, Walter, Walter, how could you do it? Well, I asked Dad for the money last week, but he wouldn't give it to me. Give it to you? Where was I going to get it? Father, Mother, what's the matter? What's happened? Walter's short in his accounts down at Lanch. He, he took a hundred and fifty dollars. hundred and fifty dollars? Why? What for? Well, a guy, a friend of mine, he got in a jam, and he said he'd pay me back before the end of the month, but he didn't, and the auditor's already started on the books down at the office. Oh, Walter, you can't go to jail. You can't. Oh, wait, Mother, Mother, don't be so upset. Perhaps Mr. Lamb won't prosecute. Him? Him not prosecute? Why, that's just what he's been waiting for all the time. He thinks I cheated him. He was just letting Walter walk right into a trap. But if you raised the money and paid it back? Oh, I'll pay him back, all right. Every cent. Every last penny. I can raise it. I'll, I'll put a loan on my factory. Well, I'm sorry, Dad. Don't you talk to me, you little idiot. Oh, don't, Virgil. Poor Virgil. Poor Walter. And to have this come on the night of your sister's dinner. Oh, poor, poor Alice. Don't say poor Alice. I'm all right. Oh, oh no, Mother. Oh, hush. Please don't, dear. The police. What? Quiet. Shh. I'll answer it. Now, you stay right here, all of you, no matter what it is. I'll take care of this myself. Who? Who is it? This is J.A. Lamb. Mr. Lamb? Hello, Adams. Hello, Mr. Lamb. Well, can I come in? Yes, yes, sure. Come in. I want to talk to you. Yes. Yes, me too. Sit down. I'll stand, thank you. I wouldn't even have set foot in this house except that I wanted to tell you to your face just how I felt. A fine family you turned out to be after all these years. I'll pay you back every cent Walter took, Mr. Lamb, just as soon as I can get the money. I was just going down now to try and raise a loan on... On my glue works. Your glue works? Huh. I always thought you had to show people some business prospects to raise a loan. Naturally. Well, you may find that just a little difficult. Especially now that I'm starting a glue works of my own. What's that? Yes, indeed. And very convenient to your place, too. Fact is, it's right across the street. Twice as big and twice as modern. You? You? You ruined me. Well, what did you expect me to do, Virgil Adams? Let you walk off with that formula like swallowing a pat of butter? Oh, I know what you thought. 
You said to yourself, here's this old fool, J.A. Lamb. He's in his second childhood, and I can put this thing over on him. I did not. I worked years on that formula. It was just as much mine as yours. What's that? And, 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 and anyway, a lot you know about my feelings and what I said to myself. But there's one thing I want to say to you right now. I don't feel mean anymore about what I've done. Because there's a meaner man in the world than I am. And that man is you, Mr. Lamb. You've spiked my business, all right. Now I can't even raise the money to keep my son out of the penitentiary. That's what you wanted, wasn't it? Are you accusing me of... Look at me. Look at me. I worked all my life for you. And what I did when I quit didn't make two cents worth of difference in your life. And it looks like it'd mean all the difference in the world to my family. You think I did you a bad turn. And now you've got me ruined for it. And my family ruined. And if anybody had told me last year that I'd have said such a thing, I'd have called him a dang liar. But I do say it, Mr. Lane. I do say it. You're a doggone mean man. Father, stop, please. You'll be sick again. No, I won't. I, I, I got to tell him what I think. No, Father, uh, please. Now, go upstairs, darling. Go on. No, no, go let, on. Me, let me, let me go. Let me, it's, it's all right. He's got me ruined, and all of us ruined. If it has, it serves you right. He's a doggone mean man. Now, look here. You do, you... Mr. Lamb, please. Please, just a moment. I don't want you to leave thinking too badly of Father. He couldn't have meant what he said just now. I... I just... He's so overwrought that he just lost his head. Overwrought? Well, I shouldn't wonder, that danged old fool. Yes, I guess he is an old fool. What's that? For listening to us. Mother and me. Oh, it's all my fault. This whole terrible mess. All my fault. Now, look here, young woman. I, I guess maybe you're a bit overwrought yourself. No, I'm not. I'm all right. I'm just talking the truth for once. What are you talking about? You see, Mr. Lamb... Mother was always after Father and after him to make more money for me so that I could have lovely things like other girls. Well, like your granddaughter, Henrietta, Mr. Lamb. I guess parents will make any sacrifice to see their children happy. And when Father saw how unhappy I was, he, he did what he did. Oh, he always wanted to go back to work for you. I guess he almost worshipped you, Mr. Lamb. And if he had, Mr. Lamb, Walter didn't steal that money. He just borrowed it. Oh, he did? Yes. To help a friend who was in trouble. Well, I guess. Oh, Mr. Lamb, if you'll give us just a little time, I'll get a job and pay you back what Walter owes you. Really, I will. I know I haven't much, had much experience, but I can do things. I was good at arithmetic and English in school. I, I won a prize in English once. And I'd make a good secretary for someone. I'm much more sensible about things now. But if you'll only give us a little time, will you, Mr. Lamb? Please. Alice, that, that father of yours, he, he did me an injustice tonight. I never meant to hurt nobody, and he knows it. Well, of course he does. But I... Well, I guess maybe I've been in the wrong, too. I lost my head. Never knew that blue formula meant so much to him. I wouldn't hurt nobody, Alice, and I never even thought of prosecuting Walter. I know. Now, your father and I, we, 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 we've been together for a long time. Well, well, maybe we can come to some sort of an arrangement about the glue works. Uh, yes, maybe a sort of a partnership. Oh, Mr. Lamb. Well, can I see him now? Oh, yes, of course you can. And thank you so much. <laughs> What are you doing down here in the dark? Nothing. Your father and Mr. Lamb just fixed everything, Alice. I, I know, I'm glad. Everything will be all right now, won't it? Everything except Alice. What about Mr. Russell? Oh, oh, he left before anything happened. Everything's all right. Oh, no, it isn't. Oh, my poor baby. He's gone, isn't he? It doesn't matter. And that dinner... Oh, Alice, can you ever forgive your poor mother? Mother, there's nothing to forgive, darling. It's just the way things are. You know, it's all so clear to me now. You, you do thus and so, and you tell yourself, now, seeing me do thus and so, people will naturally think this and that. But in the end, they don't. They think something else. Usually, just what you don't want them to. <laughs> I suppose 
about the only good in pretending is the fun we get out of fooling ourselves that we fool somebody else. Alice, I don't know what you... No, no, you you run on to bed now, darling. I'm going to sit on the porch for a while. All right, dear. Good night, Alice. Good night, Mother. Honey, for your thoughts, Alice. Arthur, you, you came back. I didn't go. I've been out here all the time. Why? I was waiting for you. But I thought... Oh, then you were here Yes, when... I heard everything. And, and what's more, I... You heard? Arthur. Now, let me finish. I heard a great deal this afternoon, too, at Mildred's. So they did talk about me. Yes, and, and it's all opened my eyes to one thing. I love you, Alice. What? Didn't you hear me? I love you. You, you love me? You love me? Yes, darling. Oh. Oh, gee whiz. <laughs> Goodbye to Alice Adams. But our stars return now for a brief reunion. I won't be surprised if later this month I hear that the French people have declared a national holiday. For Claudette Colbert is about to return to their shores. Taking her first real vacation in years, she leaves this week for a few months abroad. And so, Claudette, je vous souhaite un bon voyage sans mal de mer. Pretty good, eh? Well, that's marvelous. Now, in case there's any doubt in your mind, I wish you a pleasant trip without seasickness. My intentions are better than my French. <laughs> Thank you very much, C.B. I haven't been back for eight years, so you see I'm terribly excited about it. And it's not only a vacation. I'm going to school. I, I'm going straight to the Hans Schneider School in the Tyrolean Alps and learn how to ski. <laughs> After that, if I'm still able to stand on my feet, I'm going to Paris and really have some fun. Now, I also want to thank the people who make Lux Soap and give us this program. You know, in pictures... One has to be especially careful about appearance. I know I am, and that's why I'm always glad to tell you that I think Lux Soaps is, a, is about the most dependable complexion care in the world. It's so easy to use, and it does keep the complexion smooth and clear. Thank you again, T.B., and good night. Good night, Claudette. Among the questions most frequently asked about Hollywood is what do the stars do in their spare time? With two such typical citizens as Fred McMurray and Walter Connolly to assist in the proceedings, perhaps we can find a few answers now. Fred, I suppose you're still clinging to the saxophone. Well, no, C.B., I'm afraid the old horn is getting a little rusty these days. I, I've been following in your, in your footsteps lately, and I've uh, sort of taken a fancy for target shooting. In fact, I built a shooting gallery in the base of my house. It's a little hard on the neighbor's ears, but... Uh... Yes, but of the two noises, I dare say they prefer the bullets to the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. They call me Three-Gun McMurray. <laughs> Why Three-Gun? The best shots in history seem satisfied with the title Two-Gun. Well, uh, you see, two guns aren't enough. I usually have to empty three before I hit the target. But uh, what about you, Walter? What do you do to pass the time? Well, for a couple of weeks, Fred, I'll be engaged in the most fascinating occupation in the world, doing nothing. I've just completed one picture, and the next one isn't quite ready. No lines to memorize, no makeup to worry about, no getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Just plain, unadulterated, delicious indolence. Apart from a rather regular attendance at Santa Anita track trying to pick the winners. But a bit more seriously, I've been startled and pleased, too, to see what some of our more exemplary Hollywood personalities do with their spare time and money. Victor McLaughlin is probably just as busy off the screen as he is on. He has a sports stadium. He drills and manages a troop of 2,000 horsemen and sponsors, sponsors a championship group of motorcycle riders. Adrian, the designer, spends his leisure in an antique shop. Eddie Cantor owns a couple of gift stores. Charles Bickford has an interest in a beauty parlor. Charlie Ruggles is a dog fancier. And uh, Reginald Denny designs and markets model airplanes. And uh, Fernand Garvey is probably one of the world's outstanding miniature fans. He likes French history and has made over a thousand miniature hats copied from old patterns and has also molded some 15,000 toy soldiers, accurate uh, replicas of old French regiments. And, of course, Adolf Manju is noted for his stamp collection and Dvorak for her walnut grove and Jean Herschel for his first editions. Now, the tendency now is to divide their time between the racetrack and the soundtrack. <laughs> 
with stars like Pat O'Brien, Bing Crosby, Barbara Stanwyck, and Joe E. Brown, all teaching their horses to look well in a photo finish. Well, don't forget, don't, <laughs> don't forget Walter, C.B. He's supporting a couple of bang tails himself, you know. And they're just about eating me out of hay and oats, too. <laughs> but they'll both get a chance to prove how much they love me a little later this season when they start at Santa Anita. In the meantime, Fred, if you and Mr. DeMille happen to miss the target and shoot a bunny, don't forget I'm always in the market for a good rabbit's foot. <laughs> good night. <laughs> well, good night, C.B. Good night, Fred. Good night, Walter. Thank you, Miss Colbert, Mr. McMurray, and Mr. Conway. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your announcer, Melville Rook. Don't miss the announcement of next week's Stars and Play, which Mr. DeMille brings you in a moment. In tonight's cast were Winifred Harris as Mrs. Palmer, Lou Merrill as Mr. Lamb, Georgette Spelvin as Mildred Palmer, Grace Kern as Ella, Berna Felton as Mrs. Dresser, and Frank Nelson as an employment agent. Miss Colbert will be seen next in the Paramount picture, Bluebeard's Eighth Wife. Benny Baker's current film is Hold'em Navy. Walter Connolly appeared through courtesy of Columbia Pictures. His new film is Penitentiary. Louis Silvers is from 20th Century Fox, where he was in charge of music for Love and Hisses. And now, here's Mr. DeMille. One of the most magnificent singers in modern times comes to the Lux Radio Theater next Monday night. From the concert stage, in opera, on the radio, and in motion pictures, her voice has thrilled the world. The voice of Grace Moore. Your endless requests bring her back to this stage. This time in a grand comedy which met with great favor on stage and screen. Enter, madame. Our leading man will be Melvin Douglas. Seen in several of the year's best pictures. Most recently in Grace Moore's new film. And as a special guest, Mr. Edward Arnold. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Grace Moore and Melvin Douglas in Enter, Madame, with Edward Arnold as the evening's added personality. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Warrior of the Woodland, Ranger Bill, is coming up next. Ranger Bill, Warrior of the Woodland. Ranger Bill, Warrior of the Woodland struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. There are many ways in which courage can be displayed. Sometimes it's in battle or a physical emergency. Other times, it's another type of courage. I have in mind the courage to face the consequences of a decision. A person knows sometimes that by making a certain decision, he is leaving himself wide open for the possibility of serious results. Our story today involves both types of courage. You see if you can determine which is the harder. Here's our story. Earthquake. Earthquake. For years, the town of Naughty Pine didn't grow or shrink a quarter of an inch. But now, as with many other towns throughout the United States, a growth period is taking place, as though an effort is being made to catch up for the years of inactivity. Our latest accomplishment is the putting up of a ten-story building, which to us is a skyscraper. The other day, Ranger Ralph Carpenter and I were 
gawking at the man working high up, just like the rest of the sidewalk superintendents. I just can't believe that Naughty Pine's going to have a building as large as this one. Yeah, a real giant for us, all right. Of course, to big city folk, this ten-story job wouldn't even rate a second look. <laughs> I guess it wouldn't. <laughs> it must be tedious work to set all those steel reinforcing rods and wire them in place so they'll stay right there when the concrete's poured. Well, it's like everything else. There's an art to it, you know. <laughs> hey, here comes Bernie. Oh, so it is. Uh, hello, Bernie. Hello, Bill, Ralph. I say, isn't this the greatest thing we've ever had happen to us? <laughs> it sure is, Bernie. <laughs> of course, uh, to you, everything is great. Of course, life is great. You fellas are great. <laughs> Why, this building's great. Naughty Pine's beginning to come out of its cocoon, and it'll be great someday. Soon. You watch and see now that the ice is broken. You could be right, Bill. I realize that, Ralph. Uh, say, Bernie, how's your civil defense program coming along? Great. <laughs> well, what else did you expect me to say? Uh, nothing. But I'd like some facts and statistics so I can evaluate your word great. How much progress does great mean? <laughs> you can't tell you, Bill. It's just uh, great, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bernie, we're not trying to be rude, but you know yourself that your stock answer of everything being great is a standard non-committal statement by you. Oh, sure, I know. <laughs> Don't worry, my feelings aren't hurt. I was just trying to think of a way I could tell you what I mean. Well, um, how does it compare to a month ago? Or six months ago? Well, well, I'll tell you. You see, uh... Well, that is... Uh-huh. You've told me just what I want to know, Bernie. I guess he has. Ah, but what's the big rush? Who's going to bomb Naughty Pine? That I can't tell you. Well, that's what I mean. Why should we rush ourselves to death setting up our civil defense when we're not even a halfway decent target? What do we got here that's so important? Lumber? Rosin? Turpentine? Wood pulp? Natural resources? Especially power dams. I never thought of it that way. Besides that, we've also got a lot of mining and certainly a wealth of ranching and farming. Maybe I've been asleep at the switch and looking at this thing in the wrong light. Mm -hmm. well, not that we're so bad off. I mean, we're pretty well organized even for a disaster call. Yeah, but the first time we had a drill, the organization was pretty loose. And a lot of precious time was lost. You know, with large office buildings going up, more may start later on. That'll mean a lot more industry and people moving into Naughty Pine. Mm -hmm. You've convinced me. Perhaps we should have another disaster drill in about six weeks. That'll give me time to tighten up the loose ends into a really efficient operation. Hey, I'll see you fellas later. Don't let them put this building up wrong now. <laughs> <laughs> we won't, Bertie. So long. Bye. <laughs> uh, great guy. Oh, those fellas work up high. <laughs> Just like they were at home on the ground. They are. They are what? At home, up in the air, on a skinny plank or beam. <laughs> ah, come on, we better get over to the office. Yeah. The afternoon will be gone, and we won't have accomplished a thing. singing was that bad? Something's wrong. Look at the people running around in the street. Yeah. Come on. we got to stop a panic. Yeah, but what happened? I think we've had an earthquake. Stumpy, Gray Wolf, Tom, Ralph, let's get these people off the streets and back to their homes. All right. All right. Well, going back to their offices, stores, homes now. Sure glad we avoided a panic. I saw my bill. That was a big one, huh? Or I missed my guess. That was that, all right. But it was short. That's what saved the day. 
Uh, Cal, I'd like to use your radio telephone. Yeah, help yourself. I'll check on the boys. Okay, thanks. Uh, operator, get me Bernard Haltman, civil defense coordinator. And quick, please. Oh, uh, no answer, huh? All right, operator. Here comes Bernie! Now, how's it look, Bill? I was just trying to call you to find out where you were. No, it looks like no one's been hurt, Bernie. It's a small property damage. That's good. We're getting our disaster drill sooner than we expected. Yeah. I better get the men and teams moving around to find out if anyone's hurt. I'll get the carpenter crews started boarding up the broken and cracked plate glass windows. Fine. The phone operators are waiting for emergency calls, and the radio station's giving out instructions how to get help. Wonderful. I think we ought to be able to secure this in a couple of hours, unless another tremor hits us. Well, it looks like everything's secure now. Yeah, sure does, Cal. I think the job's well done. I wonder if we're going to have another. I don't know. They usually come several at a time. Well, I'll see if I can find out. Operator, uh, get me Charles Sheldon at State University. Uh, we not have earthquake in a long time now. It too bad people not be more calm. And after a couple of them get hurt because they panic, they'll settle down. Well, that's learning the hard way, though. Uh, hello, Charlie. Uh, Bill Jefferson. Yeah, we sure did. Yeah. Uh, what's that quake-watching machine of yours say? Huh? Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. Okay, we'll see you. Bye. Yeah, bad news, huh? Yeah. Charlie said they've been getting quite a show on the seismograph. They think a whole subterranean shelf is shifting. We could get several violent and lengthy shocks. Well, then we'd better talk to the people on the radio and television and tell them what to do. Uh, will you talk on television, Bill? I'll be glad to. Then I think the sheriff and your boys ought to circulate around and tell the people to listen. We can use power megaphones, and Cal's got a PA system for one of his squads. That's a fine idea. All right, let's get started. <laughs> Attention, attention, please. Listen to your radio or television in half an hour. At exactly three o'clock this afternoon, you will be instructed how to take care of yourself in case another tremor takes place. Listen to your radio or television at three o'clock. And now, ladies and gentlemen... It's three o'clock, and here is Chief Ranger Bill Jefferson to talk to you. Mr. Jefferson. Thank you. Folks, I always believe that the best way to avoid panic and injury is to let everyone know the truth. Now, the experts tell us that we can expect more tremors, and they'll be violent and lengthy. We must face the facts so we can be adequately forewarned. Now... The schools and all public meeting places will be closed until this danger passes. In your own homes or places of business, the best thing to do is stand in the doorways. That'll protect you from falling plaster and other objects. Or, if there's time, get under a strong table or under a bed. Don't, under any circumstances, run out into the street. You might get hurt or killed from falling pieces of building or other objects. And you also hamper the emergency equipment and teams from operating efficiently. Don't try to leave the town because you won't be permitted to do so. We must keep the roads open for emergency use. Every five minutes, this station and the radio station will broadcast the phone numbers you can dial to get help if you need it. 
And now, for the most important thing. Don't lose your head, or you may lose your life. Just keep calm. Thank you. And now, back to our regularly scheduled program. Cups, every one of them busted. <laughs> that coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just so long as they didn't break on your head, it's all right. <laughs> well, you got a point there, Sonny. <laughs> uh, what a mess. Maybe we ought to leave it since as soon as we clean it up, it'll just happen all over again. Uh, superstitious, Ralph? No, just realistic. Uh, maybe Ralph speak more truth than fiction. <laughs> hey, fellas, uh, I just thought of something. Uh, where are you going? Over to the new building. Oh, you want company? Sure. Uh, come on, Ralph. All right. Ranger, this building's made of reinforced concrete and steel girders riveted together. I can't possibly see how any earthquake could affect us. Well, if you feel that you're safe, then that's good enough for me. I'm not an engineer, Mr. Hanson, but I'm concerned about the safety of your men. Well, so am I, Mr. Jefferson. Oh, I suppose there might be some danger, but it would be so slight that it wouldn't count. The men are used to working on swinging and swaying footing. Uh-huh. Well, thanks for your time. Uh, I know you're a busy man. That's quite all right. Thanks for stopping by and being interested. I'll keep a sharp eye for any danger to the men. That'll be fine, Mr. Hanson. So long. Good day. He sure seems like a nice fellow. Yeah. He seems to be pretty alert for his men, too. Well, I guess we might as well go back over to the office, finish up some paperwork. Got to hit the West Trail in the morning. Oh, are we going to take the pack mules this trip? You said it. We'll be gone three or four weeks, depending on how our surveying goes. Ah, that's what I like. A long trek on the trail with pack mules. <laughs> Maybe you'll think differently after three or four weeks in the saddle, Ralph. Oh, not if I bring along a pillow, I won't. <laughs> I'll give you a pillow right on the top of your head. Don't do me any good there, Bill. <laughs> It's quitting time. Maybe we can go home on time for a change. Ah, that good thought. Let's go. Hey, that was a bad one. Let's go, boys. Hey, door jam from Quake. We can't quick the window. Let's try window. Uh, it's jammed through. All right, stand back, fellas. All right, stand back. All right, let's get to our trucks. All right. Boy, what a mess. All right, let's start going through all the buildings one by one, looking for injured people. Hey, block and tackle along and fly bars with you. Uh, we get started right now. Ralph, get on the radio and call the boys in from the fire towers and the out districts and tell them to get here on the double. Right away, Bill. Hello, Bill. Oh, hello, Bernie. Boy, I never thought this had happened to us. Look at those buildings. Yeah. Guess we've all been caught flat-footed. I sent my man into the buildings along Main Street to search for the injured. Fine. I'll get my team started going through the rest of the large buildings in the heart of town. All right. Oh, here comes Cal and his men. Uh, let them work with you and your men along Main Street. That'll help a lot. Okay, Bernie. I'll leave Ralph with the radio truck, and he can act as sort of a central operations point for this disaster. Fine. I'll see you later. So far, everyone's gotten out with only scratches and bruises. <laughs> I guess they listened to what they were told to do. Uh, uh, Oops, a 
I talked too soon. <laughs> Where'd that groan come from? Mm, over there in stairwell. He had all broken and twisted. Hey, a couple of you fellers, over here! Hey, uh, come on, Well, there he is. I can see his hand. Ah, there a heavy beam across him. We have to use block and tackle to move it. Yep. That's what I need, yeah. All right, let's get it ready. Come on, man. Okay. Come on. That's it. Easy. Okay, boys. Lend a hand on this rope now. No, when I say so... You fellers raise the beam with the block and tackle. Gray Wolf and I'll pull this feller out. Uh, there, I'll lift him up to you. I'm all ready. I'm ready, too. Now, boys! A little more. That good work, man. That good. There, now. Hold it. Hold it. Okay, Gray Wolf. Let's have him up here now. Get him. That's here. There he is. All right. Let's get him on a stretcher and out to the ambulance right quick. He looks pretty bad. I think we've been fortunate so far. Only one serious casualty. Not right. It could be very bad. How many buildings did you check, Bill? Well, I searched the rest of the buildings from here to the corner. You better start across the street now. Cal and his men are in the next block. Bill. Bill, the building's caved in. What? What building? The new building. The one they're putting up. The new building? Yeah. Stumpy, tell Cal and his boys to split up so they can take over from us. We'll meet you over at the new building. Right! All right, let's go, fellas. Bill, there's a dozen men trapped under all this steel and concrete. Where's Hanson? He's dead. He saw it coming and he tried to get the men out. He never got to them. A steel beam nailed him on the way. Oh, it's too bad. I'm sorry to hear it. Yeah, so am I. Bill, you take charge of this. You're familiar with this sort of rescue and I'm not. Okay. Ralph, Gray Wolf... Round up all the men you can who can operate cranes, bulldozers, and drive trucks. Okay. Hey, here comes Tom and the boys. Yeah, just in time, too. Uh, Tom! I'm sorry we couldn't make any sooner, but we came a long way. Well, you did fine. Take the rest of the boys and find all the cables you can. There are a dozen men buried under that. Come on. We'll start pulling and lift off the slabs of concrete and steel beams with trucks, bulldozers, and cranes as quickly as we can. Right. Ralph and Gray Wolf are rounding up drivers. In fact, here comes someone right now, so get to work. On the double. Come on, men. Let's go with it. Let's get out of here. Oh, you sure know how to get that ball bouncing in a hurry, Bill. Thanks. We need a couple dozen more men, Bernie, and quick, too. I well, haven't got them. The rest of the men are working through the other buildings in town, even state troopers. You didn't understand me. I need more men right now. I don't care where you have to go to get them. Get them. Hey, I, I know where we can get men. That a boy, where? Trusties from the state prison. The warden told me a long time ago they'd be glad to help. What are you waiting for? This is a chance I've been waiting for, Mike. Yeah, Fingers, you were right. Being good boys is going to get us out of here quicker and safer than trying to make a break. <laughs> you said it. That dumb brother of mine don't know it, but... Uh... He's going to be the fall guy. When are we going to make our break? Huh? When we get to the building. Everybody will be so busy trying to get those buried guys out, they won't bother with us. And we'll sneak off and be gone. You said it. <laughs> hey, all right, you guys. Get in the trucks and be quick about it. We're in a hurry. All right, we're going. Tom, have you made contact with the buried men yet? Not yet. We'll push your men harder. Stop. 
Stumpy, have you found anyone yet? No, nary a soul. Of course, we got a long way to go. All right, let's step on it. Gray Wolf, have you made contact yet? No, but maybe any time now. Tell those men to work faster, but carefully. Bernie, where are those convicts? Well, the warden said, hey, here come two prison trucks right now. Oh, great. We'll split the men up under the crew chiefs. Fingers, how'd you get here? <laughs> yeah, I've been a good boy, Bernie. Mike, uh, I'd like you to meet my kid brother, Bernie. Howdy, Bernie. How'd you get here with the trustees? Well, I've got a good notion to hustle all you men back to the prison. Oh, no, Bernie, don't act so nasty. We're uh, good boys now, aren't we, Mike? Sure, we're good boys. Besides, uh, you got a big job here. I understand some guys are in bad trouble. Yeah. Yeah, we got to get them out. All right, now get to work and no funny stuff, and I'll be watching you. If you've changed, I'll be the first one to help you go straight. <laughs> Ain't he sweet? He's going to help us, but not to go straight. <laughs> so long, chump. Yeah, let's leave this place fast, huh? Yeah, take it easy. We gotta make this look good, you know? You mean we gotta work? Sure, for a while. <laughs> Till that dumb brother of mine thinks we're okay and relaxes. <laughs> Bernie, we made contact with the buried men. They're all... Hey, Bernie, are you listening? Huh? Uh, what'd you say? I said... Hey, what's the matter with you? Bernie, snap out of it. What's wrong? Uh-huh. Oh, no, nothing. Nothing at all. Uh, no. You were saying... We've contacted the men, and most of them aren't even hurt. They're buried in a pocket. It'll be touchy to get them uncovered, but I think we can do it safely. Uh, that's, that's fine. I'm glad to hear it. Hey, man, I think you better go home. This has been too much for you. Ah, uh, no, no, I'll be all right. Just be sure we send the convicts back as soon as you can spare them. Oh, sure, that's what I plan to do. I'll see you later. Keep working over behind that pile of concrete. We'll make our break from there. Okay. Come on, get moving. Okay, okay, okay. Now, come on. You can't get away with it, Fingers. Okay, Where did the... you come from? You... Oh, get out of the way, chum, before you get hurt. I'm not moving and you're not going. No. <laughs> oh, come on, Fingers, let's go. Hey, you said it. Head for the bushes over there. We're almost in the bushes and we can figure out which is the best way to get out of town. Yeah, yeah. Where do you two think you're going? A cop. No, just a ranger. Let's take him. He's alone. Come on, You shouldn't have tried it, boys. All right. Pick yourselves up and. Let's go back. It's too bad Mr. Hanson was killed. All other men got out alive. Yeah. He did try to save his man the best way he knew how. I hope this end of earthquakes for a long time. How's your head, Bernie? <laughs> it's okay now. That's a strange thing, this life we live. What you mean, Bernie? Ah, oh, Hanson gets killed doing good, and my brother's still alive, and he's a hardened criminal. Well, there's no answer, except that God governs every detail of our lives. Well, it doesn't seem fair. To us? No, it doesn't. But the Lord in heaven knows just when a man's life should end. For me, it just points up the brevity of life. Now necessary for all of us to be ready. I'm not bitter, but... But why does God let guys like my brother live? Maybe he's patiently waiting for the 
chance to change him. Ah, he'll never be changed. I wouldn't be so sure, Bernie. And maybe you've got an answer? I have. It's a person. Jesus Christ. When he's allowed to enter a life, he transforms it. Yeah, I wish you could talk to my brother. If the chance ever comes, I'd like to do just that. Hey, Bill. Sheriff hmm? wants to see you. Okay, Ralph. I'll see you sometime later, Bernie. Or we'll get together. Fine. And Bernie, we've gotten the answer to my question of a few days ago. Oh? I think our civilian defense team is top rate. <laughs> Well, see you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! This is Stumpy Jenkins, the Ranger Bill's old sidekick, as I guess you all know. Just adding a little extra word of thanks for getting yourself in on the program today. Always glad to have you along. And I hope you invite your friends, too, for we sure got lots of adventures to tell you about. And we don't want you to miss any of them. So you make sure to be there by your radio every week. Don't lose out on our next story. 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 The first couple of radio comedy are Burns and Allen are up next. Another cup of Maxwell House coffee, George. Sure, pour me a cup, Gracie. You know, Maxwell House is always good to the last <laughs> drop. That drop's good, too. Yes, it's Maxwell House Coffee Time, starring George Burns and Gracie Allen. With our special guest, Marlena Dietrich, yours truly, Toby Reed, B. Benaderet, Harry Lubin and the Maxwell House Orchestra, and Bill Goodwin. For America's Thursday night comedy enjoyment, it's George and Gracie. And for America's everyday coffee drinking enjoyment, it's Maxwell House. Always good to the last drop. <laughs> Officially, there are three more days until spring, but George Burns decided not to wait. He caught cold today. We find him now propped up in bed, surrounded by blankets and hot water bottles, with Gracie hovering over him like a mother bird. Uh, 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 the Thank you. Now, here, darling, try a teaspoon of this. Oh. Open wide. That's it. There. Holy smoke. Stuff tastes like shampoo. Now, take a teaspoon of this. Oh, come on, take it oh. like a little man. That's the way. Oof. That tastes like hand lotion. Oh, thanks, dear. Well, at last I've got that straightened out. Huh? Well, the labels came off these two bottles and I didn't know which one was. You mean I swallowed shampoo and hand lotion? Mm -hmm. But it won't hurt you. In fact, it might help you. You have the cleanest, softest tummy in town. Oh, the nitwit. No wonder the National Safety Council slogan is don't be a Gracie. Now, I still dear while I put this mustard plaster on you. Hold it. What kind of a mustard plaster is that? It's red. Well, I couldn't find any mustard, so I made it with ketchup. <laughs> it's a good thing we ran out of pickles. <laughs> Look, Gracie, stop nursing me. No, darling, I'll nurse you like Florence nursed her nightingale. <laughs> be better in about 30 years. You see, I've got to get you well by tonight. Tonight? Why tonight? Well, this is the night of the big pageant given by my club, the Beverly Hills Uplift Society. 
Gracie, why don't you drop out of that club? That's the silliest bunch of women that ever got together. The Beverly Hills Uplift Society is a charitable organization. It is? The women, the, the, the money from our pageant will be used to buy clothing for unfortunate girls. What unfortunate girls? The girls of the Beverly Hills Uplift Society. <laughs> I, uh, I thought so. The girls are giving the pageant tonight to welcome the arrival of spring. Spring will take a look at those dames and refuse to arrive. <laughs> Forget the club and stay home, dear. Well, I can't, dear. I'm in the pageant. You know, in the opening scene, I'm a caterpillar. A caterpillar. Yeah, and then later I turn into a butterfly. I see. And at the end of the show, everyone chases me with nets. <laughs> that they'll do whether you're a butterfly or not. <laughs> a thrilling pageant. I bet it will. You know, as the curtain goes up, you see all the girls on the stage dressed as flowers. I see. And then Clara Bagley enters as a fairy, and as she passes the girls, they jump three feet in the air. They represent the flowers springing up. But, Gracie, the uplifters aren't young anymore. Uh, how can they jump three feet? But Clara has a wand. Oh. <laughs> It's, uh, it's magic. It's magic. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> then out comes Blanche Morton. She's a sprite. I just got in town. Let's have that again. <laughs> what's, a, what's a sprite? A, a sprite. sprite? Yes, what is that? Sprite. Well, uh, she looks like that girl you find on White Rock. Oh. She looks like she was found under a wet rock. <laughs> what was that? Nothing, nothing. I'm just that living. Uh. Stay home tonight, dear. <laughs> Are you home? Oh, yes, Blanche. I'm in the bedroom here with George. I'll be right out. Now, stay covered, dear. Tell her to find a new caterpillar. <laughs> Hello, Blanche. Hello, Gracie. I'm on my way downtown to get some tights for my Sprite costume. <laughs> How's George's cold? Oh, not so good, Blanche. Oh, well, I'll be glad to make him some hot chicken broth. Oh, no, 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 no. You're too busy. You go on and put on your tights for the pageant. I've got chicken legs. No, you wear your tights on. <laughs> but if George isn't better by tonight, I'll have to stay home with him. Well, Gracie, why not hire a sitter? A sitter? Uh-huh. Someone to stay with George and wait on him. Like a babysitter. Well, wouldn't a grown-up sitter be better? They are grown-ups, Gracie. They're girls who earn money that way. Oh! Well, I... Oh, uh, come in. Hi, Gracie. Oh, hello, Mrs. Martin. Oh, hello, How do you, Mr. Goodwin? Where's George? Well, he's in bed with a cold, Bill. You know, I'm thinking of hiring a babysitter to stay with him tonight. Oh, well, you're lucky I came along, Gracie. I got a whole list of them. But you don't have any children. How come you know so many? Well, who do you think sits with the babysitter while the babysitter sits with the baby? <laughs> Goodwin. Can't you think of anything better than chasing girls? Yeah, catching them. <laughs> well, I'll be running along, Gracie. Let me know what happens. All right, Blanche. Goodbye. Say, can I see the little man? Oh, sure, Bill. He's right here in the bedroom. Well, George, old pal, Gracie told me about your cold. Have you called a doctor? Yeah, there's nothing anybody can do for a cold, Bill. Might as well call an African witch doctor. What do they do? Well, they scare sickness away with horrible-looking faces. And does it work? If it did, George would be a well man. <laughs> <laughs> some of the summer replacement yes, stuff. Yes. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, Bill's going to help me get a babysitter to stay with you tonight, George. A babysitter? You can forget that. Not but George. Me. Nothing doing, right. George. George, the girl I have in mind is a gorgeous redhead. She can sit here and read you a book. I don't want a gorgeous redhead reading a book. Say, that wouldn't be bad. But, George, I didn't know you cared that much for books. Well, if... <laughs> well, if I have good lines... Well, I don't know about the book lines, but I can guarantee the redhead. Well, that's it. Well, I'm not leaving George alone with any beautiful young girl. Well, good, good. Then it's settled, and you'll stay home from that silly uplift society pageant. Oh, no. I'll find some nice, sweet old grandmother to stay with you. Now, wait a minute, Gracie. <laughs> Bill, do you know any grandmothers? Uh, look, uh, well, yes. Oh, uh, look, Gracie. good. I have to uh, go try on my butterfly costume. Uh, Gracie. And you get a grandmother to sit with George tonight. Gracie. And tell her to bring her knitting. Uh, Gracie. I'll look. see you later, dear. Uh, Goodbye, Bill. Uh, Goodbye. Now, listen, Bill. I'm not going to lie here all evening listening to some old babe click her teeth in her knitting needles. <laughs> so just forget it. 
George, listen, you want to keep Gracie home from that uplifter's pageant, don't you? Yes, I do. Well, leave it to me. I will furnish the grandmother. But, Bill, I, I want somebody my own age. George, settle for a grandmother. Great great grandmothers are hard to find. <laughs> Goodbye, summer yes, replacement. <laughs> well, George, meet the grandmother. Hello, George. <laughs> Why, it's, it's Melina Dietrich. Yes, it's some grandma, huh, George? George, pop your eyes back in your head. <laughs> oh, well, excuse me for staring, Miss Dietrich, but uh, those are pretty shoes you have on. But I'm not wearing them on my knees. <laughs> it's, uh, it's hard to believe that you're a grandmother. You're, you're so young. I'm not as young as you think, Mr. Burns. I'm old enough to be your daughter. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I explained the situation to Marlena George. And she'll go along with the gag as a personal favor to me. Yes, it sounds like a lot of fun. Besides, it's time I did something for Bill. I've said no to him so often. <laughs> I bet you have. <laughs> and to make Gracie really jealous, Marlena's going to pretend that she's fallen in love with you. Well, do you think Gracie will believe that Marlena Dietrich could fall for me? She should believe it. Really? Yes. I've heard she's a little peculiar. It's a nice T.L. <laughs> Say, uh, I, 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 I think I just heard Gracie come in the front door. I'll go and usher her. Well, I'm back at last, Bill. Is George all right? Oh, he's fine, Gracie. Did you find a grandmother to sit with him tonight? Oh, yeah, she's with him right now. Oh, that's sweet. I must go in and say hello to the dear little thing. Well, hello there, Grandmother. Now, now, don't get up. I get you. Oh, Grandmother. <laughs> well, Grandmother, what long, beautiful legs you have. Yeah. The better for men to see me, my dear. Oh, now, wait a minute. You're Marlena Dietrich. You're no Grandmother. But I am. My daughter is married and has a child. Judge, does that make her a Grandmother? <laughs> In this country, it does. <laughs> I, I expect you to find a little old lady with her knitting. I love to knit. As a matter of fact, I knitted this dress I'm wearing. It took me weeks. Yeah, I can see you put a lot into it. <laughs> well, now you can go to the uplifter's pageant, Gracie, and don't worry. Molina will do things for me. Like what? Well, first I thought I would rub his chest with camphorated oil. Yeah? I mean, yeah. Now, uh, I think I'd better stick around. But why? Well, you might not be able to find things. Don't worry. I'm sure I can find the oil. But before you leave, I wish you would point out his, his chest. It's, it's right under this button. Yes, why do you hesitate, Mrs. Stearns? Don't you trust your husband alone with me? Well, sure I trust him. It's you I'm worried about. <laughs> me? Well, yes. George can resist you, but can you resist George? I'll force myself. <laughs> a beautiful woman like you is a, an unlighted powder cake, and George is just the punk who can light it. <laughs> Gracie. Well, whatever you do, don't look into his eyes, Miss Dietrich. Once you've gazed into those twin pools of passion, you're a goner. Really? Yeah. The blue one isn't so bad, but watch out for that little red one.
never lend a listening ear to a finer jig and tune in all your bond days. The jaunty, bouncy rhythm of it. And more than just the rhythm, these great Irish songs, like all our favorite music, combine many other fine musical parts. Now let the orchestra demonstrate. Here's a St. Patrick's Day song you know as well as you know your own name. But can you recognize it from just this mellow harmony? Now we'll stir in the rich counter melody. And here's a dash of vigorous rhythm. To round out this great song, let's have the melody. You can see how it takes not just one, but many musical parts all skillfully blended together to bring you this rich, full scoring of when Irish eyes are smiling. And as it is with America's favorite music, so too with America's favorite coffee, superb Maxwell House coffee, for its skill in blending that brings you that famous good-to-the-last-drop flavor, flavor you'll enjoy in no other coffee. And that famous flavor is the reason why more people enjoy Maxwell House than any other brand at any price. To create the rich, heartwarming goodness that's yours in every cup of Maxwell House, our experts combine not one, but many choicest varieties of highland-grown Latin American coffees. First, they select Manizales for mellowness. For extra richness, they add Medellin. Other choice coffees give the Maxwell House blend vigor. And finally, Bucaramanga's coffees contribute their fine full body. All perfectly blended into one great coffee, radiant roasted to flavor perfection, and brought to you vacuum packed, not just days fresh. But roaster fresh. And because you folks on the West Coast really know and enjoy coffee at its best, Maxwell House is blended and roasted for you right here on the West Coast. So treat yourself to the best in coffee drinking enjoyment. Enjoy the extra flavor of America's favorite brand of coffee, delicious Maxwell House. Always good to the last drop. I can't leave those two alone together. I've got to get rid of Dietrich. Oh, Gracie, there's nothing to worry about. George has a cold. A cold gives George more sex appeal than ever. It, it, it makes his voice husky. What if he should forget himself and sing to her? That would get rid of Dietrich. <laughs> She'd be powerless to move. George's singing has a certain spell about it. Did you say spell or have you got a cold too? <laughs> And I'm not leaving George alone with Molly and the Dietrich. I'll just have to miss the pageant. But, Gracie, if you're not in the pageant, we'll be out on a limb. You think that's a limb? You should see the limbs I've got to worry about. <laughs> I mean, who turned into a butterfly? Who let Clara Bagley turn into a butterfly? She might be a sensation. Your costume's too small for her. She won't have anything to wear. In that case, she's sure to be a sensation. <laughs> I'm staying home tonight. Oh, d don't give up. Maybe we can think of some way to get rid of Dietrich. Yeah, well, uh... Blanche, hmm? Blanche, I think I've got an idea. Now, she's pretty crazy about Bill Goodwin. So? So, we'll make her think that while she's wasting her time with George, another woman is stealing Bill. What woman could steal Bill from Dietrich? Oh, um, Blanche, did you say, did you get those tights for your Sprite costume? Yes. Well, put them on and come with me. You're the woman. Gracie, <laughs> I can't compete with Dietrich. What about her legs? Well, you've got just as many. <laughs> now get into those tights and come over to the house as soon as you can. <laughs> Mr. Burns, your wife has been gone for quite a while. I don't think our little scheme to make her jealous is working. Oh, don't worry. It will. You know, I really shouldn't stay here. It, uh, 
scares you to be alone with a man like me, huh? Yes, what would I do if you collapsed? <laughs> yes, that's what scares you, I see. Uh, well, I'm back. How are you feeling, George? Just fine, Gracie. Yes, your husband has been making a lot of progress. George Burns. She means my cold is getting better. <laughs> oh. Uh, tell me something. Has uh, George sung to you? I know. Can George sing? Can he sing? Well, he's got the world's most convincing voice. You know that song of yours, See What the Boys in the Back Room Will Have? Yes. Well, when George sings that, everybody runs for the back room. <laughs> That's true. Let me hear you sing, George. All right. <clears throat> I'm writing her a letter to Virginia where I met her. And now I feel better because I know I'm going home. <laughs> well, Marlena, what do you think? Which way is the back room? <laughs> that's, a, that's a different song. Oh, Judge, please don't sing anymore. I'm afraid Marlena will swoon. I'm a little worried myself. George, suppose I sing a song for you. I'd love it. All right. Now imagine that you hear an orchestra. Say, I am hearing it. Falling in love again Never wanted to What am I to do? I can't help it Love's always been my game Play it how I may I was made that way I can't help it Men cluster to me Like moths upon the flame And if their wings burn I know I'm not to blame Good, uh, you're good too, Marlena. Uh, oh, excuse me, there's someone I'm expecting. Here I am, Gracie, but I feel silly in these tights. Well, you look stunning, Blanche, absolutely stunning. You shouldn't hide bones as beautiful as yours. <laughs> Come on in. Uh, uh, Miss Dietrich, I'd like you to meet a very, very dear friend of Bill Goodwin's. How do you do, sir? <laughs> that I'm a woman. Oh, I'm sorry. Those trousers fooled me. <laughs> oh, those aren't trousers. They're tight. Aren't they awfully loose? <laughs> oh, I know. They, they cling to me perfectly. Well, sure, it's a skin that's loose. <laughs> Thanks, Gracie. Oh, that's okay, Blanche. You're my friend. Gracie, what's the idea of bringing Blanche over here on that get-up? Well, I just want Molly Nadipic to meet her new rival, Blanche Morton. Blanche is my rival. That's right. While you're sitting here with George Burns, Blanche is stealing Bill away from you. Yes. He saw me in these tights and fell head over heels. I don't blame him. That would throw anybody. <laughs> you know, before you know it, Blanche may be Mrs. Goodwin. What goes on here? There happens to be a Mr. Morton. No, George. I was fooled, too. She's a woman. <laughs> yeah, and you'll be quiet, George. You're delirious. <laughs> so I'm losing Bill by staying young. Yes. And you, if you want to win him back, you better take him out tonight and get him candy and flowers and champagne and buy him a dinner. But that's what I always do. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky Willie. Come in. Hi, Gracie. Hi, Marlena. Hi, Blanche. Ooh. Blanche, what's the idea of running around in your long underwear? <laughs> Those are supposed to be tights, Bill. Yes, and uh, Blanche is supposed to be a you of suppressed desire. Huh? <laughs> I understand she might even become Mrs. Goodwin. Mrs. Goodwin? Blanche, I've got a mother. <laughs> How do you feel about Blanche Morton? Well, she looks like... 
<laughs> Bill, before yes. you say anything, I want you to know that Blanche is crazy about Maxwell House coffee. Oh, yes, Bill. I love the rich, delicious, mellow goodness of Maxwell House. Well, naturally. I love Maxwell House coffee, too, Bill. Well, sure. <laughs> that good to the last drop flavor is so satisfying. But she doesn't love it as much as Blanche. Blanche is always running to the market to get some. Yes, and that's how I get most of my exercise. <laughs> <laughs> You could say that Maxwell House Coffee is responsible for my figure. I've made my decision. I'm taking Blanche to a justice of the peace. You're going to marry her? No, I'm going to sue her for every penny she's got. <laughs> Blaming that figure on Maxwell House. <laughs> Why, Maxwell House Coffee's America's favorite. It's, it's bought and enjoyed by more people than any other brand of coffee at any price. You'll hear from my lawyers, Blanche Morton. Goodbye. Gracie, let's go catch Bill. What for? I, I want to talk him out of that suit. Oh, forget it, Blanche. You look better in tight. <laughs> well, this is a fine mess. In just one hour, the curtain goes up on our pageant, and Marlena Dietrich is still at your house with George. Yeah, well, there must be some way. Oh, wait a minute. Hmm? She's a grandmother. Her daughter has a child. Hand me a telephone, Blanche. I've got an idea. I'll answer, George. Hello? Oh, hello, Mama. What? Who's this? This is your daughter. Come on, Mama. Your grandson says he wants to see you. Just a moment. My grandson isn't old enough to talk. I know. He wrote me a note. <laughs> I don't believe you're my daughter. You don't, huh? Falling in love again, never wanted to, what am I to do? You sound like Mrs. Burns. Can't help it. <laughs> Is that Gracie on the phone? Yes, she's yes. pretending she's my daughter so that I'll come home. Mama, I hear a man's voice. Where are you? If you don't know where I am, how did you know where to call me? <laughs> <laughs> Falling in love again. Mama. No, Mrs. Burns. <laughs> I think I'd stay here with Daddy. <laughs> George, how long have you been married to Gracie? Fifteen years. Why? That's what I'd like to know. Why? <laughs> I got a big appetite. <laughs> <laughs> Are you back again, Gracie? Yes, George, and you've won. I'll stay home tonight. Good. Well, I guess that means I can be running along. I'm sorry about your Beverly Hills Uplift Society, Mrs. Burns. What kind of a club is that? Well, I'll tell you all about it as we walk to the door. Fine. Good night, George. Good night, Marlena. Now, you see, Marlena, the Beverly Hills Uplift Society is a group of girls. <laughs> well, I gotta tell Bill Goodwin that we won. Hello? Hello, Bill? This is George. Yeah? Well, your scheme worked. Gracie finally gave up. Really? Yep. Of course, it took the prettiest legs in Hollywood to do it. <laughs> oh, in fact, I used my brain, too. <laughs> That's some more summer stuff, I guess. <laughs> well, Marlena, D uh, Marlena Dietrich is just leaving the house if you want to pick her up. Well, okay, George. Goodbye. Good Goodbye, Willie. Oh, well, good night, George. I'll see you about 11. Well, you see me at 11? Where, where are you going? To the pageant. Pageant? Well, who's going to stay with me? Blanche Martin. She'll be right over. I thought Blanche was a sprite. Well, she was, but she's turning over her tights to the newest member of the Beverly Hills Uplift Society. You mean Martin Marlena Dietrich? Dietrich. Yeah. Right? Well, wait for me, baby. I'll get my hat. <laughs> Gracie will return in just a moment. Join us again next Thursday when we'll all be back. George Burns, Gracie Allen, Bill Goodwin, Harry Lubin and the Maxwell House Orchestra, and yours truly, Toby Reed. And now, here are our stars. Ladies and gentlemen, next Thursday will be the night of the Academy Awards. That night, we'll have on our program a fine actress who's one of the top candidates for Hollywood's highest honor. Oh, Josh, that's silly. I'm on the program every week. <laughs> I'm talking about Janie Wyman, who was nominated for her great performance in Johnny Belinda. Oh, wonderful. It'll be so nice to see Janie. It certainly will. <laughs> Friends, this month of March has been designated by the President as Red Cross Month. 
During this one annual appeal, the Red Cross must raise funds to carry on its important work for the entire year. The Red Cross program for 1949 includes aiding in disaster, serving the armed forces, serving veterans, promoting health and safety, serving youth, and helping the unfortunate in all parts of the world. Remember, the Red Cross is a partnership of the people. You too can help in these troubled times through your Red Cross. Good night, folks. Good things. The easy way. If you like good things the easy way, then get instant Maxwell House coffee. So good. So good. True coffee flavor and fragrance because Instant Maxwell House is not a so-called coffee product. It's all pure Maxwell House coffee in instant form. And so easy. So easy. Instant Maxwell House means great coffee instantly in your cup. No fuss, no muss, no bother. Today, try Instant Maxwell House. Instantly good to the last drop. Thursday when Jane Wyman will be our guest. Good night and good luck from the makers of Maxwell House, America's favorite brand of coffee. Always good to the last drop. The George Burns and Gracie Allen Show is written by Paul Henning and Keith Fowler. Next, hunt the biggest of all game with... The Green Hornet. The Green Hornet. He hunts the biggest of all game. Public enemies who try to destroy our America. <laughs> With his faithful valet, Cato, Britt Reed, daring young publisher, matches wits with the underworld, risking his life that criminals and racketeers within the law may feel its weight by the sting of the Green Hornet. Ride with Britt Reed as he races toward another thrilling adventure. The Green Hornet strikes again. wandering aimlessly outside the fence, slowly drifted away. Two reporters from the Daily Sentinel looked at each other and nodded gravely. Hmm. Strike. Yes, Lowry? Sure is. It's a strike. Okay, expert. Hop back to the Sentinel and give it to the city desk. I'll stick around. Hey, wait a minute now. Suppose I stick around and you take the news back to the paper. How about that? Now, listen, expert, but I'm staying. Super so snakes, Lowry. I Besides, you can talk to the boss better than I can. Huh? Sure, he'll want an eyewitness account of this. It's important. Maybe you'll get a byline, expert. Ah, a byline. Hey, what for you handed me the blarney? This one is that Lowry handed someone else a chance to get a story. Oh, help me, expert. I'm on the level. Yeah, like a roller coaster. Okay, okay, then. You cover the street here. I'll go to the center. Oh, not so fast. I'll go. Never mind. I that. said I'll go. Holy crow, no matter what I do, I'll still be suspecting I've done the wrong thing. So I'll go. Be seeing you at the center. Yeah, yeah, sure. Not for a while yet. I've always too smart for you, Mr. Axley. Right. 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 Those strikers look like they mean business. Right. But the one guy I want to see is right around this corner. Right. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. I'm a reporter. Here's my press card. But I am. Oh, now, wait a minute, bud. I'm from the Daily Sentinel. This strike is just a story to me. All we do is report the news. You make it, we report it. Strictly neutral, see? That's talker, ain't you? It pays. Now, how about the lowdown? What's the strike about? Who's after what and what's going to happen to who? What's your name? Cuss. I mean, Crabtree. Crabtree? All right, just hold that. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? Didn't you see a camera before? We'll use you as human as a strike on page. No, no, you don't. <laughs> no picture. Oh, I figured you'd do that, pal. So you think you're fooling me, do you? The first name is the right one. Your name's Carson. The way you said it first. Had Carson, I've seen you at a dozen strikes before this one. You're a professional striker. For all I know, a professional crook. Why, you... Yeah, you rise like a trout. That's why you didn't want your picture in the papers, huh? 
You're on the police way at one at least someplace. You reporters get around a lot. Tell us to spot a phony when we see one. Now, there's more to this than just a strike. What's your racket? Who are you working for? Come on, give me something for the Sentinel. Without looking up, I can tell that's Axford. Johnny Casey, how can you tell for sure? Lowry no, slams the door, too. <laughs> Long years of practice, Axford. He slams it, but it's a different slam. Okay. Casey, I got to see Reed. He's inside. If you please, Mr. Axford, I too wish to see Mr. Brett. Well, Cato, couple of snakes, I didn't see you. What are you doing down at the Daily Sentinel? You ought to be back at the apartment cooking dinner for Reed. Mr. Brett, send for me. Well, you'll just have to wait till I get through. I got important news about the strike at the Beaver's plant. Maybe and Mr. I want... Reed ought to decide that. I'll tell him you're here, Axford. Oh, here he is now. Okay, get me a copy of yesterday's son. Yes, sir. One side, Cato. Reed, I got important news. The strike started. I know. I just give it to Gennigan on the city desk at... What did you say? I know about it. Either I'm hearing wrong or you're talking wrong. I just brung the news. I already have it, actually. Good golly, how? Yeah, we're just talking to Faraday on the phone. Faraday? Was Lowry with you, actually? Uh, he stayed to do some more reporting, Reed. Have him come in when he shows up, Miss Case. All right, Cato, come in. Yes, sir. But Reed, I... Holy crow, who is Faraday? How could he know about the strike? Well, he ought to, actually. He's the federal conciliator in charge of it. <laughs> Get up, Axford. You came in second. All right, Cato, what'd you find out? There is a man named Sluter, Mr. Brace. Sluter, yeah. He's running a strike racket, using his hoodlums to stir up unrest in various industries and then stepping in to stop those same strikes his own way. That is so, Mr. Bates. But the Sentinel's reporters would dug up that stuff, Cato. What else have you got? I regret that is all, Mr. Bates. You've been trailing Sluter for a week and that's all? I regret that is so, Mr. Bates. I even need Green Hornet's car, but Mr. Sluter, very is slippery. So is a snake. Cato, there's someone behind Sluter. He's not the brain. Yes, sir. Super criminal. Mr. X. Are you certain there is such a character, Mr. Blake? I'm certain. I'll show you something, Cato. Recall that bank robbery two weeks ago? Yes. The crooks were caught. The Sentinel scored a scoop on that yarn. Yes, but... Black reporters from the Sentinel broke that arrest, made it possible. I see. Now, look at this note, Cato. It came to me right after that front page story. Mr. Blake, that is threat. Yes, Cato, a threat. The Sentinel got too close to the top man, and he didn't like it. He says, stay away from me, or you'll push up daisies. Sign, Mr. X. Mr. X. Looks like the Green Hornet's got a rival, Kato. A rival. Yes, Miss Case. Mr. Reed, there's a phone call for you. A man. He won't give his name. Shall I brush him off? Well, no, Miss Case. I'll take it. Yes, sir. It's on line four. Thank you. Hello? Is this the big shot? This is Britt Reed talking. Whom did you want? That one's got a reporter named Lowry. Well, yes, we have. Well, you won't have long. We're going to take care of you. What? Who is this? You've seen your reporter for the last time, Mr. Reed. This is. Mr. Rex. Goodbye. Hello. Cato. He hang up, Mr. Brees? Yes. It was Mr. Rex, and he says I won't say Lowry again. Cato, I mentioned that the Green Hornet had a rival. Well, the Hornet's going after that rival, starting right now. No, Reed. There ain't no news of Lowry. They've been over to the Beavers plant. There ain't hide no hair of them. What about the Sentinel? I'm going back there now, Reed. Gunnigan says there ain't nothing new, no place. Police are on it? Ever since you got that phone call this afternoon. Golly, I wish I hadn't let Lowry talk me into leaving. I could have stopped them hoodlums. What hoodlum? Why, that, that, that Mr. X gang. Sure, and just who is Mr. X? Reed, I got a theory about that. Just between you and me and Sergeant Moran, I think Mr. X is nobody but the Green Hornet. What? Why not? Ain't they both mysteries? Nobody knows who they are, so why can't they be in the same guy? Axford, if you don't... <laughs> Never mind. You don't think my theory's so hot, huh? All I want is to get Lowry back. Maybe Lowry ain't alive no more, Reed. Maybe... With that, he's alive, he's got to be. Now move, on your way. Okay, Reed. If I hear anything, I'll phone you at the apartment here. No, I'll phone the Sentinel. You're a reporter. Well, if you say so. Good night, Reed. It won't help us none to worry. Cato. Cato. Mr. Axford is gone, Mr. Blake. Just left. Everything's ready. Yes, sir. Here's your hornet mask and the gas weapon. I checked Black Beauty, sir. All that is designed. Okay. Open the secret panel. We're going out. With Reed and Cato stepped through the secret panel. Then along a narrow passage built within the wall of the apartment house itself. A passage that led directly to the adjoining building. Seen from the street, this building was deserted looking, abandoned. No one would have guessed that it concealed the sleek, super-powered black beauty. High-powered car of the Green Hornet. Take the wheel. Yes. 
Richard, I'd like to. We haven't a single thing to go on, Cato. All we know is the voice that spoke to me on the telephone. Uh, that was Mr. X. He said it was Mr. X. But we won't know till we locate him. How can we locate him, sir? Cato, you think of something? A strike. Who's the head of the striker? He is a man named Gerber, Mr. Blake. Gerber, that's it. But I do not understand. Gerber cannot be a racket man. He is honest. Yes, he's honest, Cato. But if anyone knows where the racketeers are muscling in, he will. And he's going to tell the Green Hornet. Let's go. Left at the next corner, Cato. The lights turn red. You can make it before that. Cut past that trolley car. We're moving so fast it's brief, and one of a chance to know this is the Black Beauty. Ah! Like a glittering black comet in the darkness, the car of the Green Hornet slipped through the city streets. So fast was it, and yet so easily did it handle that the Black Beauty could make twice the speed of ordinary cars with more safety. Into that alley and across. I understand, Mr. Britt. That's Gerber's house. We'll pull it behind it. Hello? Oh, just a second. For you, Ralph. Who is it? It's a man named Atterford from the Daily Sentinel. I'm not in. But he's a reporter, Ralph. I'm not in. Oh, he's called so many times. All the papers have called. You can't put them off forever. But I... Well, tell him to call back in five minutes. All right. Hello? Uh, call back in five minutes. Yes, he'll be here. Yes. Ralph, you've got to make up your mind. Look what happened to that man, Lowry. He's still missing. What are you going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? Mary, you make it sound as if I'm a crook, too. Like, well, like... Like Carson. I'm an honest workman. I'm a union man, a good union man. Carson and the rest of those aguillas aren't real union men. They control the union. It's the same thing. What do you mean? You're tarred with the same brush. As long as those criminals are allowed in the same union with you, you're just as bad as they are. <laughs> allowed? That's funny. Try and get them out. Did you and the rest of the men want this strike? Well... Of course you didn't. It's Carson and the rest. They kidnapped this reporter and... And the one who's behind it all is Mr. X. Mary, not, not out loud. Mr. X, he, he... Who is Mr. X? I don't know. Nobody knows. Well, he, he's just the power behind these hoodlums that... A super criminal with his finger in every racket there is. He, we won't talk about him. You're afraid, Ralph. Yes, maybe I am. You're all afraid. The whole union. Okay, so what? What about it? You used to lead those men. Why don't you call them together? Tell them to stop this strike. There's a meeting tomorrow night. Oh, a meeting. A lot of good battles do. You'll all sit mum while Carson and the rest run things their way. You'll never. Leave me be, Mary. Answer the door, will you? I'm sorry, Ralph. It's just I want to be proud of my husband proud of her husband. I want to protect her. That's why I'm acting like a coward. You know a lot more than you say you do, Gerber. But a mask. A green mask. You shouldn't tell all you know. You shouldn't tell anything of what you know. You, you're the green hornet filling your lip about Carson, huh? So you tell your wife Carson took the report and I... Never mind. You mentioned Mr. X. I didn't mean to, honest. Skip it. Gerber, you're going to go. No. That gun, put it down. Get back and I'll pull the trigger. Listen, you. I may be afraid of Carson and Mr. X, but not you, hornet. So I'm going to come after you, you fool. Give me that gun. Hey, what's that? No! Stop! Stop! Hold him, hold him. Hold him. Hold him. I'm coming. Take it, Gerber. No! No, my friend. Get him over. No! No! Be all right. No, what do you want him? I'll be seeing stars for a month. Help me. He shot my husband. Never mind your husband, lady. The harness just uses gas. But get on that phone and call the sentinel. Tell him I'm going after the green harness to get Rowdy back. I'm going after him if I have to fly. <laughs> Before we continue with our adventure. The whole city was aroused. 
While the newsboys yelled the sentinel headline on the street, ink not yet dry on the front page, the police of the city instead had all men out looking for the Green Hornet. Michael Axford was out looking too, but all in vain. Ah, oh, Moran, I tell you, that harness got wings. You might just as well call back the car. Leaving all pursuit behind, the great black car sped through the night, its wheels flashing as it raced out of town. Get away just in time, Mr. Brick. Lucky thing you were waiting for me and kept the motor running, Cato. And it looks as if we've shaken off the police at last. You hit Mr. Axford pretty hard, Mr. Just hard enough to make you get away. You might have phoned Gerber from around the corner, Cato. I never expected him to walk right in. Did you learn anything about Mr. Rowley, sir? That's why I took the wheel. You notice where we're going? I had not... Mr. Brick, we leave city. Yes, Cato. Gerber mentioned two names. First, he mentioned Mr. X. You know? Gerber hasn't any more idea who Mr. X is than I have. But then he mentioned the name Carson. Carson? Carson? It does not refresh itself in my mind, Mr. Brick. Well, I thought you Filipinos had marvelous memory. Oh, yes, sir. Only just once, sir. Well, now I have him. Carson, that was the one who was released in that big robbery, Mr. Brick. That's the one. He was crooked, but uh, evidence was sadly lacking. You've got him. That's very bad. We go after him, Mr. Brick? With both barrels, Cato. I happen to know that Carson has a little hunting shack out this way. When we get there, we'll find out a lot more about Lowry. And if anything's happened to him, well, I won't be responsible for my actions. <laughs> So, I want to show you that target, Mr. Lowry. If you get any screwy ideas, don't. I still got three bullets in this automatic. Listen, you tin horn trigger man, I Button got... that lip and look. Uh, <laughs> I can make a better score with my typewriter. Bullseyes, every one. Yeah, but can you spell cast? C8. There you <laughs> are. Hey, shut up. I twist this collar three times around your neck. Hey. <coughs> I thought you were supposed to be getting my goat. I don't know why I don't shoot you. Because you got orders. Yeah. And you better spill, Bright Eyes. <laughs> How much does that guy Reed know about that fake strike? Mr. Reed to you. And what color are your eyes? Now, look. Mr. Rex give me the office to make you talk, see? But I got a temper. Maybe I'll forget, see? Oh, no. You're scared green. You're scared of Mr. Rex. Confidentially, Carson, who is he? <laughs> <laughs> you talk like somebody out of a zoo. Chum, for the last time. What's Reed got on us? For the last time. I'm not telling. And you better take these ropes off and let me go. The police are looking for me. And they won't find your light, Jim. Look, I promise not to mention this, Carson. You let me go, I'll keep it dark. Not for publication. Besides dope, those shots you fired must have been heard. It's a shooting country up here. Plenty of hunters. Nobody notices shots. Well, Carson? Hey, stubborn boss. Don't call Bryce the boss, Carson. He works for Mr. X the same as you do. Don't you, Bryce? You're dumb, pal. Get smart. How is it being a muscle man in an honest union, Bryce? I'm head of the union. Yeah, how much of the union money do you have to kick into Mr. X? You can't keep it all. <laughs> well, maybe you're Mr. X. I never thought of that. Very funny guy you are. Too bad you won't last very long. And there ain't no Mr. X. Come out here, Carson. Okay, boy. How about it, Bryce? Are you Mr. X? Close the door. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. You got nothing out of them? Uh, a lot of words. No information. Okay. We got to go to that union meeting tomorrow night. That means we got to get back to town. Yeah. Bump Lowry off. Huh? Give him the business. Get rid of him. But Mr. Rex... Said... I was just talking to Mr. Rex, Carson. He gave the orders. Yeah. Well, I ain't never seen this, Mr. Neither Rex. Neither have I. But he stood right in that window and told me. His face was in the shadow. Oh. So I take your word, huh? Well, he ain't there now. Maybe I'd better... What the... That came right through the window. An arrow tipped with a suction cup. Come through the window. Pull it loose. Yeah, there's a message attached to it. Well, I'll be. Look, Bryce. And get this, Carson. It's to you, and it says to do a job on the reporter. Yeah. Signed with an X. That's all I gotta know. I'll be right out, Bryce. Do not move, please. But who's this little squirt? You drop gun right pull trigger. No. This is better, please. You walk back now. Yeah, yeah. Uh... Carson, jump to one side. Oh! man with a big mask, stand still. Pick up his gun, Carson. You throw very fast. I make mistake not shooting at yeah, He used to pitch for the miners. Hey, this is some persuader. Ain't like no gun I ever seen before. Carson. Yeah? Take his mask off. No. Take it off. Can't you see he works for the Green Hornet? Okay. Stand still while I... Look out. The window. Look out. The Hornet. Take it. Pull the trigger. Shot me. I got me. Yeah. You'll wake up later on. Much later on. Oh. Mr. Vincent. You come just in time. I saw it from the window, Cato. Where's Lowry? In the other room, please. Behind closed door. Oh, I see. 
Did you find mysterious Mr. X? No, Cato. I lost him in the dark outside that window right after we saw him shoot that arrow in here. This is it, Mr. Britt. Ah, oh, rubber tip with a message attached. We'll keep this, Cato. We'll need it later on. The next time we see Mr. X. What do we do with these men, Mr. Britt? I've got it all planned. What time is it now? It's uh, 4 o'clock in the morning. Can you keep these men unconscious until, say, 8 o'clock tonight? Very simple, if you please. Good. Can you do the same thing to Red Lowry? Huh? I want Lowry to be unconscious as well as these two men. Oh, I see. Cato can do it, Mr. Britt. All right, now follow me. I hate to do it, but it won't hurt him. You give Lowry some gas? Yes, quiet. Hey, hey, what's going on out there? Grace, Carson, you ugly gorilla, what about... Well, I'll be a second-rate Hawkshaw. The Green Hornet, so you're Mr... Hey, hey, put down that pop gun, put it down or... Uh, you, you didn't put it down, you shot me. That's it, Kato, now get busy. I'm going into town for today, but tonight, the Green Hornet's taking these three to that union meeting, and that's going to be a complete surprise to everyone. <laughs> Good, Mr. Britt. They all three in Bryce's car. Okay. You know where we'll meet? I understand. There's a dark alley one block away from the union meeting place. Yes, sir. I'll be there ahead of you because I'll drive the Black Beauty. Now, go ahead. Yes, Mr. Britt. Be careful, Mr. Britt. The meeting should be starting any minute. Partner to the hall, Casey. I guess I better go in, too. You gonna do any talking, Gerber? Or ain't you made up your mind yet about this wildcat strike? That's my business. Yeah. Stop the snakes. Are you guys gonna keep right on being yellow just That's because some... Up. But, Casey, he's... The Gerber makes up his own mind. It's his own decision. Ralph, you better go in now if you want to get a seat in the speaker's platform. Yes, Mary. We'll see you later. Is he going to be here tonight, Casey? I don't know. I haven't seen him. Maybe you shouldn't be here either. Oh, it's an open meeting. There are lots of interested spectators. Why not me? Are the police all around? Casey, they got the whole building surrounded. I got a theory that if the Green Hornet figures he's going to show up here and surprise everybody, he's going to be surprised himself. The Hornet ain't getting away tonight. We'll get him sure. Oh, come on. Let's get inside and watch the fun. I'll carry Bryce and Carson. Yes, sir. We must be careful, Mr. Britt. The police... Never mind the police. We've always gotten away before. Maybe this time we're not too lucky. Stop that kind of talk. Well, follow me. We're dropping these three right on the speaker's platform. I ain't interested. I'm watching for the harness. You think he's in already? Golly, why not? He might be. Maybe he ain't wearing his mask. But the police are... They let him get in, Casey. Then they nab him. Quiet. Tell him he's starting to talk. I'm not a smart guy. It takes me a long time to make up my mind. But now I made it up, and I'm going to do my talking to all of you. I see the big stuff. Mr. Bryce ain't here yet. But I can't wait. I say call off this strike. It's Wildcat. Call it off. Gosh, yes, but no. They're all scared. Well, they want to, but they're afraid. Uh, he's wasting his time. Aren't you listening? Haven't you guys got any nerve? If we all stick together, we can win. I tell you, Bryce is a racketeer. He's exploiting the union. You all know it now. <laughs> Holy crow, Casey. Look over Gerber's head. There's a trap door to the roof. It's the green hornet. He got the ladder. He's carrying two bodies. Hey, Gerber. It's the hornet. Grab him. Get the cops, Casey. We're going after him. Ashford, look out. He's here. Oh, oh, oh. Gerber, Gerber, where's the harness? What? Oh, no, I got you. Don't act I'm not the hornet. I'm Gerber. Holy crow, the smoke is getting thicker and thicker. Where's the harness? Say, did you hear that? Sounded like a trap door. The hornet must have got away. Yeah, the smoke is clearing off. We... Well, stop the snake. Look who's going out the floor. It's Bryce and that hoodlum up here. Holy crow, this one's loading. Loading, loading. It's Axford talking. Loading, can you hear me? Hello, hello, Axford. Shut up, you guys. Shut up, everybody. I got to hear what Loudy's saying. Axford, the hornet told the police. He came over the roof from the next building and he got away. <laughs> Oh, gosh, it's... Lowry, it's you! Hello, Casey. 
Call the cops in and have Bryce and this mug arrested. They kidnapped you. They kidnapped you, but they don't... Just tap not so loud. You want the Sentinel to lose the scoop? Keep your voice down. I don't want those other newspaper men to hear this. And you can tell Gerber to talk to the union men. I've been talking already, mister. Oh, hello, Gerber. Listen, start talking again. Bryce and the rest are heading for jail. You can take that union back to work again. Okay, Mr. Lowry. Right, listen, don't start talking until we phone the story into the Sentinel. You get it? Right. Come on, next man. We get a phone and... Hey, holy mackerel. Are you crying? Sure I am, you little pest. You, you had us worried. I hate to admit it, but for once I'm grateful to the Green Hornet. He brought you back. <laughs> Crooks go to jail, and the union will be good union once more. We take draft duty back to hiding place? Yes, Cato. But it isn't over yet. Remember, we still have to get Mr. X. VintageRadioShows.com Hi-ho, Silver! Away to those thrilling days of yesteryear with The Lone Ranger. To the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high old silver, the Lone Ranger. The end of the Civil War and the passage of more liberal homestead laws saw the tide of emigration to the western United States reach its greatest height. Land was to be had for the asking, but peace and security were not, and the West could not be won until law and order were established. It was then that the masked rider of the plains first rode in the cause of justice. Astride his great horse, Silver, he fought crime and criminals throughout the new territory, and no man did more to make the frontier safe for honest men. Now return with us to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, silver! We're heading north to the Oregon Trail. Someone's waiting for us. As our story
story opens, the Lone Ranger and Tonto have made their camp for the night on a bluff overlooking the famous trail to the northwest. The light of several campfires can be seen on the plain below. There's another wagon train, Tonto. Hmm. Me see it. That's what this part of the country needs. People to make homes here. People with the courage to face difficulties and fight for what they want. That'd be plenty good thing. Someday, the West will be just as rich as the East. That's right. But the people who will make it rich are these pioneers. What kind? Listen. That buffalo. Must be the herd we passed earlier today. And them come plenty fast. Something frightened them. They're stampeding. Uh, there they are. Them not far off. They're heading for the valley. I wonder oh, what you think. The valley's narrow. And it leads to the place where the wagon train is camped. That's right. Here, Silver. What you do? The buffalo may stop before they reach the wagon train, but if they don't, there'll be plenty of trouble. Go away, fella, Tonto. Here, my fella. We'll follow the herd and see if they do any damage. That's, that's good idea. Come on, get on. My fella. The men and women of the wagon train were resting around their campfires, unaware of the danger that threatened. Grant Elder, the leader of the train, was speaking to one of the groups. Well, folks, we covered a right good stretch of ground today. Tomorrow we ought to do even better. Huh. I don't see where we've done so good. Now, don't you go to complaining again. Why shouldn't I complain? I'm darn sorry I ever came along. We should have stayed back east where we belong. Yeah? Trouble. Nothing but trouble is all we've had. First off, them contractors cheated us back in Eagle City. The grub they sold us is full of worms that ain't fit to eat. It's a blame sight better than nothing. We ain't had half water enough. Tom Billings' young'un died the other day. Most of the wagons have broke down a dozen times or more. Trouble? <laughs> I'm so blame sick of it, I wish I'd never heard of this part of the country. That's no way to talk, Paul. You shouldn't Look be... Look here, to... Cora. Don't you be telling me what to think and what not to. You're getting just like your ma was. And what's more... Hey, Grant. What's the matter, Jim? Do you hear what I hear? No, I what, what is it? Heavens above, it's a mighty strange thing. It's a sort of rumbling. Now, what in blazes is going to... Hey, Grant. Huh? Get to the wagons. It's buffalo. They're pouring out of the valley like water. I see them now. They're heading right this way. They're camping. Hurry, child. Run. Climb in the wagon. Drive out of here. Come on. Get a move on. We'll go down more. Hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. The buffaloes swept down upon the unprepared camp. Few of the men had time to hitch their horses, and still fewer were able to drive clear of the stampede. Come on, fellas. Come on, get wagon there. Get wagon there. Come on. By a stroke of good fortune, the herd separated at the last moment, and the damage, though great, was not as heavy as it might have been. When the danger was over, Grant Elder tried desperately to reorganize the train. Jim, Dan, round up the women folks. Take account of everybody and see if anyone's hurt. All right, Billy. Ain't nobody hurt that I can see. Blast it. Take a look at my wagon. It'd get busted up, Silas? Busted up. There ain't enough left of it for kindling. My stuff strung out every which way. I've had just about an all I'm going to stand for. Shuck, Silas, you knew when we started out we'd have our troubles. I can take my share, but I... Who's that? I don't know. He called his horse Silver. Well, he can call his horse what he blame pleases. But what I'm saying is I've seen all of the West I want her. And I ain't the only one that feels that way either. Oh, Silver! Oh, 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 man. Well, I'll be... I'm not an outlaw. What that man is I have my own reasons for that. Came to see if we can help you. Well, outlaw or not, we can use all the help that comes our way, I reckon. We were afraid the buffalo might reach your camp. Did they do much damage? Damage? Why, the blasted critters just about wrecked us. Do you wonder if we don't find somebody's been killed? Here comes Jim. Maybe he can tell us there is or not. 
Well, I've had a good look around, Grant. What'd you find out? Well, there's about a third of the wagons pretty well smashed up. But I think maybe some of them can be fixed again. Yeah? Anybody hurt? Not one, thank the Lord. We was mighty lucky that way. Where'd Dan get to? He's bringing the women folks along. There they are now. Land sakes alive. I never in my born days had such a scare. You all right, Cora? Just shook up a little, Paul. Folks, it's about time we had a showdown. Mean and just what, Silas? Well, it's like what I've been saying for the last week. The biggest mistake we ever made was to come out west. What I say is we ought to turn around come morning and head back for where we belong. Sure, Silas, what got into you? I'm just talking good sense. You really believe that, Silas? Well, look what's happened. If this was the first thing that'd gone wrong, maybe I wouldn't say nothing. But it's been one thing after another ever since we crossed the Mississippi. And now you want to turn back? Of course I do. Anybody with sense would feel the same. What do the rest of you think? I'm for I keeping on. Well, I don't know, Grant. Maybe Silas is right. Well, like Silas says, we've run into a heap more trouble than we ever figured on. Isn't the opportunity to make a new home worth the sacrifice? Sure, but You better. men. Grant and the masked man are the only ones with any gumption. It ain't for women to judge. <laughs> We're good enough to nurse you when you're ailing and mend your clothes and do all the things you'd rather get out of. But when it comes to deciding anything, then it's only the men folks that have any say. Now, honey, it ain't right for you to speak up so. Well, isn't it right? We do our share, don't we? Cora. I don't care, Paul. You ought to ask us women what we think once in a while. Good for you, child. That's enough of that. I well, don't now want you're to hear anything like that out of you again. Wait. Huh? Listen to me. When you people started out, it was to begin new lives in a new country. Don't give up now. Settlers are needed in the West. Whatever your hardships, you'll be repaid a hundred times before you're through. Just a second. Yes? I'm wondering just what your game is, anyhow. What are you so blamed anxious for us to keep on for? Looks mighty funny to me. You'll have to believe I'm thinking of your good. I don't have to believe nothing, and I don't... Silas, I declare you're the most contrary man i ever seen. Oh, oh, Hold on, everybody. This is something we can decide later on. But right now, we got work to do, and it's time we did it. That's good sense, anyhow. We'll straighten things out. Then maybe by tomorrow, Silas and the rest of you will get your gumption back. Come on, you fellas. Get them wagons straight up. Under the direction of Grant Elder and the masked man, order was quickly restored. The wagons were repaired, and in the morning, at the suggestion of the Lone Ranger, Dan and Jim trailed the buffaloes to obtain fresh meat for the train. We see the two men as they come within range of the herd. There they are up ahead, Jim. Yeah. And we'll stop here. If we get too close, maybe they'll start running again. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa there. Whoa, whoa. Better get off your horse, Jim. It'll be easier shooting. Reckon it will at that. There's a good-sized rock. That'll make a rest for our rifles. Come on. You know, Jim, I was just thinking. Thinking? Well, here we are. This will do fine. Yeah, I was thinking the masked fella might have the right of it after all. Mm, I don't know. Well, it don't hardly seem like we should have come all this way just to turn around again and trapes back home. Well, And maybe. all the women folks seem mighty set on going ahead. If we turn around, they're liable to make things right uncomfortable for us. It ain't for women to have the say. Of course it ain't, but still, yeah, you know... Yeah, I know what you mean. Well, we can talk about it later. Right now, we ought to be getting fresh meat. Uh-huh. I got my sights on that critter over to the left. Yeah? I'll take the one next to him. Ready? Yeah. Now, don't miss. I got mine. And so did I. Come on, Will. What's that? Must be somebody else. Who could be? Well, maybe it's someone that we... Say... Them shots was aimed our way. Look, engines. They're coming over that hill. Back to the horses. Let the meat go. How many are there? I don't know. And I ain't waiting to find out. Steady there, steady. We're heading for camp as fast as we can make it. Get up there. Get Come along with us. Get up there. Dan and Jim raced across the prairie toward the wagon train. As they neared the camp, their shouts brought a group of people running to meet them. Engine! We see rats! Oh, 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 oh
Engine. Engines fired at us. They heard the shoot at them buffalo. You sure they were Indians? We wouldn't mistake a thing like that. Then that settles it. That settles what? We are heading back east. We can face stampedes and dust and sickness, but when it comes to murder and redskins, it's time we got out of here. Indians wouldn't be likely to attack a wagon train as well guarded as yours. They just shot at Jim and Dan, didn't they? Because they saw them alone. How do we know what they'll do? Grant, I'm telling you, you can't make us go no further. Do the rest of you fellas feel like that? Well, I wasn't so sure but before, but right now I says the same as Silas. So and I. so do I. Well, then, I reckon that's what we'll have to do. Land sakes alive. Growed men is scared of a few painted savages. It's your own good we're considering as well as ours. It's the men that has to do the fighting. Let me oh, tell you, you that. Tired, come, Tonto. Let me come. This is the first I've heard of Indians near here, Kimosabe. What we do? Steady, old fellow. <laughs> You and I are going to investigate those Indians. Mm, that's good. I want to know more about them. Hey! Get them up, fight! Hey! The curtain falls on the first act of our thrilling Lone Ranger drama. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. Now to continue the story, a wagon train led by Grant Elder became disheartened after a series of misfortunes. First, a herd of buffalo swept through the camp, leaving destruction in its wake. Then hostile Indians were encountered. The men decided to return to the east, and when the Lone Ranger was unable to change their minds, he decided to investigate the Indians which Jim and Dan had seen. As our second act opens, the masked man and his faithful companion are dismounting at the foot of a small hill. I think the Indians must be camped just beyond this hill, Tonto. Mm -hmm. Trail. Trail shown, that. We'll try and get a look at them without being seen. Uh. Stay here, Silver. Come, Tonto. Many engine. Only a few from the tracks we've seen. Hmm. There, boy. I see it. If we can get that fire without being discovered, we can hide behind it. Uh, Careful now. Here, boy. Uh. This is far enough. Look down below. Hmm. There. Engine. But fewer than I'd expected. Aren't you never see them before? Uh, but I could give a close guess as to who they are. Who you think? You remember the Indians who raided the Overland Station? Uh huh. There were five of them. The soldiers have been hunting them for weeks. Uh huh. Me think them same fellow. And so do I. See, there are five in this group. If they were dodging the law, this is probably the direction they would have chosen. That's right. Come, we've seen enough. Hmm. Tonto, did you notice the location of their camp? Uh, Tonto, see. You gave me an idea. What? That. I don't want the wagon train to turn back. Mm, that'd be a bad thing. The men aren't cowards, but they've met an unusual number of hardships. That's right. Naturally, they're discouraged. They'll go on if we can prove to them that the dangers they fear are mostly imaginary. What? What we do, huh? Steady, Silver. Yep. <coughs> now, don't. Just as soon as it's dark, we're going back to where the wagon train is camped. Mm, that, that good. And there, I believe, we'll get some willing help for our plan. Come on, get Silver. him up, my fellow. 
That evening, indignant at the attitude of the men, the women of the wagon train gathered in a separate group after the evening meal. Maggie, Jim Barton's wife, Cora, Silas Digby's daughter, and Jean, Dan Hardy's sister, voiced their resentment at what they considered the men's lack of resolution. Yeah, I'd like to shake them good. The very idea of turning back when we're this far along. They say they're going east in the morning. And they won't listen to us. It's mostly Pa's doing. He hadn't kept so everlastingly at the others. Maybe they wouldn't have agreed to going back so easy. It's just like men, folks. All is looking for the easy way out. Now, Maggie, I reckon they ain't no worse than the average. Hmm. I ain't never heard that the average man was any great shakes. Oh, if there was only something we could do. I've tried to talk to Dan, but when I say anything, he only grunts and says women don't understand things like men. And a good thing they don't. Well, I was sort of hoping that math men could argue them out of it. Wonder where he got to. Dan says he's likely some kind of a crook. A crook? <laughs> I just wish we had a whole wagon train full of his kind of crooks. There was something about him. Oh, 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 six, Jean. What the... Oh, oh, the masked man. The masked Maggie. man again. Oh, uh, you give me such a start. I'd like to talk to you. Oh, I'll get Grant if you'll just wait a minute. I don't want to talk to Grant. Just answer this question. Do you women want to return to the East? Of course we don't. Why, we were saying that when you come up. All of us women want to keep on. Would you be willing to do something that might persuade the men to continue? But what is it? I think I have a plan. If, if only you had. I'll need your help. Stranger, we women came out here so as we could have the kind of homes we always wanted. Maybe you don't know it, but when a woman's got her heart set on something, she'd wade through wildcats to get it. Good. Now, what do you got in mind? Listen to my plan. Wait until the men have gone to sleep tonight. And then... clearly what you're to do. <laughs> when I think of how the men folks will look. <laughs> they can pull. I'll leave now. But don't forget your instructions. We won't. <laughs> Say, who was that I just seen you talking to? Uh, why, yes. Uh... You been up to something? Oh, now, Paul, we you... That masked man. Was it him? And what if it was, Silas? My sister. He's an outlaw, <laughs> that's what. Women. Bah. You listen to every smooth-spoken crook that comes along. But when your own men folks try to tell you something for your own good, you don't hear no better than if he was deep. Sentries were posted at night to guard against a surprise attack by the Indians. The early watch was shared by Grant Elder and Jim Barton. We see them now as they sit together on the tongue of a wagon, rifles held loosely across their knees. Uh, seems like a shame, Jim. Huh? What does? Leaving this country, going back east again. You know, the more I see of the west, the better I like it. It's mighty pretty country, but it's just as dangerous as it's good to look at. Yeah. I reckon. Uh, you got any idea what was bothering the women tonight? Shucks. They was just mad because they couldn't have their own way. Well, there's more to it than that. What makes you think so? Well, they was mad at first, all right. But later on, they was acting like maybe they had something up their sleeve. <laughs> You're just imagining things, Jim. Maggie was most likely trying to get you riled. Mm, maybe. <laughs> What was that? I didn't hear nothing. Listen. <laughs> What's ailing you anyhow, Jim? You're as fidgety tonight as a girl at her wedding. I just swore I heard something. There weren't a thing. It's just the night being so black. The plains being so lonesome like that's getting on your nerves. Hey, you talk like I was a scary kid. Well, you <gasps> ain't a... Where? Over by the end of that wagon. Did you see it? See what? It was like a shadow. Come out of that wagon, then was gone. Just all of a sudden. By golly, you... There's are... another. 
Grant, I'm going to have a look. Oh, you blame fool. Maybe I am. But how do you know there ain't Indians sneaking into camp? You see anything? Just a minute. You better come back here and make yourself comfortable. If you're going to jump every time you see a shadow, you won't be fit to live with. I don't know. Maybe my eyes are going back on me. I told you there wasn't nothing, didn't I? Yeah, then but I... Then sit didn't... down and forget about it. Now, like I was saying, them women didn't have nothing up their sleeves at all. Why, right now, I'll bet they're dreaming in their sleep about going back east. in the camp during the remainder of the night. But shortly after sunrise, Silas Digby looked inside the covered wagon where his daughter Cora was supposed to be sleeping. Leaping lizards! What's the matter, Silas? Cora, she's gone! Ain't she there? You heard me, didn't you? But she's gotta be. Well, she ain't. I just looked. But Jean's with her. Your sister? The two of them was gonna stay together last night. Leastways, that's what Jean told me. Now, where in thunder could they have got to? Grant! Hey, Grant! You calling me, Silas? Come here! And hurry up! Something wrong? My girl Cora and Dan's sister Jean have disappeared. What's that you said? Who's disappeared? Jean and Cora. But where's Maggie? She was with them, are not she? Maggie? Why, she said she was staying with them. Well, I'll be... Hasn't anybody seen them? Grant, do you recollect last night? Huh? Them shadows and that noise I heard. You don't suppose... That engines got them? Oh, you're local. But I... What'd got... you say about engines, Jim? It was while me and Grant was keeping guard. I thought I heard a noise and seen some shadows by the wagons, but I couldn't find nothing. Didn't you look to see if the women folks were safe? Well, I we didn't never look figured in... anything was really wrong. They've been took by them redskins as sure as blazes. Come on! Where are you going? To get our horses. If them engines have got... Look at that! What in thunder? On, it's a masked man again. And look! The women are with him. What? And that ain't all. Huh? They're holding guns on engine. Engine? Can't you see them? Gene! Hey, Gene! Hold oh, 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 What's the idea? Them redskins. You're gone, Lord. We've been, we've been uh, doing your work for you. With the help of the masked man. You've uh, been what? Oh, land sakes alive. Can't you understand plain English? Now look here, Maggie. Oh, I, I won't look here. It's you men that are going to do the looking and listening. Here's the engines you were so scared of. The masked man helped us capture them. You women done that? There was no real danger, Grant. There were just five Indians. The women remained hidden with only the rifles they carried showing. Tato and I told the Indians they were surrounded, and they gave up. Well, well I'll be horns. Tato and I found their camp and thought of the plan. The women joined us during the night. At daylight, when the Indians could see the guns aiming at them from over the hill, we called on them to give up. Did you hear that, And they did, too. Then you blamed well we meant business. And these are the Indians who frightened you men. Made you decide to turn back. Well, I... It, uh, it seems sort of funny. The only thing that. funny about it is that you men were scared of something that us women fixed. Never mind them, Cora. I suppose they still figure the West is too hard on them. They'll be heading east again before the day is out. What do you say, fellas? I'll tell you what I say, Grant. We can't stand for women folks showing us up like this. If we turn back now... We'll be the laughing stock of everybody, from here to Topeka. We gotta go on. You mean that, Jim? Yes. And we're going on right now. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes. Yes. You'll find all kinds of hardships on the trail ahead. Perhaps some of them will be worse than those you've already met. But this should prove that none are as bad as your imagination makes them. Stranger, you proved that a plenty. And it was me that said he was an outlaw. <laughs> outlaw? Why, land sakes, this is the man we've been hearing about ever since we left home. He's the Lone Ranger. <laughs> Silver old boy! The stands have been held off near Mill City! Hurry! 
just heard is a copyrighted feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated. Groucho Marx meets some of the most interesting people you could ever hope to hear on radio with In You Bet Your Life, coming up next. Ladies and gentlemen, the secret word tonight is air. A-I-R. Really? You bet your life! The more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers of America present Groucho Marx in You Bet Your Life, the comedy quiz series produced and transcribed from Hollywood. And here he is, the one, the only... Groucho! That's me, Groucho Marx. Well, here I am again with $2,000 for one of our couples tonight. Fenneman, who's placed to try for it? Well, a bachelor and a spinster, Groucho, selected by our studio audience just before we went on the air. Land sakes. Uh, their names are Ida Easley and Jack Wayne, and here they come now. Come on in here, folks, and meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, kids, for the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers. <laughs> and if you, you say the secret word, you'll divide $100 in cash. It's a common word, something you always have with you. Uh, Ida Easley, eh? Huh? Ida Easley. Oh, that's an easy name to remember. And, uh... <laughs> You're the spinster, eh? I am. Mm -hmm. Let me see you spin. Huh? <laughs> Where are you from, Ida? I'm from Taylorville, Illinois. Where? Taylorville, Illinois. Taylorville? Did you have a, a job, Ida? I'm a matron with the Douglas Aircraft Company. In Ida, of course you realize that half of that swag belongs to Mr. Yeah, Wayne that's over what here. Huh? Me. <laughs> I think he's more worried than I am, for well. I have a hold of it. <laughs> Well, eventually he may be holding you and the fifty dollars, eh? Well, Jack, uh, I will tell. Well, what do you what do you do, Jack? Oh, I run a streetcar. Uh, where are you from, uh, Jack? In hot, born in heart of Boston. Why did you leave the uh, Bean Town? Oh, my feet got itchy. Now I want to Rome. You went to Rome, and how'd you like it there? <laughs> where do you run your trolley? On the track. <laughs> Caught me napping, eh? <laughs> I suppose that's one of the little jokes you streetcar men use to amuse each other back in the car barn, is that it? That's an old joke. It is, eh? Well, it may, it may interest you to know that while you're knocking each other out back in the car barn, the city's pulling up the tracks to make way for a bus line. <laughs> Jack, how come you're a bachelor? Is it because in your job you see too much of women? Oh, I see plenty of them. You do, huh? You could see a lot more of them if you'd step off your streetcar and watch them climb on. <laughs> I always get on last. I <laughs> they think it's politeness, but it isn't really. Huh? <laughs> Jack, if you found the right woman, would you be interested in matrimony? Oh, I guess I would. If what I... would you consider the right woman? Or oh, a housekeeper, a good housekeeper, a good cook. I know you go to a ball game with me once in a while. You don't need one girl. What you need is the YWCA, Jack. <laughs> How old are you, Ida, if that isn't too... Uh, oh, I think I'm about his age. 
frankly, you don't care how old he is, do you? Huh? <laughs> sort of such a thing. You're his age anyway, no matter how old he is. No matter how old he is. Are you a good cook, Ida? Well, I think I'm good. Do you like baseball? Oh, very much. Do you follow it uh, quite closely? Yes, I keep up the game. I see. Well, I'm an average fan, too. What do you think of Sugar Ray Robinson's chances this year? Huh? You think he's going to break Ray Bruce's record? Oh, I think he stands a very good chance. <laughs> Yes, but on the other hand, don't forget, he still has to be Gussie Moran. I know, I understand. Well, you can't blame a girl for trying, I always say. As a matter of fact, I never said that before in my life. I don't know why I lie this way. Would you, would you get married tonight if the right man came along and, and knocked you off your feet? Oh, I think I would. You would? Well, look out for Ding Dong Daddy, are you? <laughs> he can knock you off your feet and charge you 11 cents car fare at the same time. <laughs> Well, you certainly make a nice couple. Just remember, none but the brave deserve the fair, Jack. Always remember that, eh? And you're just the one to collect it. Now, we're going to play You Bet Your Life for $2,000. But I want you to pay close attention to Fenneman over there. Friends, when you select a dealer to service your car, you owe it to yourself to visit a member of the DeSoto Plymouth Dealer Organization. This nationwide group, there are over 3,000 of them from coast to coast, believes in the old-fashioned idea of courtesy and the modern idea of finest equipment, best trained men. As for the cars they handle, well, there just aren't any better than the big and brilliant DeSoto and the beautiful Plymouth. DeSoto is the car with smooth, sweeping lines that attract so much attention. You'll enjoy the experience of greater safety with DeSoto's powerful brakes that bring you to a smooth stop. No car in America has bigger brakes. DeSoto starts so quickly and powerfully and lets you drive without shifting. So drive a DeSoto before you decide on any car. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell Plymouth. Look for those two great names linked together. DeSoto, Plymouth. All right, now let's see if you two will get a chance at the $2,000. Fenneman, explain the rules. All right. Each of our three couples has $20. They bet as much of that 20 as they want on each of four questions. The couple that earns the most money gets a chance at the $2,000 DeSoto Plymouth question at the end of the show. You see, our other two couples are in a waiting room off stage, so they don't know what's happening out here. All right, here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. You selected birds, animals, and people as your category. Now, right, here's your first question. How much of the 20 will you try? $10. $10. What animal do you associate with Jonah? The whale. The whale is right. Now, talk right up. <laughs> and you folks are on your way. You have $30. All right, you got $30. Remember, you're going for $2,000 tonight. Now, how much of the 30 will you try? That's uh, 20 20 What animal do you associate with the Pied Piper? Oh, uh... Oh. Take a look at Jack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they followed her up the street. They... The piper. Well, I, I'm I'm sorry. It's rats. You you yes. you were on the right track. How much have they got now? They now have ten dollars, Groucho. That, that's a shame. Ooh, You're down that's to ten dollars. That's a shame. Dollars. We're down all to right. ten dollars. Here's your third question. How much of the ten will you try? Five dollars. Five dollars. Is that all right, Jack? Yes, sir. What animal do you associate with Daniel in the Bible? Um, lion. Lion. The lion is right. Huh? <laughs> Well, they're trying me again, and I have fifteen dollars. <laughs> All right, you got fifteen dollars, and here's your last chance to beat the other couples. How much of the fifteen will you risk? Well, let's take ten. Ten dollars. Ten dollars. What animal do you associate with Lady Godiva? Oh, the uh, horse. That's oh. right, a horse is correct. <laughs> and they wind up with a grand total of twenty-five dollars. Don't forget, you won how much? Twenty-five dollars. Twenty-five dollars. You won a hundred dollars. That's hundred and twenty-five dollars. Thanks, and good luck from the Minnesota Plymouth Group. <laughs> Well, Groucho, our, our next couple has been in a waiting room off stage, so, of course, they don't know the secret word is air. True, true. Okay, fellas, you can bring them in now. We invited some lady barbers to the program tonight, and just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected Miss Maybell Taylor. Her partner is a married man, Mr. Thomas De Silver. And here they are, folks. I'd like you to meet Groucho Marx. Welcome to You Bet Your Life, and if you say the secret word, you'll split $100 between you. It's a common word, something you always have with you. Uh, Maybell Taylor, is that right? That's right. And uh, Thomas De Silva. You're a lady barber, Maybell? That's right. 
Where, where are you from, Mabel? Montana. Montana, whereabouts? Culbertson, Montana. And uh, Thomas DeSilva, you're, you're a married man, huh? That's right. Is that your only claim to distinction, Thomas? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what sort of work do you do, Tommy? Retired police captain. Oh, how long, I'm glad I found that out. How long have you been married? 16 years. You remember how you met your wife? Huh? Yes, but it's a long story. Well, keep it down to 1,500 words, will you? <laughs> I have to be in Pittsburgh a week from next Wednesday. <laughs> okay, go ahead. How'd you meet your wife? We went down to Wildwood, New Jersey. Got a couple of bathing suits and took her down to Wildwood, New Jersey. Put a bathing suit on and then I gave her the engagement ring. <laughs> You're a pretty shrewd cookie, aren't you? Aren't you? <laughs> so I've seen her in the bathing suit, then I started singing proposal to her. You sang a proposal? Oh, yeah. to her? Well, how did you sing the proposal to her? Let me call you sweetheart and gave her the engagement ring. Would you mind singing a no, few words? Uh... Sing it. Oh. Well, go ahead. <laughs> Let me call you sweetheart. I'm in love with you. <laughs> Let me hear you whisper that you love, love me too. my son, in your eyes how true. If we had Let two more fellas, we'd have the worst quartet in this town. <laughs> I'm in love with And she consented to marry you after that? Well, that's, that's the first time I ever years. sang a chorus in five keys. <laughs> now, Mabel, are you married? No, I'm not. You're not married, huh? Would you get married to a man who sang like that to you? Oh, well, certainly. I never met a lady barber before. Aren't they pretty rare? Well, I'd say there's uh, possibly 15 of us in the city of Los Angeles. Oh, no, that's medium rare. Now, what made you decide? <laughs> what made you decide to become a barber? Or a tonsorial artist, is that what you're I uh, wanted to make money enough to see myself through nurses' training. And? I'm still barbering. <laughs> What's the difference between a lady barber and a man barber? Uh, there are several. There are several differences? There are several differences. <laughs> well, I'm relieved to hear that. Huh? <laughs> you better clarify it, Mabel. There's a hymn in Idaho who may have forgotten. <laughs> well... We have a lighter touch, and uh, we don't talk an ear off of you. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Just shave it off, huh? <laughs> I suppose you had a scrapbook where you keep all your clippings, Mabel? Huh? <laughs> yes. Do any of your customers flirt with you, Mabel? The male customers? Uh, well, they're not really serious with me. Now, how do you handle these Romeos? Oh, I just kid them along. They like it. Well, how do you kid them? Do you tell them jokes? Yes, occasionally. Well, tell us a joke. Go ahead. Pretend, <laughs> pretend I'm sitting in your chair and you want me to forget how much all this is going to cost me. Now you go ahead and tell me a joke. Do you know the best way to save your hair? Yes, put it in a cigar box. That's an old joke. Then. <laughs> do you know a way tell to... me another joke, huh? Do you know a way to avoid falling hair? Yes, just step nimbly to one side, huh? <laughs> That's even older than the other joke, eh? <laughs> You know any more jokes, uh, Mabel? No, I believe not. Go on, admit it. I'm too fast for you, eh, Mabel? Eh? Well, well, grass... your uh, hair is getting a little bit thin. Yeah, well, uh, grass doesn't grow on a busy street, eh, Mabel? <laughs> well, I was going to say that grass doesn't grow on a cement highway either. <laughs> Mabel, I know just how your customers feel. <laughs> My head is bloody but unbowed. <laughs> well, all right, now we're going to play your bet your life, eh? Now, uh, we'll see how you two uh, make out in the battle for the $2,000. You've got to work together as a team and run your $20 into more than our other couples. I can't tell you how much the other couples won, but Fenneman's going to remind our listeners. The Bachelor and the Spinster won $25. Here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. You selected nicknames of famous cities as your category. Here's your first question. How much of the 20 will you try? Tommy, wake Ten. up. Ten dollars. You're going to ignore Mabel, huh? <laughs> what city is known as the city of brotherly love? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. That's where you... 
<laughs> They're on their way, Groucho. They have $30. $30. Remember, you're going for $2,000 tonight. Now, how much of the 30 will you try? Mm -hmm. no, Talk right up. Make that? it 20 All right. What city is known as the biggest little city in the world? Reno, Nevada. Reno, Nevada is right. <laughs> All your folks are reclining now. You have $50. Here's the okay. third question. Now, how much will you bet? 50 50 What city is known as the Mile High City? Denver, Colorado. Denver, Colorado. <laughs> and they find the one You've climbed as high as Denver, Colorado. Now, here's your last chance to beat the other couples. How much of the hundred will you try? Make it all. It's the last question. Yeah, yes, here's the last question. Let, Let it go. go. Let it go. You're going to shoot the works, huh? Eh? What city yeah. is known as the Smoky City? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh is right. <laughs> and right up a grand total of two hundred dollars. <laughs> Thanks and good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Thank you very much. Now, now we're going to soon know who gets the chance at the big question. Worth $2,000 tonight. Because at this point, the people who were just up here, the lady barber and the married man, are leading with $200. And the secret word is still air. Uh -huh. Okay, fellas, you can bring in our next contestants. We invited to the show tonight some professional golfers and some singing teachers. And just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected Lucia Liveret and Mr. Paul Runyon. And here they come. Folks, I'd like you to meet Roger Martin. Welcome to You Bet Your Life, folks. And if you say the DeSoto Plymouth secret word, you'll divide $100 in cash. It's a common word, something you always have with you. Lucia Liberette, huh? You're a singing teacher. Sounds like a pretty good record, uh, Lucia. Where are you from? Sing Sing? <laughs> I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis, huh? Yes, you sir. sing the St. Louis blues? <laughs> well, no, not quite. Paul Runyon, it's nice to see you again. I'm sure everyone is familiar with your name. What did you say your name was? <laughs> Paul Runyon. Paul Runyon, huh? See there, even you're familiar with it, huh? <laughs> well, let's see. You won the Davis Cup, the Whiteman Cup, and the men's singles at Forest Hills, didn't you? Uh... <laughs> you may have a good memory, but those are tennis terms. Oh, the wrong racket. What are some of your titles there? <laughs> What are some of your titles, Paul? I was fortunate enough to win the uh, National Professional Golfers Championship PGA. in 1934 and 1938. That's pretty good for a little fellow like that, huh? <laughs> All famous golfers have nicknames, there, Paul. What's yours? Little Poison. Little Poison, huh? They call me Big Slamillo, huh? <laughs> why, why do they call you Little Poison, uh, Paul? Well, perhaps it's because I have been the thorn in the side of some heavier adversaries. Very well put, Paul. Eh? <laughs> and uh, Lucia, you, uh, what kind of singing do you teach? Opera and classical and semi-classic. You mean they have to study to scream like that? Huh? <laughs> Tell me, Rigoletto, can you teach anyone to sing? I will say yes because I've never found anyone yet who could not learn if he had the correct technical work. You should have been out here about ten minutes ago. Huh? <laughs> You'd be licking your wounds now, Lucia. <laughs> All right, how would you teach me, Lucia? That's Lucia, <laughs> Yes, it is. Yeah. Well, to begin with, uh, correct breathing. Boom, 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 boom. Yes, uh, inhaling, inhaling. Uh, deeply, relaxation so the air will keep coming. Up. There you are. You pick that out, Lucia, and be sure Paul gets 50 of it, huh? Well, Cadenza, are all singers alike, or is there a difference between them? Oh, certainly. What kind of voices do singers have? Well, of course, to begin with, our first classification is there are women's voices and men's voices. Well, uh, oh, well, I didn't know that. I must tell this to this uh, hymen. <laughs> Suppose I wanted to get up a lady quartet. Could I find one who sings bass? No. The contralto is as low as a lady goes. You have an hour. Lucia, obviously, we haven't been out with the same kind of lady. <laughs> now, 
Now, Paul, let's talk about golf. How long do you have to be a pro before you can become an amateur? <laughs> oh, no, my mistake. That's tennis. I was thinking of... What is your favorite club? The Annandale Golf Club of Pasadena. What's your best score for 18 holes? On a regulation 18-hole championship course, 61, at the Forest Hill Field Club in Bloomfield, New Jersey. How about... The, what does the average golfer go around in? I think 95 to 100. How about the girls? Don't some of the girls do better than that? Oh, a good many of the girls go around in a great deal less. <laughs> what time does your club open up in the morning? <laughs> I remember the first time I played golf, I went around in 75. I didn't play at all in 76. I was busy at Valley Ford. <laughs> How can I improve my score? I shoot around 94. That's for cheating. <laughs> I think I'd advise you to take a few lessons from a competent instructor, do I've a taken, little practicing I've and a little lessons. playing. I've taken lessons. It's hopeless. <laughs> well, how could I learn to win without playing well? <laughs> you might, uh... You might resort to a little pencil pushing, or you might have a hole in your pocket, or you might have a handy toe in the rough, or you might use a hand mashie more frequently. How is it you know so much about those things? <laughs> Tell me about that pencil pushing again, huh? First of all, you have to forget to count over five. On any hole? Any hole. What about the uh, 540 at Hillcrest? Well, I think you could still forget to count over five on I do, but you know where I am? I'm in the first sand trap leading the tee. <laughs> <laughs> I met 11 Arabs the last time I played. <laughs> <laughs> you must have had a number of exciting moments as a professional golfer. Can you tell us about one of them, Paul? Well, as a tournament player, I've had many exciting experiences. Perhaps the most exciting is... During the playing of the international four-ball matches in Miami, Florida, I was partnered by Horton Smith in this best ball event, and on arriving at the fourth tee, I dropped a high five-iron shot right on the top of a head of a gentleman sitting on a camp stool behind the green. He had just reached up to take his hat off to polish his head with his handkerchief when the ball lit on the top of his head, and he dropped off of the seat like he'd been shot with a Winchester rifle. <laughs> But on the next year, Horton and I incidentally won the first international four-ball championship, and we were paired again as partners. The next year, arriving at the ninth green with two or three thousand people down the left side of the ferry, hit Smith hit a booming hook down the left side. Down goes a man. Who is it? Our friend of the camp. <laughs> and the, the publicity on the international four-ball matches the next year says that Dr. Johnson is in Miami to watch his perennial favorites, Runyon and Smith, in the international four-ball matches, but he'll gallery in an armored suit. <laughs> Well, it must be very handy to have a walking bullseye on the golf course. Eh? <laughs> now, Lucia, let's get back to singing again. Do you have any particular exercises you give your singing pupils? Well, yes, there are several kinds of exercises, all to uh, teach them freedom of breathing, and as I said, the free flow of air up into the resonance chambers, and then to make them relax and be happy about what they're doing, we give them a laughing exercise. They... Um, start in, they enjoy it, they laugh all the way from middle C up to high C. I once laughed from Glendale to Burbank. But... <laughs> what about demonstrating this exercise, Lucia? Eh? We might take something a little lower, maybe. We'll take than, something uh, a little lower. Me, for example. Huh? <laughs> you can't get any lower than that. Let's go, huh? I see. Tail loose, Lucia. Huh? All right. The deep breath in the diaphragm, then drop the jaw open for the air to go up, and then... Oh, <laughs> well, the three of us could be very happy, Paul. We could all sing together. Mashies in the cold, cold ground. <laughs> well, now you're going to play your bet your life. You beat the other two couples, and you'll get a chance at the $2,000 question. That's the Soda Plymouth question. Now, I can't tell you how much the other couples won. But Phantom is off stage to remind our listeners. The Lady Barber and the Married Man are ahead with $200.
Here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. You selected women athletes as your category. Now, here's your first question. How much will you bet? $10? $10. $10. In what sport is Gussie Moran famous? Tennis. Tennis is right, huh? And on the way, they have $30. Remember, you're going for $2,000 tonight. Now, how much of your $30 will you bet on your second question? $20. $20. In what sport is Florence Chadwick famous? It's a tough one. Take a Tennis? Stand. No, I'm sorry. It's swimming. She broke Gertrude Edley's record for the channel. They now have $10. You now have $10, he said in a low, funereal <laughs> voice, huh? Here's your third question. <laughs> How much of the 10 are you going to go for? Nine. No. Nine. Well, you're going to hang on the edge, huh, Paul? In what sport is Patty Berg famous? Golf. Golf is right, huh? <laughs> well, on the way again, they now have $19. All right, you got Here's your last chance to beat the other couples. How much of the 19? The works. You're going to shoot the works. All right. In what sport is Barbara Ann Scott famous? Ice skating. Ice skating is correct. <laughs> and they wind up with a grand total of $38. And that means the Lady Barber and the Married Man with $200 get the chance at the DeSoto Plymouth $2,000 question. <laughs> The best trained men, the best materials, and the best equipment. Those are the important things every DeSoto Plymouth dealer offers you car owners. And that's why you should take your car for service to a DeSoto Plymouth dealer. You see, DeSoto Plymouth dealers have men trained in the latest factory methods. This means that the mechanics who work on your car are experts. And in every DeSoto Plymouth dealer shop, you'll find special tools and costly equipment. In addition, right on hand, they have a large supply of factory-engineered and inspected Mopar parts. Yes, you'll like the way business is done at a DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Find this out for yourself and do it real soon. The very next time your car needs service, drive in where you see the sign of a DeSoto Plymouth dealer. <laughs> Here's the Lady Barber and the Married Man, all set for the DeSoto Plymouth $2,000 question. Good luck to you. Here we go uh, for $2,000. I'll give you 15 seconds to decide on a single answer between you. So think carefully, and please, no help from the audience. Here it is. The longest battle of our Civil War was the Seven Days Battle. What city was the objective of this great struggle? Richmond is right. <laughs> That's right. You win two thousand dollars. You had the right answer, so you win two thousand dollars. What are you gonna What are you gonna do with all that money? Help her brother-in-law. You're gonna help your brother-in-law. Why? Ill. Oh, he's ill. Well, that's a fine way to spend it. And you, Mabel? I'm going to give some to the cancer fund. Some to the cancer fund. Well, those are worthy objectives, huh? <laughs> Let's see. You won $2,000 plus uh, $100 in the... How much did they 200, win the quiz? 200 in the quiz. 200 in the quiz and $2,000 cash and the secret word? I don't think this couple said anything. Well, you won $2,200, $2,200. Congratulations and thanks to both of you from the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers of America. Be sure to tune in again next Wednesday night at this time for the Groucho Marx Show, when the big question will be worth $1,000. And don't miss Groucho's television show, also presented by the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers of America. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell Plymouth. Two great cars, both products of the Chrysler Corporation. And when you drive in, tell them Groucho sent you. Good night, folks. Just be sure to see your DeSoto Plymouth dealer.
Folks, here's a tip from the National Safety Council. Walkers wise, use their eyes. You Bet Your Life is transcribed from Hollywood, produced by John Goodell, directed by Robert Dwan and Bernie Smith, music by Jerry Fielding. This is George Fenneman, signing off for the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers from coast to coast. I think I know how, how to end the war going on out there. Really? I gotta hear this. Yeah, all we ha all I have to do is take on the greatest acting challenge of my career so far. And that is, first, I disguise myself as the, as the Israeli general, tell them to stop firing, then I disguise myself as the... U.S. General will tell them to stop firing, and the war will be over! What do you think of my plan, Matt? It's hard to put my thoughts into words. Come here. OW! Looks like we're gonna be stuck with this for a while. See you next time. <laughs>